One day, after a period of tranquility, the dragons launched an assault on humans, sparking a war that would last for 30 years. The dragon's immense strength made it difficult for humans to fight back, and humanity was on the brink of extinction. Despite the odds being stacked against them, Ethan, the hero, kept up the fight against the dragons. He was the oldest son of Duke Arden's family and had a long line of renowned swordsmen behind him. He was renowned throughout the western continent as a dragon slayer and the last hero of the Hydran Empire. Yet even his impressive skills were no match for the dragon king, Dracosith. In his final moments, Ethan recalled his father's last words and his promise to his deceased sister. He felt remorse for not fulfilling his duty. Suddenly, he heard a voice calling him, and when he opened his eyes he realized he was lying in bed. He assumed he had perished in the battle against the dragons, yet he had somehow been returned to his younger self. He attempted to stand, but he felt no energy in his body. He realized he had almost no mana and must have experienced mana exhaustion even after death. Drawing on the power of the spring of life, he allowed the mana to enter his body, giving him the ability to move again. His sister walked into the room and was stunned to find him standing. She warned him not to move, but he assured her that he was mostly healed and could move on his own. She mentioned that the doctor had said he would need at least six months of physical therapy before he could walk again after waking up. He was shocked to find out he had been asleep for ten years. His sister reassured him he was not in the afterlife, and that his other siblings were still alive. He recalled that he had been killed by the Dragon King and had a gaping wound in his chest. His sister then informed him he was now 19 years old, the same year that the dragons had invaded. His father had died 15 years prior, and his family had paid a hefty price to form a non-aggression pact with the dragons. Ethan was surprised and found it strange that they had agreed to such an arrangement. He felt like things were going wrong all around him. Ethan wondered if he had been sent back in time, and pondered why it seemed so different from the past he remembered. He couldn't believe he had been returned to his ruined family. He discovered that the price for their family's sacrifice was immunity from all charges except for treason, and the gold and jewels they received were now being held by the senators, the current acting rulers of the Arden family. The senators had cast the Arden family away to the hunting lodge ten years earlier. After the battle with the dragons when his grandfather and his father passed away, the king had ordered the senate to temporarily rule over the Arden family. King Siegmund must have been worried that Ethan would abuse the immunity and the authority as the patriarch of the family at such a young age. The king had been an idiot in his past life, but this King Siegmund seemed to be even worse. Ethan had been meant to become the patriarch, but the senate objected to it while he was unconscious. He thought that, if he were to become the patriarch, he would expel all of the senate members who had caused his siblings and him so much distress. In eight months, he would turn twenty years old. Ten years ago, when he was around nine, he had worked hard to restore the family's vision technique, which had gone lost with their ancestors. However, he fell unconscious due to mana exhaustion in the midst of restoring the family's vision technique, and his siblings, who had no power in the family, were unable to stop the collateral family's tyranny. At that time, his sister was only ten years old. At that moment, Ethan blamed himself for the ruin of his family, but his sister reminded him that all that mattered was that he was healthy. He was glad to be reunited with his sister, but he was determined to avenge all the people who had caused them harm, from the king who had allowed the senate to strip his family of their power, to the collateral family members who had taken advantage of the chaos and removed them from their position of authority. He believed he had been sent back in time in order to protect his family and restore what they had lost by regaining his strength in the next eight months. He was determined to take revenge on those who had brought them misery. At breakfast the next morning, his sister asked the old man with the gray hair, known as the Grand Chamberlain, to leave. He refused, stating that it was their duty to stay there and they were members of Baron Karga's family, not the Duke's. He had been given strict orders to remain in the lodging. He then mockingly apologized to her. His sister had no choice but to accept that they had no control over their situation and let it go. She then woke up Ethan to have breakfast. As he descended the stairs, he noticed the servants were ignoring them. He asked his sister what was going on, and she told him these were servants hired by other families. He told his sister to eat first, as he was going to talk to the servants and then return. The Grand Chamberlain was planning to send a letter regarding Ethan's awakening but Ethan showed up and punched him in the face. The man was shocked to learn it was the Archduke who had punched him. 
The man was terrified of Ethan, and told him that even if he was an archduke, he couldn't be acting in such a way. He mentioned that Baron Cargas wouldn't stay still. Hearing this, Ethan slapped the Grand Chamberlain's face and said that the insignificant Baron family wouldn't be able to protect him. He asked Ethan why he was doing this, and Ethan simply replied if he really didn't know. The man thought of the Grand Duchess and yelled at the maids to help her as quickly as possible. Ethan then let him go, telling him to do better, and the Grand Chamberlain bowed and replied that he would thinking to himself that Ethan was mad. He thought to himself that he needed to tell this to Baron Cargas. After facing off with the Grand Chamberlain, he returned to his room to assess his body's condition. He realized that due to the mana exhaustion, the mana was spread throughout his body, but he acknowledged that it would be fatal for an average knight, but not for him, the continent's best. He thought that his body was still in good shape despite not being active for 10 years, but the veins that carried mana were very weak now. He began to repair them step by step, starting with resonance. Resonance is the process in which vibrations go into the mana hole to find the prepared mana's wavelength, and use it to pull mana in the hole. The inside of the hole needs to be filled through this process to completely conquer the mana hole. After stimulating the mana hole, he went outside to work on his stamina, he realized basic stamina was the most essential foundation he needed. The servants were surprised he was training so hard with such a slim body. As he trained, someone called out for the Grand Duchess. He asked the boy who he was, and the boy replied, Young Master Myers is causing a ruckus at a bar again, so if the Grand Duchess doesn't come and stop him. The exhausted boy is inquisitive as to who he is and the fact that he had never come across him before. He couldn't believe that his younger brother, who was so passionate about training and had a rigid schedule, was at the bar making a fuss. He called out to Hans to prepare to go and find his brother. Once they left the house, they arrived at the Golden Pub, where his brother was often seen with some thugs. He and his servant entered the pub, and saw chairs flying. His brother was in a total mess, asking for more alcohol. He couldn't believe it when he saw his brother in this state. He noticed a few people enjoying the scene, and he was infuriated. He smashed the table in half. He recalled that his brother, who was once a reticent individual who lived intensely and battled alongside him, was now a different person. He then put Myers to sleep. Hans called out Ethan and gestured to the two men in the corner, indicating that they had been responsible for messing the youngest lord. The red-haired man was taken aback to discover that the Archduke, who had fainted due to mana rush, was present in the pub. His subordinate asked him what they should do, he replied that they should conclude their activities for the day and not worsen the situation. The red-haired man told Ethan that he was concerned that the youngest lord had been heavily inebriated and that they were leaving. Ethan with a menacing stare queried if they were indeed departing, causing the man to feel a chill. Ethan asked them who gave them permission to leave. The subordinate attempted to block Ethan, but Ethan punched him without a second thought, sending him crashing into the wall. The red-haired man was astounded by what he saw. Ethan declared to them that they had made a serious error by bothering his family, and then proceeded to assault the man. The red-haired man tried to fight back and thought to himself that he can withstand Ethan's magical powers, but he was utterly helpless against him. After slaughtering the boss, Ethan mercilessly murdered all of the red-haired man's remaining subordinates. Hans was sweating in fear as he witnessed Ethan's rampage. He called Hans and commanded him to tidy up the place as he was heading back with his brother. After the incident at the pub, Ethan and Myers had now returned to the lodging. In Myers' dream, he remembered the time when his father had passed away, followed by his mother. Due to being so young, he had no recollections of his parents, so he looked up to his older brother as a source of support and a father figure. Myers jolted awake and shouted his brother's name, as if he were having a nightmare. He recalled the sensation he had experienced the night before, like he had seen his brother. Tears began to well up in his eyes, overcome with remorse for his feelings of helplessness. Ethan came into the room out of the blue, inquiring of Myers if he was awake. Myers was taken aback to see his brother and immediately embraced him. Ethan asked Myers where Taryn was, as his sister refused to tell him. Myers wasn't sure if he should tell him, but he eventually did. He said that Taryn had gone to a different family saying he would learn a different technique. Ethan asked Myers what he meant, but Myers didn't know the details either. In the middle of their conversation Hans interrupted them, he handed the money to Ethan that he collected while wrapping things up at the pub. He gets enough money and give Hans the rest, Hans is very thankful for the generosity of Ethan. He wondered what kind of situation his brother, Taryn, might be in. He was relieved that his brother was still alive, 
but he had no idea what family he had gone to. He stated that in order to revive the Duke family, they must first regain their strength. He then called Myers and asked him to show him his wrists to see if he had been debilitated by alcohol. Upon inspection, he noticed a great amount of impure energy in ordinary mana, which made him think that if he learned the breathing techniques of his family, he would have mana that burned like flames. He told Myers that his body wasn't bad and if he trained from now on, it wouldn't be too difficult for him to become a knight. However, he had to choose between offense and defense. Myers couldn't believe that he still had a chance to become a knight. Ethan reassured him that he knew the secrets of their family and he could help him become a knight if he wished. Myers declared that if he had to choose between offense or defense to become a knight, he would opt for defense in order to protect Ethan and their family. Ethan asked his younger brother if he was ready, as defense would require a great deal of effort. Myers, with a determined look, assured his older brother that he was. Ethan then ordered Hans to bring sandbags and wooden swords. Ethan thought to himself that the ruined family's secret was within him and it was a bit late to start at age 15, but the potential was there so he would raise Myers properly. At the Baron Karga's household, Patriarch Baron Helmut was reading a letter sent by the Grand Chamberlain. After reading it, he learned that the Archduke had awoken after 10 years. He called out to his butler and ordered him to deliver the message to another collateral family, the Count Ferns. The Baron had a thought that Archduke Ethan was talented and in good health, and his eyes took after his father's. He needed to let the collateral families know that the spirit of their native country had been restored. The two of them continued to practice, ending with Myers on the ground. Ethan told him to get back up, as his enemies wouldn't wait for him to stand. He then asked him if his resolve was weak. Myers replied that it absolutely was not. He stood back up again with a great amount of fighting spirit, and the two kept up their sword practice from morning to noon without a break. Hans the Chamberlain watched them from a distance, thinking Ethan was a scary man for training non-stop and beating his brother, whom he hadn't seen in ten years, to a bloody pulp. Hans decided to be on his best behavior and not get in their way from now on, especially towards the Grand Duchess, as they had a bad history. As she watched her siblings, she thought to herself that a lot of things had changed since Ethan's return. The servants had started working again after he had awoken, and the Grand Chamberlain's attitude had shifted. She asked Hans, the Chamberlain, what kind of conversation he had with Ethan that made everyone work so hard. Upon hearing this, he remembered the fearful memories of when Ethan had beaten him mercilessly. He thought to himself that if that was a conversation, he shouldn't be having conversations with the Archduke. Hans quickly changed the topic, apologizing to her and offering her a cookie. He suggested that since the weather was nice, it would be better to have a tea time with everyone. The Grand Duchess is wondering why he changed the topic. Hans secretly communicated with Baron Cargas to make a report. He informed him that Ethan was awake and already knew how to use mana. The Baron told Hans that there would be an elder meeting and he was confident that everything would go their way. The Baron promised to send secret money for Hans and ordered him to observe the Archduke. Hans thought to himself that it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and he decided to just observe how things went and side with whoever won. Suddenly, someone knocked on the door and called out to Hans, telling him that the two dukes training was finished. Hans ordered the servant to get cold water and wet towels for them and to fully prepare tea time immediately. Myers blocked his brother's attack, which surprised Ethan. He thought it hadn't even been a few days since they started training and yet he was already getting used to his attacks. He decided to attack him once more, but again he blocked it. Myers was overjoyed when he managed to block his older brother's attack. Ethan thought that his brother had natural physique, stamina, persistence, and fast adaptation senses, and concluded that he may be able to face off against an official knight soon. After the training, Hans offered them towels to wipe off their sweat and told them he had prepared refreshments and they should go eat it. While they rested, Hans mentioned that the Baron had contacted him and told him to observe and report on Ethan's actions. He tricked the Baron to get some money. Ethan thought of this as a coincidence, as he needed money anyway. Hans told him that if he needed anything he could use the Baron's money. He could clearly see Hans' motives, yet it didn't matter because he planned to use him anyway. He ordered Hans to go to the town to buy training tools and told him the remaining money was his to keep. After hearing this, Hans ran off to town to buy the things Ethan had told him to. Ethan asked his brother how much he knew about their family's vision. Myers replied that he didn't know anything and was surprised that his older brother was aware of it. 
Myers then asked him if he had learned the vision from their father. He said that Myers needed to restore the glory of their family, and the start of that was to make the youngest son of the Ardens into a proper knight. He mentioned that the Ardens vision was different from other families, and that Myers needed to have great resolve as well. He then asked him if he was ready to throw away all the mana he had gathered until now. Myers replied that he was ready, especially if it was for his brother and their family. The boy was knocking the door and calling out for Sir Wilden. He reported that the youngest lord had barged in and was causing a ruckus. Sir Wilden got up and inquired about the disturbance in the headquarters of the Red Scorpion, despite the lord's good behavior the day before. Two days prior, in the evening, Ethan had taught his brother a new breathing technique. He informed him that the family secret was based on the Black Flame and the basics of the Black Flame were contained within the breath of Black Flame breathing technique. Ethan further explained that, as a proper descendant of the Arden name, Myers must have the Black Flame. Upon hearing this, Myers pondered whether, if he went through the four steps of training, resonance, dissemination, circulation, and enlightenment, his mana's nature would completely change and become a Black Flame. In order to learn the new breathing technique, Myers emptied his mana hole, filled it with flames, and repeated the process. With the guidance of his brother, he successfully acquired the Arden's mana. Ethan informed his brother that it would be hard at first, but that he would feel a clear difference once the mana of flames completely settled in his body. He further told Myers that he would be able to finish the resonance within two months and instructed him to prepare, as they would have to go somewhere the following day. At the present time, Ethan, Myers, and Hans were standing in front of a building. Hans informed Ethan that this was the place where the Red Scorpion resided, and the group that had attempted to meddle with the youngest lord. Hans further mentioned that there was a rumor that the eldest one there used mana, but Ethan was not worried and ordered Myers to go for it. Myers readied himself and kicked the door open. He declared that they would pay for their crimes of insulting the Duke family, and proceeded to hit one of the men inside using a wooden sword. The others reacted immediately and surrounded him. Ethan and Hans were standing in the corner, watching him. Hans was worried while Ethan had a smile on his face. Ethan thought that Myers had gotten a lot stronger in the last few days from training, yet lacked a bit of confidence, so he had brought him there even though it was dangerous. The man attacked while Myers was wide open, managing to hit him. However, Myers had taken the attack on purpose as he knew that if he had dodged it, he would have had to give up his advantageous spot and become vulnerable. Ethan saw Meyer's decision and praised him, then asked Hans, he's doing well, what do you think, Hans? Hans thought to himself that it was scary, his brother had just been hit with a sword. Sir Wilden shouted to stop right now, and asked Myers what was the meaning of this. He stopped what he was about to say when he saw Ethan looking at him. He remembered what his brother had told him and realized that it was the Archduke. He then asked Ethan if he was the one that had broken his brother's arm, to which Ethan replied, you know well, is there something you wanted to say? Sir Wilden thought that Ethan was arrogant and he wanted to kill him right then and there, but he had to be patient and discuss the matter with the Baron first. He told Ethan to wrap up the issue about the brothers and said that, although they had taken more damages, he would be considerate of the Duke family's reputation and let things go. Ethan grinned, thinking to himself that they were the ones that had ruined his brother, yet he was speaking as if he was being nice. He said to Myers that these bastards were trash and there was no saving them, and that they would need to cripple a lot of them to teach them a lesson. Sir Wilden warned Ethan that he would have to intervene if he did not stop, to which Ethan only responded with a dare. After that, Ethan exerted red mana on his hand, which Wilden saw and alerted to. He remembered the rumors about the Arden family's mana burning like flames and thought that those were merely exaggerated rumors and there was no way he would be scared of him. Wilden released his technique, which Ethan saw and thought to be familiar. He then attacked Ethan, but Ethan dodged it with ease, calling him a foolish bastard and bombarding him with punches until he fell down. After defeating him, he asked him who he had learnt the mana breathing technique from, to which Wilden did not answer. Ethan threatened him that if he wasn't going to talk, he would have to make him talk. Wilden then said to wait and informed him that the Baron Cargus had taught him the technique. Upon hearing this, Ethan thought to himself, Cargus? Using the memory sphere, Ethan learned that Baron Cargus had ordered Wilden to cripple the youngest lord no matter what. The Baron had also stolen and handed the Duke's breathing technique to Wilden. He called out to Hans to make a report, and Hans informed him that the youngest Duke had taken care of them all, and they had taken back all the illegally taken money. 
the leader had been taken care of as well. Hans asked Ethan if he needed the leader, to which Ethan responded that he did not need him as there was enough evidence in the memory sphere. Ethan thought of the collateral family who had stolen the vision of the main family and tried to kill the direct line of the family. As well as drugs, gamblings, murder, and illegal business, there was more than enough evidence to get them, however, now was not the time. He thought that, with his current strength, it would be tough to deal with the Baron's knights. He was going to use all the mana gathered from resonance to sow the seeds of fire, and he would gather mana to increase the sowing. Right now, it was only his wrist, and after spending the seeds of fire on his heart and finishing the basics of cycling, he would be able to immediately deal with Baron Cargas. Ethan called out to Hans and ordered him to store the memory sphere somewhere safe, informing him that the other spoils that came with it were his to keep. He warned him that, if he wanted to live, he had to forget the contents of the memory sphere. Upon hearing this, Hans pretended to have forgotten everything that had happened. In the Baron's household, the Baron was seen to be infuriated that Ethan had broken his funding line, and was thinking of assassinating Ethan. However, he couldn't do it because if he died on the Baron's territory, he wouldn't be able to avoid the responsibility and, if things got big, all of the other collaterals could end up being his responsibility. He decided to not make things bigger right now, and that in two months' time there would be an elder meeting where a chance might occur. The butler came in and told the Baron that Hans had sent them a message. The Baron grabbed the letter and read it, to which the butler said that the price looked right from what he had requested and asked him what they should do. The Baron ripped the piece apart and yelled, that crazy bastard wants a hundred gold. He didn't have a choice but to give Hans the amount of gold he was asking for, and told his butler to check properly if Hans was trying to trick him. Three days later, on a sunny day, workers were seen renovating the Arden's hunting mansion. Ethan was successful in filling up half of the mana holes in his arms. Ethan said the construction was almost over, and Hans replied to him, saying that the Red Scorpion had more money than they had thought, so they had used more of it. Ethan told Hans to make sure to keep plenty for themselves. Ethan entered the dining room and saw his sister in a beautiful clothing, praising her. Ethan thought to himself that Hans was pretty good, and now it felt like a proper Duke family. Ethan said he would make sure that his sister only wore and ate good things from now on. While they were eating, Ethan asked his younger brother how his wounds were, to which Myers replied that he was fine and all his minor wounds would be fine by next week. Ethan was grateful to hear it. He then asked his siblings if they knew about the traditional family ceremony held in the mansion, to which one of his siblings asked him if there was such a thing. Ethan told Hans that they would be going hunting in the Pushka's mountain, and Hans replied that he would bring servants and prepare everything immediately. However, Ethan told him there was no need for servants, only his siblings and Hans would be going out. One week later, at Pushka's mountain, the four of them went to the mountain. Hans was thinking that it had been a hellish week, with disgusting monsters that had ambushed them from the first day. He really thought he was going to die there. Without the Archduke, he would have died ten times and why would the Archduke intentionally approach monsters to train the youngest lord? After walking for a while, they had reached their destination, the Temple of Fire. A place that had been known for ages, one of the Arden ancestors had discovered it, and after that, it had been regularly visited for funeral rites and for the blessing of the fire spirits. Traditionally, the Ardens let children over 10 years old meet the fire spirits. The blessing of fire the spirit gives puts fire energy in their bodies to let them get used to fire. So, the ceremony of fire was a tradition everyone in the family had to go through so that they could use fire. Hans asked Ethan if it was okay for him to be there because the place looked pretty important, to which Ethan told him it was okay. When they reached the altar for the ceremony, Ethan informed Myers that they needed to offer tributes and dance once fire sparks started flying. After that, the spirits would gather and bless them. History had been completely different since 15 years ago, but before that, everything else had been the same as Ethan's past life. It had been over a hundred years since the Arden family had contracted with the fire spirits, but what if the contract had been broken in this history? It would be unfortunate, but if that happened, they would have to give up the blessing. Ethan began to chant the ritual and the passage of fire opened, allowing the spirits to emerge. Meyer's spirit had a middle rank affinity, while his sister had a salamander spirit, which was a low rank. Ethan pondered that, in his past life, he was a person who ruled fire. He shouted and asked who would bless him, and a huge spirit fireball came out of the altar. Ethan thought that it was bigger than Ignis from his previous life. The spirit spoke and said, Blood of the Arden family. 
Worship, did you call for me? Ethan replied, yes, I want your blessing, from you the fire monarch. Suddenly, Ethan found himself in his inner world. A bright red flame appeared and formed a human figure in front of him. The fire monarch Rorosha introduced himself and explained to Ethan that he was in his inner world where fire passed through. The fire monarch discovered that Ethan was trying to control his body, so Ethan apologized and explained that he thought it would be more efficient if they combined the monarch's power and his control. He thought that Rorosha was a cute name for the fire monarch. The fire monarch smirked and said that Ethan was a fun guy, and gave him a chance. If Ethan managed to control even a little of the fire monarch's power, he would abide by Ethan's request and bestow him with the greatest blessing. The fire monarch asked Ethan to show him his talent, and upon hearing this, Ethan was determined to give his all. Outside of Ethan's inner world, Myers and the Grand Duchess worriedly watched him float while surrounded by fire spirits. Myers was unsure of what was going on, but he was confident that his older brother would succeed. Meanwhile, Ethan was in a state of complete focus, remembering his past senses of ruling over fire as a transcendent and breathing the black fire. After much struggle, he successfully controlled a bit of fire from the monarch. He said to the fire monarch that he had one. The fire monarch replied, even though it was only a little bit of it. To think there would be a human who could control his power. Like he promised, he gave everything Ethan wanted. He successfully absorbed the fire monarch's power. The monarch asked him if he was satisfied, and Ethan said that he was. He then requested to bestow blessings to his siblings as well. The fire monarch granted his request. He called Ethan a child of fire and said that it was fun and that they would meet again. Ethan was reflecting on the strange fate of his siblings. He had improved his musculoskeletal system and cleansed his veins by over 90%, so much so that he was confident in claiming to have the greatest physique in the continent. It would take time for Myers and his sister to do the same, so he would have to control those fires while he waited. Hans was shocked at what he witnessed, unable to believe that he had seen the spirit monarch, something that was only heard of in legends. He reported a monstrous archduke being on his own, but now he had also received the blessing of the monarch for hours. He now knew why he had been brought there and he had to be sure which side he would stand with. Ethan then explained to his siblings that the blessing of fire changed bones, muscles, veins, and everything. Myers still couldn't believe that so much had changed, remarking on the incredible power of the fire monarch. Ethan thought that the blessing directly from the monarch was a much bigger profit than he had anticipated, thankful to have his memories from his past life. Suddenly, Myers asked Ethan if it was normal to get so hungry after getting blessed, to which Ethan replied in the affirmative. He suggested they leave and eat. In a resting place near the temple where they ate at, Ethan, Myers and Hans ventured outside. Myers commented on the amazement of having a cabin near the hunting ground, to which Hans replied that he was able to show his skill because of it. Myers asked Ethan where they were going, inquiring if there was still something to surprise them with. Ethan replied that he would show him something that would surprise him out of his mind. The three descended into the secret storage room, where Hans was surprised to see something precious in the storage. Ethan asked him if he knew what it was, to which Hans responded that it was the peacock's leather, something that young girls couldn't buy in the capital due to its rarity and high quality. He instructed Hans to find a trustworthy merchant to sell the products, and ordered them to take all the items because they were going down. The next day, the Duke family and Hans returned to the mansion. Ethan was at his desk when Hans called out to him, asking if he could come in. He informed Ethan that he had found a merchant group to sell the items to, and when Ethan asked which group, Hans told him it was a merchant group called Mises. Ethan was taken aback upon hearing Mises, and instructed Hans to meet them immediately, leaving him confused. Ethan entered the guest room and apologized for being late, the guest told him it was all right and thanked Ethan for worrying about him. The guest introduced himself as Michelin, the head of Mises. Ethan said he wanted the guest to reveal his real name because their transaction was based on trust. He mentioned that he had heard from his father, Marquis Bessis, that the guest had a tradition of going independent for a few years, likely to hide their identity and to train to trust. The guest said, I think you're mistaken prompting Ethan to inquire if he was mistaken about the realistic mask in the hidden escort night. Upon hearing this, the guest was alarmed, thinking that it had been three years since he had secretly gone independent and had changed his voice so even the king wouldn't be able to identify him. Ethan thought to himself that he had heard it directly from him in his past life. 
The guest remarked on Ethan's incredible insight and reintroduced himself as Jaron Bessos. Ethan greeted him and said, Hello, Jaron Bessos head of a small family. Ethan then told him that what he was selling wouldn't be of any help to his experience and asked if he was interested in making potions. Jaron was surprised that Ethan knew about it. Ethan told him that some things had happened and it had come into his hands coincidentally. He further explained that, in his past life, to combat against the Wyverians, a lot of people had revealed the lower levels of the family vision, including the potion-making art. As such, the only people who knew how to craft them were himself and the original writer, her. He added that the Bessus Marquis family had used all their money to support Arden, making them the only people they could trust. Jaren was confused, and so asked why Ethan had chosen his family. Ethan replied that 15 years ago, the Marquis family had helped them by supporting them with all their money during the war with the Wyverians, which is why they had been able to build up again. Ethan had stated that it was a funny thing how the two families who had bled from the war had lost power and were falling, while the insects who were hiding were feasting on the flesh of the fallen. He also mentioned that there were seven months until he became the head, and he planned to take care of all the traitors before then. Ethan expected Marquis to help Arden once more. Jaren was surprised by this, thinking to himself that this was someone who had woken up after ten years, yet the powers that the Archduke must face were not only the ten collaterals, but also the seven families in the kingdom who envied the Ardens for their honor and unprecedented immunity as the kingdom's guardians. The seven families of the kingdom supporting the ten collaterals to help them consume the Ardens was already a well-known truth. Jaren was hesitant to give an answer to Ethan because of the odds that he would face if he allied himself with the Archduke. Ethan then told him that he understood why he was considering the offer, and that it was not a bad deal for him. Ethan then suddenly cut his hand, leaving Jaren shocked. Ethan assured him that it was just a simple product demonstration, and that the special potion's efficacy was similar to a low-rank potion, but the price to make it was only 10% of a regular potion. Jaren could not believe that it only took 10% to make, but he would need to calculate the ratio of herbs and fermentation time very accurately. Ethan then told him that he knew other crafting recipes besides the potion he had demonstrated, and that if Jaren accepted the offer he would give all the items he was going to sell to him free of cost. He said that Jaren would only have to pick now. Jaren accepted the solo contract offer, thinking that it was better to partner up with the Archduke instead of watching his family's reputation fall even further. Hans reported to Ethan that the Baron had broken the limit on the number of soldiers and the Red Scorpion were being assigned all over the city by the Baron. The maximum allowed tax rate was being used and the Baron was using the organization to exploit the citizens, calling it a protection. Ethan expressed his anger, stating that the Baron was threatening the land with people he had hired and taking protection money. He then asked Hans to hand him the document, inquiring as to who managed the taxes on the lower town. Hans replied to him, saying that the one managing the taxes was Semi-Noble Himes, a close confidant to Baron Cargas. Upon learning the whereabouts of Himes, they immediately set out. Ethan thought that it would take four months to take down Baron Karga's family, but it was too long after meeting the Fire Monarch. He intended to destroy Himes first. Somewhere in Barrows, Himes was with his escorts collecting taxes, when an old man who was the custom officer approached him. He told Himes that they were missing a little money. Himes was enraged that the chief couldn't pay the taxes in full, brazenly telling the old man that they had taken down the Red Scorpion, though the old man knew the truth. Ethan and Hans arrived at the small village, with Hans yelling and pointing to the person, informing Ethan that he was the tax collector. Ethan released a murderous intent towards the tax collector and his companions. The escort knight that was accompanying the tax collector felt an unknown mana coming from Ethan. He thought that Ethan definitely had a small amount of mana, but the pressure Ethan had was extraordinary. Himes ordered the knight to do something. The escort knight told Ethan to stop saying he would punish him for obstruction of justice of the Baron family. Ethan pulled out his sword, declaring that they were outrageous for plundering the village. Ethan then made his move, jumping towards the knight. The knight could not react in time because of Ethan's speed. The knight released his mana, thinking that Ethan's trajectory was simple and all he had to do was defend and counterattack, but what the knight did not anticipate was Ethan stopping his attack in the middle. The knight was surprised that Ethan stopped and changed his attack trajectory. He defeated the knight in a single hit. The tax collector and the soldiers were shocked by this. Himes ordered them to attack Ethan, but Hans told them that it was useless, 
informing them that the man was the Archduke and ordering them to drop their weapons. The soldiers complied. At Morocco town, in Heim's mansion, Ethan and Hans were with the tax collector. Heim stated that Baron Cargas had ordered him to collect more taxes. All the transaction history was written in the private account book they had kept. He had collected another evidence of the Baron's misdoings. The Baron was talking to someone, learning from their conversation that the other families were ready to abandon him as bait. He was infuriated. At the same time, a letter came, the contents being about the tax collection. The Baron did not have any other options left so he decided to invite the Archduke to the Baron mansion to meet him personally, now considering him a strong enemy. He told Myers to get ready to depart to an indirect family, saying that there were three reasons why he was sending him to a branch family. Firstly, there were only two successors left since Terran left, secondly, they would try to stop Ethan from succeeding the position, and thirdly, the support Myers could get would be tremendous if he pretended to be on their side. Myers completely understood his plans. Ethan was worried for his brother as it would be dangerous for Myers to be on the enemy side, but Myers reassured his brother that he would be fine. On the day of his departure, the Grand Duchess scolded him for his lack of preparations. Ethan told Myers that he believed in him but he still needed to be careful. After saying his goodbyes, Myers departed together with Hans. Another carriage was coming towards the Archduke's mansion, two people being inside who were complaining about how bad the road was. The yellow-haired boy asked the other man, who was called Shuran, how much was the allowance. Shuran replied that the Baron had been generous and given a hundred gold coins. The man told his companion that he would only give ten gold coins instead of the hundred, his companion questioning him as to what he would do if the Archduke got angry. The yellow-haired man was confident, saying that he was a three-star knight so he would be fine. While Ethan was in the midst of his training, he was wondering what had happened and where his second brother was. He was very frustrated that he could not reach him. Suddenly, a carriage stopped by, and a yellow-haired man emerged. Ethan asked the man who he was, and the yellow-haired man arrogantly threw a pouch containing ten gold coins at him. Ethan punched the man and demanded to know when the Baron family had become superior to the Duke family. He then grabbed and lifted the man, and told him to repeat what he said, punching him again when he said Baron Cargas. The yellow-haired man released his mana, to which Ethan responded by using a suppression skill, causing the man to fall down again. He said that it did not hurt at all. Realizing that he could not release his mana, the Baron's son asked Ethan what he had done. Ethan had sealed the yellow-haired man's mana, remarking that thieves who steal other people's scrolls to learn with wouldn't even know what a mana technique is. Infuriated, the man attacked Ethan but was beaten again. He then asked the other man why they had come. The man replied that they had come to deliver an invitation and the supporting fee. The next day, Ethan was preparing to depart. His sister asked him if he would be okay and he replied that he would be fine, as he had received an invitation. On his way to the Baron's mansion, Ethan thought to himself that whatever the Baron attempted to pull off, his punishment was already decided. However, seeing as the Baron had sent an invitation, he must have an ace up his sleeve, poor it, a minor city under the Baron's Cargas headquarters, displayed a flashy facade, but the devastation and despair of the citizens was hidden beneath it. The only ones who despised it were the Duke Arden family, whose sacrificed blood seemed to be wailing from the ground, Ethan arrived at his destination, and a man suddenly asked him if he was the guest. He asked where the third son was. Ethan confronted him, and the man with violet hair angrily grabbed Ethan's collar, he said that he would fix Ethan's attitude. Upon hearing this, Ethan kicked the man, who fell to the ground due to the force of the kick. The man could not believe he had not seen Ethan's attack and Ethan grabbed the third son and threw him next to the other guy. The man was incensed to see his younger brother in such a pitiful state and asked Ethan if he was the one who had put his younger brother in such a state, mockingly, Ethan replied, who else would? The man drew his sword and attacked Ethan with intent to kill. Ethan noticed that his opponent was using stolen techniques. His opponent swung his sword, but Ethan managed to dodge the attack. He grabbed his opponent's hair and forced him down onto the ground, the impact of which caused the ground to crack. His opponent remained on the ground and Ethan declared that he would end him with his next attack, when suddenly, someone yelled and told him to stop. Another knight had come to attack Ethan, but was blocked. The man then introduced himself as the Grandmaster of the Knights of the Baron family, Menharton. He warned Ethan that if he did not show consideration, he would resort to force. 
Ethan asked him if raising a sword at a direct line family of a duke was the right thing to do. Ethan had informed the Grandmaster Knight that, if he wished to use violence, he needed to be better than a thug. The Grandmaster Knight accepted his challenge and rushed forward to attack Ethan. The two clashed, their swords blocking each other's attacks. The knight made another move, attacking Ethan, but Ethan managed to dodge. He thought that the knight was quite skilled. Ethan and the knight continued their clash, the knight thought that he had managed to block Ethan's vision and suppress him without wounding him. However, from out of nowhere, Ethan's sword came straight at him. The knight was shocked and thought he was going to die, but Ethan turned his blade. The knight was left wondering if Ethan had intentionally spared him. A woman had come and held her third son, furious that Ethan had touched him. She ordered the Grandmaster Knight to arrest him. The Baron came and told her to stop, instructing Sir Manhattan to take care of his wife and son. The Baron told Ethan that it had been years since they last met and requested that he send his son, who was lying on the ground, to him. Ethan declined his request, further adding that the son of one who ignores the law of the Duke family and raises a blade at an Arden's neck is heavy and, in this case, it would be an execution. The Baron told Ethan to calm down, apologizing on his son's behalf. He further added that, even if Ethan had immunity, there was no power behind the Duke's law now. The Senate had become the center of the dukedom and his son's judgment would also be held at the Senate. Baron Cargas suggested that they clear up the misunderstanding between them and join forces. Baron Cargas had thought that Ethan had killed his son, but he had spared him. He yelled at him, warning him not to test his patience and telling him to let go of his son and beg for forgiveness. Ethan grabbed the Baron's son and stated that he planned to dispose of the entire Cargas Baron family. He threw the man towards the Baron, accusing him of having broken the contract as a vassal and threatening the direct line to hide their sins. He declared that, from that moment, the Baron would be charged with treason, all his rights would be taken away, and his title and castle would be taken. The Baron had ordered his men to suppress the Archduke as planned, to ensure that he could never meddle in their affairs again. Ethan was aware that the Baron had planned some devious tactics. At the same time, a meeting was being held in the Hydran Empire capital, Palantium, and was about to end when the King asked if there was anything else to add. Marquis Bloden of the Marquis Bessus family politely requested permission to speak, which the King granted. The king was puzzled by the Marquis Bessus' contribution and wondered when the Archduke and the Marquis Bessus had allied. Marquis Bessus then conveyed Ethan's message to the king and informed him that Baron Cargas had broken the vassal contract in multiple manners such as tariff limit breaking, formation of secret troops, and illegal selling and leaking of the vision of a duke family. The evidence was clearly shown in the memory spheres, and the Archduke had requested the confiscation of the castle. While relaying Ethan's message, Marquis Bessus noticed that the seven families of the kingdom weren't happy. The king was thinking of whom to side with, whether he should side with the seven families supporting the collateral, or go with the legendary guardian of the kingdom, the Ardens. The king decided to play it safe and did not side with either party, saying that it wasn't something he could decide on. The Ardens had already been removed from the senate, but as this was an issue from one family, it did not involve the king. He added that they should trust the archduke to solve it on his own. Marquis Bessus replied, so be it. I will deliver that message to him. After hearing the king's response, Marquis Bessus had thought to himself that the king had abandoned the Ardens. Inside the mansion, the baron's wife was crying, while Sir Manhattan ordered the servants to close the windows and bring some warm tea for the baron's wife. He then told another servant that he was returning to the baron, to which the servant reminded him to be careful. The grandmaster thought that something was off, wondering why Ethan hadn't killed him. Ethan was fighting the Baron's knights, one of which found an opening but Ethan dodged the attack by a hair's breadth. Another knight attacked him from above, and Ethan used his sword to defend himself and jump backwards. The Baron thought that his knights were doing a great job fighting against the Archduke. Sir Manhattan approached the Baron, informing him that he had escorted his wife to a safe place. Baron Cargas told Sir Manhattan that he might not need to fight at all, but Sir Manhattan thought to himself that the Archduke was just looking down on the knights. Ethan jumped high, counting his enemies before launching an attack. He managed to escape from being cornered. Baron Cargas wondered where Ethan had learned such a technique. He told Ethan that he wouldn't be able to escape from him, adding that from today on, the Archduke would be locked and forgotten in the basement prison. Not just for ten years, but forever this time. Ethan was preparing for his next move, 
saying that his next attack would be a kind of wide-range attack and that he couldn't afford to let innocent bystanders get hit. Ethan released a massive red-colored mana that surrounded the entire field. Baron Kargas wondered what the intense energy coming from Ethan was. The Grand Master sensed that it was dangerous, so he yelled and told them to dodge. Ethan released the second form of his ultimate attack, cutting the Baron's elite knights in half. Some of the knights survived, but many died. The Grand Master defended the Baron, awed by what he witnessed, he thought to himself that the firepower was too great with only a small amount of mana. Baron Kargas was shocked, unable to believe that his elite knights had been defeated with one swing. Ethan reached his body limits, almost running out of mana, and he would have collapsed if he hadn't had the blessing of the Fire Monarch. Ethan then approached the Baron and told him that he was next, informing him that the sin for scorning the Duke's family for so long would not be light. The Baron was terrified, telling his knights that Ethan must have been tired, and whoever took down the Archduke would be rewarded. Grand Master Manhartan was sweating in fear, thinking to himself that it was impossible, the skill Ethan unleashed wasn't just powerful but it also accurately found his target within that massive attack. Something he had never seen before, those who had survived must have felt the huge gap in power between them and the Archduke, even if they stood up, they wouldn't be stupid enough to raise their blades. Ethan asked the Grand Master if he wanted to go again. The Grand Master replied that he had already lost to him. Upon hearing this, Ethan attacked Baron Cargas, causing him to lose consciousness. Grand Master Manhartan hurriedly went after the Baron to check his condition. Ethan ordered him to lock up the Baron in the prison and watch over him. The Grand Master was shocked, asking Ethan if he wanted him to imprison his own lord with his own hands, he added that he was also a knight following a knight's code. Ethan replied to him that he was leaving it to him because he was a loyal knight, the Baron had already forfeited his title by committing a treason, and, according to the law, their family members all would be executed if he managed to escape. He further added that he should not forget his purpose if he was a loyal knight. Manhattan replied that he would follow Ethan's order. Baron Cargas was sent to prison, making a fuss and yelling, demanding that they open the jail. Ethan told Sir Manhattan that he would leave the rest to him. As Ethan was about to leave, Sir Manhattan asked why he and some select knights had been spared from attack despite following Baron Helmut's orders to attack Ethan. Ethan replied that the sword speaks the heart and that he had likely heard before that knights talk with their blades. Everyone he met after waking up from Mana Rush was the same. They all wanted to bury the Duke's family, who had saved their country, as if what they'd done was shameful. However, after clashing blades with Sir Manhattan and the other knights, Ethan realized that there were still people who respected the Duke family in a world like this. He was a bit relieved, it didn't matter much whether it was remorse or longing. Whatever the reason was, there was still someone who remembered and respected the Duke family's blade, and that was enough for Ethan. Ethan said that he had talked for too long and then told Sir Manhattan that he would leave the place to him. Ethan entered the Baron's office, where a person was waiting to greet him. The man introduced himself as Raymond, the oldest son of the Baron family. Raymond told him that he had been waiting for him to arrive. Ethan approached him and told him to choose his words wisely. Raymond was thinking to himself that he was different from his brothers and father. Raymond asked Ethan if he wanted to make a deal with him. Ethan grinned, grabbed Raymond's neck, and lifted him up. He told him that a deal is made when both parties are in the same position. He reminded him that the Baron family had raised a blade, committing treason to the direct line of the Arden family, and asked Raymond if he thought he was in a situation to make a deal. Raymond was having difficulty breathing and thought to himself that he needed to talk before he died. He told Ethan that he knew some information about the seventh family of the kin. After hearing it, Ethan dropped Raymond down, threatened him, and told him that if he spouted any lies, he would send him to prison for treason. Raymond replied that it was really related to the seventh family and handed him the book, containing the agreement before technology. After the Arden family was ruined, the Seventh Family requested the Duke's vision book from the collateral families. Because they wanted to prevent danger from nearby nations by raising their troops, which had been weakened by the war, they had no choice but to hand over the Arden's vision book. Raymond explained to Ethan that, with their technology, they could never understand the trick to the vision, so they had to buy the simplified version from the Seventh Family. Ethan was frustrated, thinking to himself that the Baron family was incompetent. Raymond further added that high-ranked translations such as mana breathing were so expensive, they had to greatly tax the citizens. Ethan told him that the book was trash, with only miscellaneous skills. 
Of course, if they were sane, they wouldn't have given away something so important so easily. In the end, the Baron family only got used and lost everything. When everyone was having a hard time, they had relied on each other and made an alliance, but in a world where the danger was gone, they only wanted to fill their own greed. Ethan told him that he would spare the remainder of the Baron's family, but in return, he ordered him to bring him all of the Baron's account books and wait at the outbuilding until further instructed. Raymond felt relieved to hear it. Ethan was wondering where he was, he thought he had been training in the training grounds just a moment ago, when suddenly a dragon had swung a sword and slashed him. Ethan thought he had been cut by the dragon, but found another knight had been slashed by the dragon. He realized he was in his past memories. A man suddenly appeared and spoke, telling Ethan that it was a pretty big victory for the Archduke. Ethan realized who the man was, the past Baron Cargas. The past Cargas told him that Ethan should be dead and in hell, suddenly coming back into the world and flying around makes Ethan look like a Wyverian. The past Cargas asked him if it was right for him, telling him that Ethan was just an outsider. Just like the ones he hated. The man further added that he should not change the flow of the world on his own. Ethan yelled, no, and slashed the Phantom of Cargas. Ethan thought to himself that his sister, Myers, and Taryn were all alive, unlike in his past life. It didn't matter what was right or wrong, no matter what the flow of this world was, he would protect his family no matter what. Suddenly, Ethan heard someone yelling. An old man was making a commotion at the front of the gate, trying to get in and saying that the Archduke knew him. The man grabbed Jaren, telling him to let him meet the Archduke. Jaren responded that he was also a guest. Ethan approached them and asked if he was Priestien, noticing that Jaren was also present. The old man was glad to see the Archduke. Priestien, nicknamed the document-catching monster in Ethan's past life, was one of the Arden family's core people, someone who had risen from being a commoner to a count with his skill alone. No administration task would take more than an hour with him. After the commotion at the front of the gate, Priestien had calmed down and was explaining to Ethan that all the executive officials, including himself, had been kicked out for simply supporting Ethan. Ethan thought that they had cut off useful people first in order to break the Duke's family from the inside. He was just starting to look for someone who could take care of administrative tasks for him, so he was thankful that Priestien had come just in time. Ethan said to say hello to Michelin, who was a merchant working for the Duke's family. Priestien told Jaren that he was sorry, to which Jaren replied that it was alright. The Archduke suddenly taking over the Baron's family had made Jaren very surprised. Jaren was worried that the Senate might do something about it, but Ethan told him to stop talking about the Senate, the place was under Duke Arden's family, the Arden's land. Jaren replied that this was only if the king gave ownership. Ethan told him that he had heard it all from the eldest son of the Baron's family, from the collateral families to the seventh family, they were pulling off quite the spectacle. He asked him if he, the direct line of Arden, really needed permission to take it back from a useless king who had made it like this. He told him not to worry and that he would bring good news soon. Jaren sighed and said that he would believe that because it was Ethan saying it. He then said that he would be on his way to take care of the business Ethan had assigned him. Jaren left the two, and Priest Yen told Ethan that he was glad to see the changed Archduke. Priest Yen said that, at the present situation, Ethan needed many administrative people. He said that he was raising a child and asked Ethan if he wanted to meet him. The white-haired kid entered the room, Priest Yen said that he had adopted him through a connection and had brought him along. The kid greeted Ethan then introduced himself as Lawrence. Ethan was shocked to hear the name Lawrence, thinking that he resembled someone he knew. Ethan remembered his past memories, when they were fighting against the dragon army. A white-haired knight riding a horse approached Ethan, he was called Sylvia and said that their troops were in position. Ethan replied to him that Sylvia was always faster than he expected. Ethan told him that Sylvia had been working hard, planning for a week. Sylvia had managed to turn the tide on the highlands, with Arden's death-defying corps playing a big part. Now Ethan just had to give the attack command. Sylvia was probably the only soldier who planned strategies like that, always sending the cavalry to the best positions of the enemy lines. Ethan said that he should really have to recognize Sylvia's ability. He realized that Sylvia hadn't slept for three days. Ethan was worried that Sylvia might collapse and leave everything to him. Sylvia told him that, after he ingrained the plan and tactics into his body, he was never at ease when a person died, and in a situation in which the entire human race was in danger from those monsters. If he could save even one more person with his tactics, he would gladly lay down his life.
Ethan told him to cut all of those damn invader bastards off and save the human race. When the dragons marched forward, Ethan rallied his troops. That day's fight was more violent than any other, countless lives were lost, but thanks to the genius soldier Sylvia's tactics, the humans overcame a huge disadvantage in power and won. But, that was the last of Sylvia. Back to the present, Ethan was sure that the kid was Sylvia, but he was wondering why Sylvia was calling himself Lawrence. Not just the name, but his mood was also different. Unlike the past, after Arden fell, it looked like things had changed such that the collateral families were becoming tyrants. Lawrence spoke, thanking Ethan for taking revenge on the Baron. He said that his family had starved to death because of the excessive taxes. Priest Yen told Ethan that he had come because Lawrence wanted to see him. Ethan thought of testing Lawrence to see if he had the same talent as Sylvia. He told Lawrence that Priest Yen had recommended him, so he was sure Lawrence knew the Baron's current situation. He asked Lawrence how he should take care of the rest of the Baron's family. Lawrence replied and said that he thought sparing them to keep them as scarecrows would be best. Ethan asked his reason. Lawrence told him that, if he didn't drag the Karga's name down, other families wouldn't be able to come mess with him easily. He explained that, even as scarecrows, Karga's was still Karga's, and if he guaranteed them a position, he would be able to recruit some snitches in the future, as many had been forced out thanks to the current power struggle. He concluded by saying that he was lacking in numbers, and that Ethan should use as many people as he could. Ethan asked Lawrence what he should do from now on. Lawrence responded by saying that he believed Ethan should make an army. He further added that Ethan couldn't handle the other nine families on his own, and that he should trick the collaterals and bait them into fighting each other. He explained that he would have enough time if he could do that, and that if Ethan could split up the Duke's land into three parts, he would have already won. Ethan smiled, as he thought that Lawrence and Sylvia were the same person. He told Priest Yen that he had a smarter child than he would have guessed. He then asked Lawrence if he wanted to become his advisor. At present, somewhere in the town, two knights were guarding the entrance while a few men were being held captive. Menharton told the defeated knight not to overdo it and said that he would face him. A man with blue mana surrounding him asked Menharton if he really was the Baron's knight. Menharton replied that he didn't have to hear it from him adding that building the right allies was the duty of a knight. The man attacked Menharton, accusing him of being a traitor. Menharton countered by kicking his enemy's chin and the man was taken down in one hit. Menharton then ordered the other knights to tie the man up and destroy his mana holes. Lawrence came in and told Sir Menharton that he had done well. Menharton reflected that, when he had first been told to annihilate the eight gates of darkness and to listen to someone he had just seen for the first time, he had been surprised but Lawrence was gruesomely proficient at taking care of work. As if it had been planned for a long time, Lawrence told them that they should move before people found out. There were a total of seven places left. He would take care of all of them before it got dark. A few hours prior, Ethan had asked Lawrence if he could be his advisor. Priest Yen left the room, sensing that it would be a long emotional conversation. Lawrence thanked Ethan for his offer, and told him he would have to decline. Lawrence then revealed the truth about his true gender, that he was a girl. Sylvia had grown up in a slum with low-status parents. She was a girl, and uneducated. Her life was at rock bottom. She was living in the worst conditions possible in this society. Her father was also someone who thought that way, and instead of resenting the Baron, who took the money for his medicine as tax, he died resenting her for being born as a girl and thus being unable to join the knights. Just because she was a girl, after her father passed away, because they didn't have money to pay taxes, the collectors started approaching her to sell her off as a slave. But, as she could not bear to leave her younger brother alone, they had no choice but to live while running away from the collectors. They had to steal and pickpocket, but she lived on, only thinking of her younger brother watching her. But those bastards didn't even allow that. Because the eight dark gates found her sibling in her, she lost her sibling, Lawrence, as well. She was someone who had been looked down upon just because she was a girl. Her life felt so pointless after everything precious had been taken from her. After her brother died, she made a decision to live as a man under her brother's name. She said that if it was leaked that she was a lowly girl, they would point their fingers at Ethan, saying he had hired her because she had sold her body. Sylvia said sorry and that she wouldn't be able to become Ethan's advisor. However, Ethan thought differently. He told her to ignore those horrible words. He further added that there was no rank or gender in talent and that she should raise her head confidently. 
If someone pointed a finger at Sylvia to make fun of her, he told her to break it. The Eight Gates were private organizations that the Baron had hired in order to commit tax evasion. Ethan gave her a chance to get revenge for her sibling and asked if she could handle it with a knight and a few soldiers. Sylvia replied that, if Ethan gave her one day, she would completely erase them from the city. Ethan replied that he would be waiting for a great result. A few days prior, in Hermes City, Ethan had told Myers to go to Count Ferns to pretend to be on their side. Myers and Hans were in the Count Ferns Kelmont Castle, and Myers commented on the office being incredible. Kelmont said, you flatter me. Count Ferns asked Myers why he had visited him, to which Myers sighed and said that his brother had been acting a bit strange since waking up. Myers told him that Ethan was hurting him and his chamberlain, Hans, whenever they got on his nerves. He said he couldn't stand it and that Ethan had been quiet ten years ago, possibly a side effect of the mana rush. He's flying around as a completely different person. Chimon was thinking to himself that all the pieces were falling together. He hadn't been able to get into contact with Baron Cargas for a few days, leading him to believe that the Archduke had made a move. He said there was no need to get hasty and that if he used the youngest duke as planned. Suddenly, Myers asked Chimon if he wanted to make a deal with him. Chimon asked, a deal. Myers replied and said that it was also the reason why he had come. He said that he had coincidentally learned that a faction structure existed amongst the collaterals and even all the Senate members weren't all close. Count Ferns was thinking where Myers had gotten information like those. Certainly, the collaterals were dividing into two factions to take more power and control over the land, the Aimland faction, being led by Count Lugan, and the Ferns faction, with Count Ferns at their core. Due to the similarity in power, they were very close to confronting each other and both sides were ready to pounce at the slightest opening. Myers said that he had discovered something important thanks to that. He said that Helmut Cargas had intentionally tried to turn him into a cripple and have their family become scarecrows. Count Ferns was alerted, thinking that his strategy had been leaked. However, Myers intentionally diverted the blame to Count Lugan and said that he had come to make a deal that would aid both of their goals. Count Ferns was wondering what was happening, as he had really thought that Myers had come because he held a grudge. Myers told him that, if Count Ferns helped him overthrow his reckless brother and allowed him to become head of the family, he would support Count Ferns fully with taking Count Lugan down. Count Ferns thought this as a great opportunity and wouldn't let the chance go. He told Myers that it was a good decision to come to him and that he would do anything to help Myers become the head. At night time the same day, Count Ferns called Hans. Hans entered the room and paid his respects to Count Ferns. Hans asked the Count why he had called him. Count Ferns welcomed Hans, saying that he had called him because he had something to ask. He said that it was clear that Hans was the one who had passed the wrong information to Myers. He asked him why he had helped him and that he wouldn't be safe either if the truth got revealed. Hans replied and said that he was Baron Cargas Chamberlain and he had come to Count Ferns to protect the youngest duke from the Archduke's violence. Count Ferns then asked Hans why he had come to him if he had the Baron's family. Hans replied that the Archduke was very hostile toward the Cargas family, so he couldn't go to the Baron's, as he didn't know when the Archduke would be there. He said that it was also obvious what would happen if he went to the opposite faction. He further added that he had just slightly changed the truth he had told the youngest duke. The count said that Hans was a sly bastard. He told Hans that he had been a great help to him and that coming to Count Ferns instead of going to the Baron was a great choice. Count Ferns said that he would consider Hans as one of his people now and told him not to worry. Hans was thankful for the count's generosity, Count Ferns was worried, saying that it would be hard to figure out the Archduke's intentions right after Helmut was hit. Hans volunteered, asking the Count if he could send him to the Baron's place. He told him that he wanted to prove his loyalty to Count Ferns since he had taken him in. He said that he had experience seeing the Archduke up close and had connections there, so he would be helpful. Count Ferns then asked Hans if he could figure out the Archduke's movements and timing. Hans replied that he could. The Count gave Hans a crystal ball, telling him to use the crystal ball to report on the situation. Hans replied and said to leave it to him. After receiving the crystal ball, Hans left the room, thinking that everything was going according to plan so far and that Myers had done his part amazingly, so he mustn't fail. After Hans left the room, Count Ferns asked a person, who was hiding behind the wall and was called Grandmaster Lowenson, of what he thought. Grandmaster Lowenson said that the situation did make sense, 
but it seemed like it was, conformed, to Count Ferns, as it would be rather advantageous for him. Lowenson added that it wouldn't be dangerous right away, and that Count Ferns needed to check it eventually. Count Ferns said that they would test his identity. Back to Manhattan and Lawrence, a knight was talking to another knight, saying that Lawrence was a new type of person he'd seen for the first time. He said that he'd seen and experienced many things from his life as a knight, but he'd never seen such a toxic man, as there wasn't a single drop of mercy in Lawrence's torture and disposal of criminals. Manhattan hesitantly asked him if there was no need to go that far. Lawrence replied and said that he had told the Archduke that he would erase those guys. The knight said that he had seen it by chance, and that Lawrence had a face of a devil who ate people. The knight continued to talk about Lawrence without knowing that he was approaching, while the other knight tried to say that Lawrence was coming, but he couldn't say it. Lawrence suddenly spoke, to the surprise of the knight gossiping about him. Lawrence told the other knight that he had something to report to the Archduke, and the knight let him in, informing him that the Archduke was in the training grounds. Ethan was training when Lawrence approached him, thinking that the training dummies no longer provided him with a challenge. Lawrence told him that he had a report to make, to which Ethan inquired if it was related to what they had talked about. Lawrence replied in the affirmative, adding that there were decent people from the eight gates, and if they were used, they could make a decent intelligence team. Ethan thought this was not a bad idea and asked Lawrence if they could act right away. Lawrence replied that around 60% of them could. At that moment, a knight came looking for Ethan and said that someone called Hans had come. The knight asked Ethan what he should do, to which Ethan ordered the knight to bring Hans to his office. Ethan and Lawrence returned to his office, where Ethan thought that Hans' infiltration had been successful. At Kelmont Castle's training area, Myers was training, surrounded by two knights. The two knights attacked Myers but he blocked both of them. He attacked the one in front of him, but he missed. The other knight attacked him again from above, but was blocked by Myers. Count Ferns and Lowenson were watching him from the balcony. Lowenson commented that Myers seemed to be of decent quality and said that Myers would be enough to become the head. Count Ferns attributed this to the Arden's blood. He told Lowenson to hide this well from Lugan and be wary of the Archduke's movements, and then he would leave the rest to him. Count Ferns laughed, saying that he had never been so excited for the gathering of the families. Back at the Baron's mansion, Ethan was holding a paper that contained the report of Hans regarding the infiltration results that Myers and Hans had made. He said that Myers seemed to be doing well and asked Hans how the Count had reacted. Hans told Ethan that it seemed like he was believing them without a hint of doubt because it was so perfect. Hans added that, since he had been sent to the Baron, it would be much easier to transport information. Lawrence concluded that Ethan had already started splitting the collateral families. He then asked Ethan if his objective was the gathering, to which Ethan replied yes. Hans was puzzled, wondering how Lawrence had known about the plan. He asked Ethan who the kid was. And Ethan introduced Lawrence and Hans to each other. He told them that the two would be working together a lot from now on and that they had to make sure to get to know each other. In a separate room, Hans and Lawrence were not talking to each other. Hans was thinking that he had only left for a week, but Ethan already had someone like Lawrence. He was wondering if the kid was very smart and noticed that Lawrence had a delicate face. Hans was thinking that Ethan had a romantic relationship with Lawrence. Lawrence was looking at Hans, wondering what perverted thought Hans was thinking for him to make such a face. Lawrence broke the silence, asking Hans if he was not fond of him. Hans replied that it was not true, explaining that he thought Lawrence was a bit young. Lawrence replied that it didn't matter, he just had to assist the Archduke properly. Lawrence then gave the report on the current situation to Hans, asking him to take a look at it. Hans thought that Lawrence was naturally ignoring him, saying that he could be better than he thought. When Hans read the report, he was surprised to learn that Baron Cargas and his two sons were in prison. Lawrence stated that the execution would be carried out soon. Hans was shocked and said that, even so, they were royals. Lawrence reminded him that 357 people had starved to death because of the Baron last winter, and the people who had suffered at the hands of his servants were countless. He asked Hans if he still thought that execution was too much. Lawrence further asked if it was fine for him to become a little suspicious of Hans' loyalty. Hans thought that he really would have been doomed if he had trusted the Baron. Another report caught Hans' attention, and he read the report regarding the subjugation of the Eighth Gates in one day. Lawrence said that there had been several other events as well, 
then asked Hans what his plans were from now on. Hans replied that, after gaining the Count's trust by giving them false information, he would have the youngest Duke get closer to the Count. Lawrence asked him if that was all. Hans told him that it had only been a day since he had gotten in and, within that, one day, had tricked the Count and come back. Hans added that, as they did not know what would happen next, it would be best to move according to the situation. Lawrence sighed, and Hans became angry when he saw Lawrence do so. Lawrence told Hans that it was not enough and that, if he returned to Count Ferns like this, he would definitely lose his life. Hans was shocked by what he heard. In the afternoon of the same day, Jaren came to visit the Archduke and introduced himself to Lawrence. He said that he was looking forward to working with him and had heard a lot about him from Ethan. Lawrence told him that there was no need to be polite, but Jaren insisted and said that he could not do that to the Archduke's advisor. Ethan asked Jaren if things were going well, to which Jaren replied that it was and that he had come to visit to tell him the response to the appeal. However, it was not the news Ethan had wanted. Ethan told him that it was fine and said that he would show his thanks to Marquis Bloten, who had accepted a hard request from him. Ethan read the note and threw it, saying that Marquis Bloten had written so much just to stupidly beat around the bush. Lawrence said that the king was on the side of the collateral families. Ethan said that the king had said that he had let go of the matter and they should resolve the problem between the houses, on their own. Lawrence said that it was good, and Jaron was shocked by what Lawrence said. He asked him what it meant. Lawrence explained that the biggest obstacles from now on were the king and the seven families. After all, the king had pushed the matter aside, but the archduke had used that to send an appeal. Ethan said that, with that letter, he was now sure that the seven families were behind the ten collateral families and the king had also abandoned them for his own gain. However, they would think about that later. All the pieces of their plan had been laid out. He said that the king had set the stage and they needed to start making their move. Jaron told Ethan that he wanted to circulate the potion all over the nation, but thought it would be impossible to do so on the scale of the Mises merchant he operated. Marquis Bess's house suggested using their merchant and distribution network to spread it. Jaron added that their family merchant was spread across the nation, so circulating potions nationwide wouldn't be too difficult, and exporting to nearby nations was also possible for at least a hundred times more profit. Ethan did not wait for Jaron to finish his words and immediately accepted the offer, saying that he didn't have a reason to decline. He told Jaron to tell the Marquis that he looked forward to it. Jaron replied that he would also do his best. Lawrence knocked on the door while the two were talking about business. Ethan told him to come in, and Lawrence informed him that the preparations were complete. Ethan apologized to Jaron and said that there was an important task he had to do. Jaron said that it was alright and not to worry about it, and that he would give him the details via document later. Ethan left Jaron, and the two proceeded downstairs to meet Menharton. Jaron was left standing, thinking that the Archduke really was an unfathomable person. He wondered if Ethan had predicted the potion circulation and already had the entire kingdom in his sights. He thought that he couldn't wait until the Archduke became the Duke who restored power to the Ardens once more. Sir Menharton, Lawrence, and Ethan were heading somewhere when Ethan told Lawrence to handle the potion circulation case when Jaron sent the documents. Ethan asked if they had reached their destination, to which Menharton replied that they were in the solitary area where the Baron was. Ethan inquired if he had been moved for interrogation, and Lawrence answered in the affirmative, adding that it seemed the Baron Cargas was hiding something even after being tortured. Ethan said that he would take care of it and asked Menharton to hand him the key and return to being a grandmaster. Menharton was worried, but Ethan reassured him, saying that he would keep his promise and that the rest of the Baron's family would be safe. Menharton thanked Ethan and said that he would return to his duty. Helmut was thinking how foolish he had been. When he was weak, young, and had lots of enemies, he was so careful that he was considered shy. However, after gaining power and rising within the Senate, he had grown increasingly arrogant without even realizing. He thought that it was his mistake for underestimating the Archduke, pushing him to the limit as well. He had truly been unable to recognize Ethan's power. When Ethan opened the cell, Helmut was surprised to see the Archduke but he was terrified to see Lawrence, remembering the torture he had endured. He hurriedly fell back, telling them not to get closer to him. He said that he had already said everything he wanted to know. Ethan told Helmut to quit with the bad acting. He couldn't believe that Helmut was still hiding information in that state, 
likely thinking that Ethan couldn't do anything to him if he didn't know about it. Helmut replied that he didn't know what Ethan was talking about. Ethan then threw him a piece of paper and said that Helmut was stalling for reinforcement. The Baron noticed the seal of the royal household. Helmut was shaking while reading the letter. Learning that the king had abandoned him and said to resolve the issue between the household on their own, Ethan asked Helmut if he now understood his current situation. The Baron cried and lost his only hope, kneeling and saying that he had lost and that he would tell them everything he knew. He asked him to have mercy on him and his sons, to which Ethan replied that it would depend on how he performed. He told him to tell them everything he had been hiding. Helmut said that there was a hidden fourth floor in the basement, and that all of the special items he had hidden in secret were in there, including a memento of the former duke. Ethan was infuriated when he heard that his father's memento had been taken by the Baron. He asked him if he dared to take the God Blade. Helmut told Ethan to calm down and said that it was something else. He reminded him that, even though he was part of the Senate, someone like him would never be able to take the God Blade. He then let Ethan know that the God Blade was completely broken. Ethan was shocked to hear that the God Blade was broken. The God Blade Dranian was the ultimate blade of the continent, capable of cutting through anything and withstanding any heat. This godly object had been passed down to the heads of the Arden family and was the symbol of the Arden's family. Ethan had also fought his last fight with the God Blade in his past life. Although he lost, that God Blade had withstood the onslaught of the Dragon King. Ethan could not believe that the God Blade was completely broken. He then asked Helmut to tell him everything about it. Helmut then told Ethan what had happened about 15 years ago, when the Wyvernians had suddenly come in from the Hydern Empire and the nation, which wasn't ready at all, had collapsed instantly. The Arden family had made a death-defying squad with only the best of the family. The squad had surpassed all of the elite knights with their talent, and clashed directly with the Dragon King. However, what had come back with the corpses of the squad was just the hilt of the God Blade. Upon hearing what Helmut said, Ethan thought that his father had fought the Dragon King and died gallantly. Ethan then asked what had happened with the Dragon King. Helmut replied that he wasn't sure, he had only heard that the Dragon King had been difficult to track after the death-defying squad had all been killed. Ethan was thinking that, if the Dragon King was hiding himself, then he might have received a critical damage in combat. Ethan looked serious as he asked Helmut why the non-aggression pact had passed, saying that without the Dragon King, it was a chance to wipe the dragons out. Helmut was shocked by what Ethan had asked of him, as it had all happened before Ethan had fallen into a coma. Helmut then asked Ethan if he had lost his memories as well. Ethan yelled for Helmut to answer him. Out of fear, Helmut then told Ethan that the pact had been led by the Genin Empire, they had pressured the nearby empires to sign it after they had done so. Ethan was surprised to hear it. Ethan had told Helmut to explain in great detail, to which Helmut had stated that the Dragon King had gone missing after the fight but the Dragon King's grandmasters and fierce army still stood strong, thus the flow of the battle did not change. Later, one of the envoys had contacted the Empire, which was how the strongest empire of the West had come to a truce with the Wyvernians. Following that, all the other empires had followed suit and agreed to a truce. Ethan and Lawrence had gone to the secret passage that Helmut was talking about. While they were going down, Ethan had thought and tried to understand the Empire, he had thought that the Empire wasn't that soft and their situation was better now than it was in his past life. He had decided that he would have to investigate the Empire later. Ethan and Lawrence had reached their destination, where a magic spell was cast on the large door to prevent intruders. Ethan said that they had done a good job protecting the place, then ordered Lawrence to open the door. Lawrence placed the artifact in the middle of the magic seal and, as the door was being opened, Ethan had an idea of what the memento his father had left. The two had gone inside and found that the place was much larger than they had thought. Lawrence had said that there was a lot of stuff, so it might be difficult to find the item Ethan was looking for, but Ethan had managed to find the memento easily. Ethan said that the collateral families hadn't known what it was, he had said that it was actually the eight ring, another item passed down with the god blade. Lawrence had said that it didn't look like a ring, to which Ethan had replied that it wasn't named after its shape. Ethan had used the breath of black flame on the slime-like object, which had caused red-colored mana to start flowing on Ethan's body. The slime-like object had dispersed, and Ethan had been standing still when something had entered his body. An incredible amount of energy had come at him, leaving Lawrence not knowing what was happening and worrying for him. Ethan had finished absorbing the treasure and said that it wasn't bad. Lawrence had asked him what had just happened, 
to which Ethan had explained that the eight ring was meant to be absorbed into one's body. No one knew who or what had made it, but it was a treasure that had been around since the start of the Ardens, often passed down to the head of the Arden family, something that only those with a considerable amount of Arden blood flowing through their veins could use. To people who did not have a good grasp of the breathing technique of the family vision, it was simply trash. Lawrence asked Ethan if the eight ring had some special powers, to which Ethan replied in the affirmative. Ethan then warned Lawrence to keep his distance, as he was about to demonstrate the power of the eight ring, which could be dangerous. Ethan began by moving his mana into the eight ring spread around his body, which absorbed the mana. He commented that it had been a while since he had felt the same experience. He decided to release the mana stored in the ring in an instant, and when he did, an overwhelming mana surrounded him. Lawrence was astonished at what he had seen, and asked Ethan if he had released his mana at one go. Ethan confirmed that he had, explaining that the ring stored mana and enhanced it to give explosive strength. He suggested that, with this power, retrieving the Duke's land would be easier, and reminded Lawrence to factor this into his calculations. Ethan was about to leave when he told him to work out the detailed locations of the other pieces of the eight ring as well. Lawrence replied that he would take care of it. Ethan thought to himself that not only were the collaterals refusing to treat his father, who had sacrificed himself to defend against the Wyvernians, as a hero, but they were also seizing the Duke's items out of greed. He determined to end the bastards who had challenged the honor of Arden with his own hands. In the morning, Ethan was in his office when Lawrence informed him that five of the remaining pieces of the eight ring had left the land. The chiefs of four out of seven families had each received one piece and the other was in Rimdell Kingdom. Ethan asked Lawrence if he was certain, to which Lawrence replied that it was accurate information gathered after interacting with the collateral. Ethan commented that there was no reason for the collaterals to lie now, but noted that it was a pain in the ass and it was impossible to find all the pieces in a short time. Ethan decided that it didn't matter, and that they had to oppose the collaterals to get Terran back anyway. He resolved to go along with it and think about it later. Ethan ordered Lawrence to prepare to attack because they would retrieve the eight ring piece right in front of them. A rumor about a descendant of a war hero who had risen up again for the people was quickly spreading among the populace. The people were sure that, after ten years of tyranny, a new hope would arise, now, that day had arrived. Somewhere at port, the stage where the Baron and his son were to be executed was heavily guarded and surrounded by many civilians. A man suddenly yelled and said that the Baron and his sons were coming, and the angry citizens yelled at them, most of them victims of the Baron's tyranny. Everyone yelled the same words, kill the Baron. A knight said to remain silent, informing the crowd that the Archduke was coming. The crowd was silent as Ethan passed through. The crowd in awe, admiring Ethan, saying that Ethan was the one who had defeated the Baron as soon as he stepped into the city, the one who would save the city. Ethan now stood in front of his citizens, telling them to listen. He informed them that Baron Cargas had broken the vassal contract while also reigning in violence and illegal acts up until recently. Many friends and family had been wounded because of the Baron, and some even lost their lives. Therefore, Ethan, the fittest of the Ardens, would return everything to normal, in accordance with the laws of the family, by having Baron Helmut and his two sons have their titles and properties confiscated and be executed. The crowd praised him. And after Ethan's speech, they proceeded to execute the Baron and his sons. At the Arden's family hunting mansion, Lawrence went to visit the Grand Duchess. Lawrence told her that Ethan had taken over Baron Cargas the day he arrived in port and was currently helping the city. The Grand Duchess was worried, saying that, since Ethan had executed a member of the Senate, the nine families might get involved. Lawrence told her not to worry, saying that everything was within the Archduke's calculations. The Grand Duchess asked Lawrence if he could tell her the rest of the story along the way. Lawrence said that he would, and asked who the knight next to her was. The knight said that, since the situation was urgent, he was late in introducing himself. He introduced himself as Paul Ten, the Grand Duchess Knight Escort. Lawrence was thinking that the knight was the one the Archduke had talked about as a symbol of alliance from the Bessus family. As they were on their way to port, Lawrence mentioned that, by using the split in the collateral, it was a strategy where Ethan could be safe. The Grand Duchess thanked Lawrence for answering her question. She said that until now, there had been no one she could ask about the current state of the family. She added that she had asked too many questions, but said that Lawrence was not only knowledgeable, but also very kind. Lawrence replied that she could also speak comfortably to him, 
as he was the Archduke's servant. The Grand Duchess was delighted to hear it, and she grabbed Lawrence's hands, expressing her gratitude that someone like him was Ethan's advisor, saying it was like she had gained another cute younger sibling. She told him to see each other more often and get closer. Lawrence was shocked by the Duchess's behavior. He was wondering how someone so beautiful and important could act without any hesitation. He thought if everyone in the Arden family was like that. After a few hours of traveling, they arrived at the palace, where Ethan was currently located. Ethan welcomed them, and the Grand Duchess commented on the palace's size. A knight approached Ethan and greeted him. The knight said that he had heard a lot about him from the family head, Jaren. He introduced himself to Ethan as the escort knight sent by Marquis Bessis, Paul Ten. Ethan greeted him back and shook their hands, and Paul Ten secretly used a mana wave. Ethan realized it, and thought that the knight was inspecting him. Ethan thought that Paulton's skill in hiding the movement of mana was quite impressive, most knights wouldn't have noticed. Ethan then released his own mana wave into the knight's body, causing Paul Ten to be alerted. He said that, by looking at his level, he seemed to be around a six-star knight, which meant that Marquis Bessis really cared about the situation. Ethan ordered Lawrence to guide Paul Ten to his room. Paul Ten thought it was strange, as he said that, looking at the amount of mana Ethan had, he should only be a two-star knight. He was left wondering how a two-star knight was even capable of scattering his mana. The Grand Duchess asked Ethan if there was any news from Myers, to which Ethan replied that he had received a letter from his brother. Ethan then guided his sister to her room, and she couldn't believe that she was going to live in such a beautiful room. His sister asked him if she could really use something like those, saying that it all looked so expensive. Ethan told her that a Grand Duchess of the Arden family should clearly live at least that well. He mentioned that he was thinking of asking for administrative lessons from an official and asked her if she wanted to learn. He added that she could decline if she didn't want to. The Grand Duchess asked him what he meant by, if she didn't want to. She said that, as Ethan was working so hard, she should help him as his sister. She wasn't sure if she'd be any good. But she would work hard to learn and try to be of help to Ethan. Ethan thanked his sister. Before leaving, he told his sister that someone other than Sir Paul Ten would be escorting the Grand Duchess until dinner. Ethan thought to himself that if it was a six-star knight, they would easily be able to accomplish what he had done. He reasoned that the reason Count Chimon and Lugan could be so nonchalant was because they had a lot of six-star knights on their side. It had only been a month since training started, and Ethan didn't have the power to face them yet. Ethan then knocked on the door and asked Paul Ten if he could spare him some time. Paul Ten opened the door and said that he wasn't finished unpacking yet, but told Ethan he could come in. After Ethan sat down, Paul Ten immediately asked him why he had come. Ethan said that he just wanted to offer Paul Ten a proposal, and since Ethan had overlooked Paulton's rudeness back at the gate, he was sure that this much was fine. Paul Ten thought to himself that Ethan had indeed noticed what he did back at the gate. With an awkward look, Paul Ten asked Ethan what kind of proposal it was. Ethan said that he wanted to test his skills against Paul Ten, since both of them were interested in each other's skills. At present, the Grand Duchess stretched her arms after finishing her studies, saying that it was almost dinner time and that time had passed so quickly when studying. Her escort knight, Willie, agreed and said that the sun was already setting. The Grand Duchess invited Sir Willie to have dinner with the family, saying that even if it was only for one day he was still her escort knight. Sir Willie asked if it was alright, to which the Grand Duchess said yes. The escort knight said that he was very honored but he did feel bad for Sir Paul Ten, explaining to her that Ethan and Paul Ten should be in the middle of a sparring match by now. The Grand Duchess was surprised to hear this and worried for her brother. Ethan and Sir Paul Ten were sparring in the training grounds. He attacked Paul Ten but was blocked by him. Ethan expected that Paul Ten could block it easily and thought that Paul Ten would be fine even if he attacked him all he had. Paul Ten thought that Ethan's attack was incredibly strong. Ethan then decided to raise the tempo and rushed forward. Paul Ten braced himself, preparing for Ethan's incoming attack. Ethan's attack was parried by Paul Ten, and he thought to himself that Ethan was faster and, if he held back any further, he would end up losing the match. Paul Ten dodged Ethan's attack and disappeared, and Ethan realized it and predicted that Paul Ten was behind him. Paul Ten attacked him from behind, but Ethan was prepared for it and blocked him. The two clashed once more, and Paul Ten was having a hard time understanding Ethan. He thought that the Archduke was using mana again after resurrecting, and even after having his mana hole shattered. 
He thought that it was already impossible for a normal person to do that, but he was even more curious as to why Ethan was able to use mana that exceeded his mana capacity. A knight's strength and speed is based upon their mana. That's why, normally, knights are ranked by their mana capacity. However, for someone like Ethan, whom Paul Ten had never seen the likes of, he had no way of knowing. The destroyed mana pieces that were spread throughout Ethan's body had fire essence instilled into them, which led to each piece taking up the role of one mana hole. Instead of channeling and releasing mana from the stomach, Ethan could supply concentrated mana throughout the body more accurately and quickly. Paul Ten attacked him with great force that made Ethan push back and fall to his knees, Ethan expected it would be hard for him to fight a six-star knight. Paul Ten complimented Ethan, saying that Ethan was incredible for holding out that much with his mana capacity. Ethan was thinking that sparring with a high-ranked knight brought back memories of when he was obsessed with learning swordmanship. Ethan then told him that he would start for real, and unleashed the eight ring. His mana overflowed. Paul Ten was shocked to see Ethan's mana capacity suddenly increased. Ethan rushed forward and attacked him fiercely. Paul Ten held out, releasing his mana. The two fought with great speed. Manhattan and the other knights were in awe while watching Ethan and Paulton sparring. Manhattan thought that Ethan's talent was very astonishing and wondered what the limit of Ethan's ability was. At their final clash, Paul Ten overpowered him and Ethan lost his sword and admitted defeat. He told Paul Ten that he couldn't find a way to get past him and said that it was a good duel. Paul Ten remarked that Ethan's strength and speed had suddenly increased greatly in the middle of the spar and asked Ethan if he had held back at the beginning. Ethan replied that he hadn't been holding back and explained that it was a skill of the Arden family. Paul Ten commented that the Duke family's techniques were incredible. Ethan said that, if Paul Ten had been giving his all, he wouldn't have even had the chance to use it. He then expressed that it was a really enjoyable spar and thanked Paul Ten for his time. Paul Ten replied that he should be the one to thank Ethan. Paul Ten thought to himself that it had been a total miscalculation. There were many rumors about the Archduke, so he had wanted to test his skill, but he never thought that Ethan was so good. It had been five years since Paul Ten had reached the level of a six-star knight but no matter what he tried he couldn't go higher. He thought that he would lose to Ethan, if he was given a year, and the thing that Ethan was lacking was the time to accumulate his mana. He called out to Ethan and said that he had learned a lot from him and asked him if they could spar again next time. Ethan thought that Paul Ten was interesting for not falling for his own ego and for wanting to learn more. He told Paul Ten that they could spar any time. Paul Ten thought that he had learned something new from Ethan's blade. The both of them shook their hands and then suddenly, the Grand Duchess arrived at the training grounds. She was very angry when she scolded Ethan and told him that he had been too extreme for not letting Paul Ten, who had come from a long way, rest. Ethan, with a troubled face, said that it wasn't like that. At the Bessus mansion, Marquis Bessus was talking to Paul Ten using a magic sphere. Marquis Bessus asked him if Ethan was as good as he was, to which Paul Ten replied affirmatively and added that Ethan's potential was beyond what he had imagined and it was the first time he had seen someone have that much talent and skill. Marquis Bessus could not believe that Ethan was so talented. Marquis Bessus told him to report everything, even the slightest things the Archduke does, which Paul Ten said he understood and would contact the Marquis on his next report date. After conversing with Paul Ten, Marquis Bessus was thinking that, despite Ethan having been in a coma for a long time and his mana hold being destroyed. He could still manage to clash with a six-star knight, which was surprising for the Marquis. He thought that Ethan's resourcefulness was already surprising, but his talent in martial arts surpassed that. Since Ethan would start moving now, Marquis Bessus could not sit idly. He called out his butler and gave him a list of items to buy, ordering him to procure them as soon as possible and send them over to Paul Ten with a letter. The butler replied that he would. Marquis Bessus was sure that Ethan was going to cause a big change in the Hydran Kingdom and thought that it would be a perfect opportunity for both families to bring their alliance closer. At night time, somewhere in the town, a building was on fire where prisoners were being held. The rascals that were in the eight gates of darkness had escaped. Some knights were suppressing the fire while the other knights were chasing the escapees. Hans was hiding in the bushes, having barely gotten away, and now wondering where he could go. Suddenly someone grabbed him and covered his mouth, the man told Hans to calm down and be quiet. The man introduced himself as a knight of the Count's family and said he was there to escort him while they headed to a safe place. Hans was thinking that everything was going according to Lawrence's plan. Sometime before the fire had started, Hans and Lawrence were in a room talking about the plan. 
Hans asked Lawrence if there was a reason to go that far, to which Lawrence replied that it was the only way to erase the Count's suspicion and it would be tough, so Hans needed to hold out. Hans said that it was crossing the line, to which Lawrence explained that the Count was someone who had no mercy, having easily cut off his longtime ally, Baron Cargus, as easily as a lizard would cut its tail. He further added that someone like Count Ferns would never trust a butler like Hans easily. Hans was worried for how long he would remain in the cell, but Lawrence told him that the preparations were done and there would be chaos everywhere with the eight gates breakout at night. They would use that to let Hans out and, when he did, one of the pursuers would appear in front of him. At present time, Hans and the Count's knight were running towards the safe place. The knight helped Hans get in, and, as they went in, the knight had told Hans that he would be safe in the basement. After Hans sat, the knight immediately asked him what had happened, to which Hans explained that Ethan had held him there and dragged him to prison and tortured him. The knight thought that Hans's wounds were deep and concluded that Ethan and Hans were on bad terms. The knight said that Hans's wound should get treated immediately, but Hans told him that he was fine and he should contact the Count first because he had important information. He mentioned that his sphere had been confiscated when he was captured, adding that it was something that affected the situation right then. The knight said that he understood and told Hans that he would contact the Count immediately. The next morning, Lawrence was in Ethan's office making a report to him. He informed Ethan that, as planned, Hans had made contact with the Count's family. Ethan said that it was good, adding that the Count should be getting more serious now. He then asked about the administration, to which Lawrence replied that they were recruiting people like they had planned, mentioning that there were many people that had been kicked out of the Duke's family. Ethan decided to entrust Lawrence with this task. Out of curiosity, Lawrence asked Ethan what he had been reading. Ethan replied that it was a letter personally from Marquis Bessus. Apparently Paul Ten had reported about Ethan to him. Lawrence asked Ethan if there was anything special about the contents of the letter, to which Ethan replied that there was. He said that Marquis Bessus had mentioned giving Ethan a gift to ensure their plan would proceed faster, adding that Marquis Bessus wanted to strengthen their alliance. Lawrence was wondering what the gift was, to which Ethan replied that it was probably an elixir. It is said that, in nature, ingredients that are highly concentrated with mana absorbed from the air are rarely found. Elixir is made when those ingredients are processed and made consumable. People who consume elixirs can fill up their mana hole. Ethan thought that he simply needed time and mana to reach what his past life had achieved. He believed that, if he increased his mana in a short amount of time using an elixir, his mana of fire would burn even hotter and brighter. The heat concentrated in his blade at the time was incomparable to what he could condense now, a regular steel blade would melt and not be able to survive that heat. Ethan told Lawrence that he was thinking of going away for a bit until the Marquis present arrived. Manhattan and three other knights would be guarding Lawrence. Lawrence asked Ethan where he was going, to which Ethan replied that there was an item he needed, an item that could handle him after he consumed an elixir. He said that he would be back with a new blade. Ethan then told him to take care of things while he was away. At Arden Dukedom's capital, Londinium, Count Lugan of the Amelton faction was infuriated, asking Count Ferns how the leader of the kingdom could take a servant's death lightly. Count Ferns implored Count Lugan to calm down, saying that if they assassinated the Archduke, there would be consequences and the king and the seven families would pin the responsibility on them, not just their titles, but their necks would be in danger. Count Lugan was aware of this and thought that the responsibility would be pinned down solely on Count Ferns. He thought that it was obvious why the Archduke had hit Cargus and that was because the Archduke had found out that Count Ferns had been using petty tricks. He said that Ethan had found out that the one who dragged the Duke family to ruin wasn't just the collateral, but Count Fern's faction as well. With a wicked smile, Count Lugan was planning to add more fuel to the fire and make sure they went after each other's throats. Unbeknownst to him, Count Ferns was aware of his thoughts and Ethan was going after Count Lugan. Count Ferns was secretly smiling, hiding his devious plan from Count Lugan. Prior to the two counts meeting, Hans had contacted Count Ferns, saying it was a success. Hans informed him that Ethan had asked about Count Ferns when he was being tortured, and that he had taken advantage of the opportunity to tell him the wrong faction, thus fooling him. Count Ferns was very pleased to hear Hans report and praised him for his amazing work. Count Ferns then reassured Hans that he knew he could trust him. 
At present, Ethan was riding a horse and heading to a small village where a supposed dungeon was located. Ethan was thinking that although he wanted the mana stones and treasures obtainable in the dungeon, the special metal he could only get in the dungeon was his main priority. A guard halted him, saying that entry to the town was currently restricted and asked Ethan to state his business there. Ethan showed him their family's symbol and stated that he was not a suspicious person. The younger guard did not recognize the token and said that even if Ethan had an identity card, they could not open the gate to anyone. However, the older guard slightly recognized the symbol and thought that it was Arden's family symbol. The older guard then asked Ethan if he was the Archduke, to which Ethan replied yes. Upon learning his identity, the guards immediately opened the gate, with the older guard escorting Ethan. He noticed that the town's atmosphere was strange, the huge street was lifeless and he could see nervousness in the townspeople's eyes. At first, he thought that they were on guard against him. An outsider, but Ethan noticed that some people's expressions were indicative of fear of someone else. Ethan asked the guard accompanying him where the village chief was. The guard replied and said that the patrol guard had gone to seek him, so he would be coming shortly. Ethan decided to go and meet him personally, asking the guard to take him to the village chief. An hour later, the village chief, Gillian, was telling Ethan a story about the town's hunter's experience. Gillian informed Ethan that the hunter had been hunting near the abandoned mine as usual when he heard a strange noise coming from inside the mine. Thinking it was the sound of a pickaxe, the hunter went in to see who was making the noise but instead saw something unimaginable, dozens of skeletons using pickaxes. Ethan asked Gillian if what he was referring to was, the undead. Gillian said that the hunter had said it was skeletons, and that he was scared so he couldn't go in. However, he was sure it was the sound of pickaxes. Ethan thought that there were a lot of strange things there and that if someone was after something in an abandoned mine, it had to be, that metal. Aphelion was not as strong as Mithril, but it was much harder than steel. Because of its strong affinity for mana, it was a mineral used to make magic items. Ethan was thinking that it should still be a few years before Aphelion was discovered there, to think there'd be someone else looking for it. Gillian was talking to the guard, asking him what those skeletons were looking for in an abandoned mine, but the guard did not know either. Ethan looked at the village chief, thinking that the townspeople knew about the metal yet. He would have to make sure whoever was controlling the skeletons were really after Aphelion. However, a problem arose, if the one who was responsible for the skeletons were powerful enough to control dozens of them. Then a dark magician, also known as a lich, was likely to be involved. A lich was an annoying being that controlled high-ranking undead. Ethan had no way of taking down a lich's undead army with his current power. If he was unlucky, he would have to give up on the Aphelion. Ethan stood up abruptly, saying that he would have to go check the mines immediately and ask them where the abandoned mine was located. Upon learning the location of the mine, he was now at the forest near it, he saw the mine but was wondering if that was the mine they were talking about. Ethan thought that it was small but he could hear mining sounds. He reached the entrance of the mine and noticed that they were not on guard at all, concluding that they were confident in their skills. While exploring inside the mines he remembered that the chief said that he reported to the baron about the undead, but Ethan had not seen any documents about it. If the chief was telling the truth, that would mean Helmet had hidden and denied the problem. Ethan was thinking if Baron Cargus had intentionally kept quiet about it when a lich could have potentially been on his land. Ethan was feeling like he was getting into something much more complicated. He reached the end of the tunnel where the undead were seen mining. Ethan thought that he was right, the skeletons were mining Aphelion, pondering if that was their goal. Ethan noticed someone with a unique energy emitting, and concluded that that was the dark magician controlling the skeletons, thankful that it wasn't on the level of a lich. He jumped, alerting the dark magician. Ethan was thinking that he could take the Aphelion for himself. The dark magician asked Ethan who he was, to which Ethan replied that the dark magician would die soon, so there was no point in telling him. The dark magician was preparing his technique using a dark mana surrounding him and said that he would turn Ethan into a skeleton as well. Ethan was alerted when he saw the man's technique, preparing his stance and asking him where he had learned the Wyverian breathing from. The Dark Magician laughed wickedly and, when Ethan asked him what was so funny, the Dark Magician replied that Ethan knew too much, even more of a reason to kill him. He attacked Ethan using a chain made from mana surrounded by dark energy. Ethan jumped backwards to dodge it, and the Dark Magician declared that his black magic chains had even shredded a five-star knights. 
The dark magician thought that Ethan was a mercenary knight hired by the town and told him that he was unlucky to have to lose his life over a few coins. The dark magician was planning to kill Ethan and absorb his mana to turn him into a skeleton that worked for him. Ethan was dodging the continuous attack from the dark magician, thinking that the man was weird and that his mana capacity was around rank 5, but his foundation was clumsy and he seemed to not know how to hide the flow of mana either. Ethan could clearly see the weak point of the flowing mana chain, and he attacked it. The man grinned, thinking that he had got Ethan. Multiple mana chains attacked Ethan from both sides. The dark magician was confidently laughing, reminding Ethan that he had killed a five-star knight, but he was a bit disappointed that Ethan was just a two-star knight. Ethan said that the dark magician talked a lot, then he destroyed all of the mana chains of the dark magician. The man was surprised to see his mana chains break apart thinking that it wasn't simply cut by a blade. The flow of mana inside the chains had completely stopped. Ethan rushed forward to attack the Dark Magician, and the man was puzzled as to how Ethan had done it, but he thought that now was not the time to be dumbfounded. The Dark Magician defended himself by casting a defensive spell, but the force Ethan used was too much and the Dark Magician's focus was on the front. Ethan used this chance to sneak from behind and attacked him, but the Dark Magician blocked him. The defensive spell couldn't withstand Ethan's attack and was about to break apart. The Dark Magician noticed this and called out his undead servants, who completely surrounded Ethan. The Dark Magician said that Ethan would have a hard time dealing with him while handling many skeletons at the same time, but Ethan wasn't phased at all. He used a wide-range attack to deal with the undeads and the Dark Magician, leaving the Dark Magician completely open. Ethan finished him off using a mana wave. Ethan was sure of it when he focused his mana near his heart, that the man used the same mana technique as the Wyverian tribes. Something Ethan had realized while researching wyverns in his past life. Instead of using a mana hole in their lower body, they used mana with their hearts. They called that a dragon heart, but it was mixed with a human's breathing technique. Ethan asked the man where he had learned the breathing technique from. Ethan knew that there was no way the dark magician had made it on his own, as he could see that it was mixed, and that there had to be a Wyverian that had passed it on to him. The Dark Magician slightly reacted to what Ethan said, and Ethan noticed it and told him that he was sure of it based on the Dark Magician's reaction. Ethan asked him to tell him everything he knew and threatened him that if he continued to keep his mouth shut, it would only hurt him more. The Dark Magician laughed at him, saying that he wasn't sure where Ethan had come from, but Ethan was pretty good. The man yelled and said that the church would last forever, then used his dark mana to kill himself. Ethan managed to survive the explosion, he would have gotten hit if he hadn't left mana in the eight ring. Ethan figured out the source of the breathing technique, a church, a cult organization that was in Ethan's past life. They were a psychotic church that bowed down to the power of the wyverns. He thought that a dark magician that followed the church, the lost records of the Baron family, and a breathing technique that was both human and wyvern all complicated matters. Ethan further suspected that the Dark Magician was not the only one in the Baron's large land, and that the Wyvern tribe might have already infiltrated the land. Ethan was angry that the Wyverians dared to hide within the Arden's domain. He declared that he would be busier when he completed his new blade. The dwarves live far underground beneath the mountain and are professionals and it comes to minerals, gems, and machines, making even the greatest human technology look like child's play. Humans became envious of this talent, leading them to capture dwarves and use them as slaves. This is why the dwarves began to live away from humans and did not appear until all the species came together during the Wyvern War. At present, Ethan was heading to the deserted-looking dwarven village. He remembered how the dwarves' talents had become a great help during the war, and Ethan had also greatly benefited from them. As Ethan became closer to them, he learned about the location of the dwarven town, so he was sure it was that place. He wondered what had happened, noting that there were no security guards and it looked like it had been abandoned for a while. His biggest concern was persuading the dwarves, who were hostile to humans, into crafting something for him. But it was a difficult situation, as Ethan could not even see any of them, only dwarves dealt with Aphelion, and he had nowhere else to go. Suddenly, a dwarf showed up, surprised to see a human. The dwarf asked him what brought him to their village. Ethan replied, saying he had come to commission a craftsman and asked if they had moved to a different location. The dwarf inquired why he was looking for craftsmen there, as there should be a lot of craftsmen in the city. Ethan asked the dwarf what he was talking about and the dwarf responded that it had been a long time since they had all left to make some money. 
Ethan asked the dwarf where all the blacksmiths had gone, the dwarf said that if that was what Ethan was looking for, then he should head north from there. The dwarf added that there should be a lot of them in a town called Greston. Ethan pondered how dwarves, who hated humans, could really live in a city with humans. He thanked the dwarf and gave him a courtesy gift, which the dwarf gladly accepted. The dwarf told Ethan that he was a human who knew his stuff. Ethan went to the town of Greston, thinking that the dwarves he knew had no prejudices against the human race and valued skill more than money. The guard captain called out to Ethan and noticed his dark expression, asking if there was something Ethan felt uncomfortable about. Ethan said it was nothing and apologized for making the guard captain worry. The guard captain said it was already a great honor for the Archduke himself to come there personally. Ethan thought the guard's reaction was funny. Ethan noticed the street was pretty loud and asked the guard if it was normal. The guard captain replied, of course, and stated that dwarves were the best merchants, one wrong encounter, and they would often find their pockets emptied out. The guard captain assured Ethan that since he had come to Greston, he would make sure to escort him to a trustworthy place. Ethan said he would leave it to him. After an hour of walking, Ethan and the guard captain arrived at the most skilled forge in Greston, Steel and Fire Forge. Ethan noticed the line was incredibly long and asked the guard if they would even be able to go in that day. The guard asked Ethan to wait a moment and he would go inside and talk to them. A white-haired dwarf called out to Ethan, guessing that he was there to get a pretty decent item made. The white-haired dwarf was impressed that a human had come there with the precious Aphelion. He told Ethan that he wouldn't be able to pull out the mineral's true power in the forge he was looking into right then. Ethan wondered if the dwarf had figured out the contents of his backpack just by looking through the gap. He thought that the dwarf had a keen eye. Ethan then asked the dwarf if he knew a lot about Aphelion. The dwarf laughed hard at what Ethan had asked him. The dwarf explained that Aphelion was a mineral that had the power to change the properties of mana, as well as increase their bonding. It was harder to deal with because it melted at a higher temperature than steel, but the quality of it increased the hotter it was melted. He added that, with the high temperature compression technique, one could increase the hardness by more than double because the mineral crystallized. The dwarf said that Ethan's question was wrong and that he should be asking if there was a dwarf that knew more about Aphelion than him. Upon hearing the dwarf's words, Ethan remembered the dwarf he knew from his past, thinking that the two had some similarities. The guard captain yelled and called out the Archduke, telling him to head inside, saying that Ethan was an important guest. The guard captain noticed the dwarf beside the Archduke, asking him why he was there. Ethan realized that the guard captain knew the dwarf. The guard captain said that he knew him and the dwarf was called Poplance. The dwarf was shocked to learn that the one he was talking to was the Archduke. He wanted to confirm it, so he asked Ethan if he was the Arden family's Archduke who had collapsed from Mana Rush, the one who had taken over the Karga's land as soon as he woke up. Ethan asked Poplance if he was now being respectful after hearing Ethan's title, and said that the dwarf he knew wasn't like that. Ethan preferred the commanding attitude he had a while ago more. The guard captain told Poplance to go away, but Ethan stopped him and said that he would commission Poplance instead. The guard captain was worried, but Ethan insisted and asked the guard captain if he could deliver a letter and send it to port as soon as possible. The guard captain said that he would do as Ethan requested, but he warned Ethan to be careful of Poplance because he was a blacksmith with a criminal record. Poplance explained to Ethan what had happened to him ten years ago. He said that a dwarf named William and him were famous professionals in the kingdom's capital and were rivals like no other. One day, a royal order announcing that they were recruiting a blacksmith for the royal household came. Poplance was confident, because even though they were rivals, they both knew Poplance was more skilled than William. He stayed up many nights and was able to create the masterpiece of his lifetime. But the result ended up in his miserable defeat. Poplance stated that William had bought over the judges in advance and, on top of that, had framed him as a con artist, beginning the stigma of Poplance's criminal record. Poplance suddenly stood up and said confidently that he wanted to make a proposal to Ethan. He informed Ethan that it was the end of his forge, so he would craft Ethan's weapon free of charge. However, if the weapon he made for Ethan was to his liking, Ethan would have to make an exclusive contract with Poplance for the Arden family. Poplance added that it was his final bet and he would place his future and everything he had on Ethan. When Ethan asked him what he would do if the blade Poplance made wasn't to Ethan's liking, Poplance confidently replied saying that he wouldn't mind if Ethan cut off his head. Ethan said that, if Poplance was confident, then he had no reason to refuse. 
he then told him to show off his skills. Popolance was very glad that the deal was made. He told Ethan that, if he just waited for three days, he would make him the ultimate Aphelion blade. When Ethan asked him why three days and not a month, and further added that, no matter how talented Popolance was, dwarves worked alone in the end, Popolance grinned and said that the dwarves had changed a lot. He then revealed that he had learned something from William, as a master blacksmith of the dwarves, have firm pride, but throw away the stubbornness and make trustworthy allies. He instructed Ethan to prepare the contract and promised that their Flame Hammer Forge would make Ethan the ultimate blade. At the workshop of Flame Hammer Forge, Popolance and his companions were busy melting the ore. One of his dwarf companions called out to Popolance, informing him that the ore was starting to melt and asking if they could really use that much melting solvent, as the furnace wouldn't be able to take it. Popolance replied that it did not matter and instructed him to pour it all in, use all the ingredients. Even if the furnace broke, Popolance assured that they would make sure to finish it. Molten iron started to come out while maintaining the temperature and cooling it as slowly as possible, the hardness of Aphelion was determined there. After cooling the ore, some of the dwarf blacksmiths started to forge it, while some began the carvings, and Popolance started to do the finishing touches. Popolance and his companions were happy after finishing the blade in three days. Ethan came in to check if the blade was done, and Popolance saw him coming, saying, great timing. There's just one last step. Popolance informed him that it was not a normal sword, and for the last step, the sword needed something called mana quenching. Ethan was wondering what mana quenching was, as he had never heard of it before. Popolance explained to him that, as the name suggested, it was a process where mana was engraved into the sword. Popolance then instructed Ethan to infuse his mana into the sword, and if he held out until the end, the ultimate Aphelion greatsword would be complete. Ethan had a smile on his face upon feeling the light weight of the greatsword and the good grip in his hand. Unlike steel, it felt smooth yet strong. He only leaked a small amount of mana, but it flowed smoothly, as if the sword was sucking it in. Ethan told them to stand back for a bit and said that he would start immediately, then using the Arden's hidden ultimate technique's first form, Fire Blade. Popolance witnessed a firepower unknown to him, wondering if it was the Arden family's fire mana. Popolance shouted and told everyone to hide behind the wall before they got hurt. Ethan decided to raise the power output to maximum, leaving Popolance in awe and unable to say anything. Ethan was successful, managing to infuse his mana into his greatsword. He looked satisfied, saying it was very well made, and then told Popolance that he had passed. He said that the moment he arrived in port, he would send over the materials and personnel, as well as the contract, and then welcomed Popolance to joining the Arden family. At the port city, Lawrence and Manhattan were heading to the prison cell. As they were going down, Lawrence had said that he really didn't know that the Baron would tolerate the undead in his territory. He further added that the Archduke had wanted him to look into information regarding the Dark Mage that controls the undead. Lawrence thought that the Baron's butler might know something. Lawrence told the Baron's butler that he was sure he knew about the town of Paloran and asked him if he remembered the appeal that happened there. The butler said that he did remember. Lawrence asked him why the Baron ignored the appeal and hid the truth to which the butler replied that he did not know a lot. He informed them that it happened often when he was working at the Baron's office, suddenly, without a trace, someone wearing a black robe would appear in the middle of the room. Every time that happened, he had to leave the room. It looked like the Baron was accepting all the commands the person in black was giving him. He believed that was also why the appeal at Paloran was hidden away. After returning to the Baron's room, Lawrence heard the Baron say that there were more than one mages. Lawrence thought that there were a few specific instances to be looked at here. He thought that, since the door wasn't opened, it wasn't any kind of invisibility. There were also spells that used shadows and black magic, but that would mean the butler would have noticed as well. The butler said that he really didn't know anything else. Lawrence called out to Manhattan and said that he was finished. Manhattan asked Lawrence if he found a clue, to which he replied yes. Lawrence further added that he would have to investigate the entire dukedom. He then ordered Manhattan to summon knights that could help the intelligence faction and instructed him to finish all of the investigations before the Archduke returned. A few days had passed before a guard was heard yelling that the gate should be opened, as the Archduke was entering. When Ethan arrived, Lawrence was there waiting for his arrival. Lawrence asked him if he had a safe trip, to which Ethan replied yes. Ethan then inquired if something had happened while he was away. Lawrence informed him that, when Ethan left, 
the collateral families had been relieved because things were quiet. Ethan was relieved to hear this. He then asked about the thing he had requested in his letter. Lawrence said that all preparations were complete, to which Ethan said that he would check it immediately. Lawrence said that he would prepare the documents in the office. In Ethan's office, Lawrence made a full report, informing Ethan of the space travel magic. While reading the report, Ethan noticed some information that caught his attention. He asked Lawrence if the report was accurate, to which Lawrence replied affirmatively, saying that he had gone with the Knights to check for himself. Ethan thought that the investigation report was definitely rational and nothing was wrong with it, but the results were so unexpected. Space travel magic, or teleportation, is definitely a convenient type of magic, but due to its extreme mana consumption, most mages avoid it. In large cities, nobles use a bunch of expensive mana stones to create and use a teleport gate, which was its main use. Ethan was thinking how it was possible for there to be 50 skilled individuals that could use space travel magic. He then suddenly remembered the religious dark mage from the cult he had met at the abandoned mine. Ethan remembered that the dark mage had definitely had overflowing amounts of mana. The mana breathing technique with wyvern skills infused and it was a skill used to inflate mana in a short amount of time. Ethan thought that, if that breathing technique was easy to learn, then mages would be able to have large amounts of mana overall. It was a theory that did make sense. Then this was the real problem. Among those 50 people, there had to be someone related to that cult. At present, Paul Tan was holding Ethan's greatsword, saying that it was light and the craftsmanship was exquisite, adding that the skills of the dwarves could not be underestimated. Ethan said that, if Paul Ten wanted, he could also ask them to make a blade for him. Paul Ten asked Ethan if he meant it, and Ethan replied that Paul Ten was always working hard as his sister's escort, so he told Paul Ten to think of it as a small reward for his efforts. As Paul Ten put down the greatsword, he said to Ethan that he had not really done anything and it was so peaceful that he was wondering if he was allowed to be this idol. Ethan responded and asked him how the Grand Duchess was doing. Paul Ten replied that the Grand Duchess had been working on administrative work with Pri Yen and it was her first time dealing with those kinds of tasks, but she seemed to be taking care of them incredibly well. He also added that Pri Yen had acknowledged the Grand Duchess as a quick learner. Ethan said that, as he thought, leaving his sister to Paul Ten and Pri Yen was the right choice. Paul Ten thanked Ethan and handed him the gift from Marquis Bessus. Ethan thought that it might be an elixir that was specialized in explosively raising mana capacity, as Marquis Bessus must have thought that this type of elixir would be the most effective for Ethan. Ethan expected that Marquis Bessus's excellent insight was still the same in this life. During Ethan's trip, he had succeeded in planting the essence of fire into the destroyed mana hole pieces that were spread to the important parts of his body. He thought that, if he increased his mana by eating the elixir, he should be ready to break into the third stage of the breath of black flame. After eating the elixir, Ethan was experiencing the circulation stage, a stage where black flames were genuinely assimilated into mana. From this stage, Ethan would have to withstand unimaginable pain. First, Ethan had to activate the essence of fire that was filling up his mana holes to the extreme. After he heated up the mana to the point where it could melt steel, when the heat went into his body, his blood and organs would feel pain as if they were burning. Once those negative emotions twisted by pain started to mix with the mana of fire, the fire would start to turn black. In the final process of circulation, an enormous amount of mana entered Ethan's body, making Ethan shout. But, Ethan was wondering why he did not feel anything at all after everything he had done. He thought that he should have been feeling pain as if he was burning, and wondered if he had failed. Suddenly, Ethan heard a voice saying, you did not fail, and a fire appeared out of nowhere. The fire monarch Rorosha came out of it and asked Ethan how he was doing. Ethan was shocked to see Rorosha and wondered why Rorosha had shown up. The fire monarch complimented Ethan, saying that he had not failed but instead had grown. Rorosha said that Ethan had produced an incredibly pure fire mana and had been able to descend after being naturally pulled by the energy of that fire. Unlike the other family heads, Ethan had been able to avoid the corrupted flames. Ethan was shocked at what he heard from the fire monarch and asked if the corrupted fire he was referring to was the breath of black flame. Rorosha confirmed, adding that the black flame, which is mixed with the emotion of pain, is not part of the true nature of fire. He further noted that an incomplete fire's growth is limited. Ethan could not believe that the breath of black flame was a skill that was incomplete and had a limit. 
the secret breathing technique that made the Arden family the strongest and most renowned swordsmanship family on the continent, the Breath of Black Flame. The Black Flames were the identity of the Arden family, and no one doubted the destructive force of the Black Flame. Ethan could not argue with Rorosha's words as, when he had come to the brink of becoming a transcendent in his past life, he had felt a wall, a limit that he had no way of overcoming. He wondered if it was because of the breath of black flame and asked himself what he needed to do. Rorosha noted that Ethan had a lot on his mind and mentioned that there was another time in the past when pure energy had helped someone descend. The identity of that energy was the creator of Ethan's family, the founding head of the Arden family, Jeron Arden. Not only was he the founder of the Arden family, he had also created secret techniques for countless families. However, all records related to him had disappeared over time, with nothing remaining. The only two things known about him were, in the stories passed down as a legend, his level had been passed a transcendent and the flames that he produced had burned white like light. After hearing the fire monarch, Ethan realized there was a white flame. He berated himself for not remembering until that moment. Rorosha noticed that Ethan had realized something and said that he would wait for the day when Ethan's pure flames blossom and that they would meet again. Ethan said it was faint, but he thought he got something, the founding head of the family who produced white flame and past transcendence, the black flame being incomplete and the limits of his past life. But this time, the flames didn't turn black and Ethan finished the circulation process. Then, perhaps, he could break that limit. At Baron Lamenton's headquarters in the small town of Ultron, a man suddenly called out to Baron Lamenton and reported an urgent news from the Karga spy, saying that the Archduke was going to order an advance on Lamenton's land. Baron Lamenton was shocked, thinking that Ethan had gotten revenge on Count Ferns, he hadn't prepared defenses. A knight beside him told him to calm down, boasting that he had recently become a five-star knight. The knight said he was looking forward to meeting the Archduke and told him to tell the Archduke to come whenever he wanted. A few days prior to confronting Baron Lamenton, Ethan and Paul Ten were training. Paul Ten blocked Ethan's attack and he wondered what kind of swordsmanship Ethan was using. He thought that it was definitely just one slash, but the impact made it feel like there were at least two. He knew Ethan's mana capacity had increased, but he never thought a completely new swordsmanship style would appear. Ethan is using the prominence technique. It's a secret technique that only the Arden family, who have passed the circulation stage, are capable of. While Ethan chained the attack together, Paul Ten was thinking that he couldn't defend Ethan's attack with swordmanship alone. Paul Ten decided to use Sword Aura to deal with Ethan, who dodged and made a counterattack, cutting through Paul Ten's Sword Aura. He was shocked to see that his Sword Aura was cut by Ethan. He had intentionally thrown that attack using a significant amount of mana for Ethan to dodge it. Ethan, with a smile on his face, said that Paulton's attack was a good answer and he was forced to cancel his chain attack because of it. Paul Ten wondered how much the Archduke had grown in such a short amount of time and then he told Ethan that he would treat him as if he was fighting for real if Ethan allowed it. Ethan replied and said that Paul Ten was more than welcome to do so. The following day, Lawrence handed Ethan the Baron Lamenton family's plan of attack. After reading the paper, Ethan said that the plan was decent and with that plan even the king wouldn't be able to say anything. Lawrence had already finished the work behind the scenes. All Ethan had to do was go and tell them. However, the Grand Master Knight of the Baron Lamenton's family had recently reached five stars as a knight. Lawrence asked Ethan if they should recruit more men just in case, but Ethan assured Lawrence not to worry and to wait at a safe place. All the knights they were taking with them when they left were Lawrence's escorts. Ethan and his party went to a city called Polaris, and the people who saw them were worried that they would collect taxes again. Ethan went up on the stage and thought to himself that the feudal lord there was definitely sucking the citizens dry of taxes. The state of the townspeople, children, and adults there was a complete mess, their faces were full of hardship and fear. Ethan, with a loud voice, told the citizens of Polaris to listen and said that he was sure they were all already aware of the news regarding Baron Cargas. Under the protection of the king, as the owner of the land, he had come to personally check the reality of the state of the land. If it was revealed that Baron Lomonton had also broken the vassal contract, then he would be punished under the law of the Duke family. He then asked the village chief if the Baron was fulfilling the proper duties of a feudal lord. The village chief was hesitant to tell the truth due to fear. The people of Polaris were murmuring, asking each other if it was possible to punish Baron Lamenton, most of them afraid to step forward to tell the Archduke the truth. However, Lawrence had planted a few people beforehand to pretend and incite the citizens to step forward and tell the truth, 
one of them raised his hand and told the Archduke that he wanted to accuse the Baron, saying that Baron Lamenton was collecting excessive taxes. Another planted person of Lawrence spoke, telling Ethan to punish the Baron. After that, the real citizens of Polaris started to tell Ethan their own complaints one after the other. Ethan said that he had heard the citizens' voices, declaring that he, Ethan Arden, swore on his family name that he would make sure to punish Baron Lamenton. He asked the citizens of Polaris to bring all of the evidence of evil acts related to Lomonton. After his declaration, Ethan and Lawrence were about to depart and Ethan asked him if it was the intelligence organization Lawrence had set up last time. Lawrence responded, saying yes, and that they were pretty useful. Lawrence told Ethan that, if he went around two or three more towns, he would have more than enough evidence. Ethan then decided to go to another town. At Count Fern's mansion, Count Ferns asked Hans if the information was true. Hans replied, saying yes. He said that it was recent information that he had just received from the spy, the Archduke had advanced to Baron Lomonton's land today and Count Lugan did not know about it at all. Count Ferns praised Hans, saying that he had done good. He ordered Hans to send more people immediately to make sure that Count Lugan didn't find out. Count Ferns was thinking that he wanted to see if Count Lugan could keep being cocky when his servant's neck was cut off by the Archduke's own hands. He planned that. Even if the Archduke lost, he would drag Count Lugan down using the Senate. At Lomonton headquarters, Minor City Ultron, Lawrence and the rest of his knights were outside, while Ethan was inside. Ethan was holding a book containing a list of evidence of evil acts of Baron Lamenton. The Baron asked Ethan what had brought him there implying that Ethan should have contacted them first. Ethan told him to stop with the nonsense, then threw the book, inquiring if the Baron was aware of the contents of the book. Baron Lamenton said that he knew it while stomping on it. Baron Lamenton stated that Ethan had brought the book from the town he had visited prior to his arrival. He went on to mention that he would have to go back to the town every once in a while after taking care of his matters there. Baron Lamenton then summoned his Grandmaster Knight, Murren, who was uncertain if Ethan was brave or just naive for showing up alone. Grandmaster Murren asked if Ethan thought they would be nervous in the face of power. Ethan smiled and replied that they were more of a show than Cargus had been. He then took out his greatsword and said that if that was all they had to say. Grandmaster Murren then confronted Ethan, remarking that Ethan had a lot of confidence. He mentioned that he understood that Ethan had a great deal of pride in his family. Grandmaster Murren unleashed his mana and asked Ethan if he could keep acting so boldly after seeing his skills. He then proceeded to attack Ethan with his fighting spirit alone, inquiring if Ethan liked his greeting. He asked Ethan if he had ever seen such a strong fighting spirit. Ethan thought that Murren was quite a cocky individual with no qualms about displaying his thirst for blood. Suddenly, Baron Lamenton stepped in and apologized to Ethan for being so rude. He explained that he thought Ethan wouldn't listen to his story if he didn't do that. He assumed that Ethan had noticed the difference in strength between them now. Baron Lamenton then proposed an offer to Ethan, asking him if he would like to hear it. He assured Ethan that his thoughts would change once he heard what he had to say. Baron Lamenton stated that there was no need for them to fight and that Ethan seemed to be misunderstanding something. He told Ethan that his true enemy was Count Ferns, who had exiled him to the outskirts while he was in a coma. Baron Lamenton then mentioned that he was part of Count Lugan's faction and that they had a shared enemy. This was why he had come up with an offer that would open Ethan's eyes. Ethan thought it was quite absurd that they were making an offer after having pointed a blade at him. Nevertheless, Ethan asked Baron Lamenton what the offer was. Baron Lamenton then told him to entrust his body to their Lugan faction, claiming that if Ethan joined them, no one would be able to stand in their way. Count Ferns, who had caused trouble for the Archduke, would be destroyed. Baron Lamenton also promised to guarantee Ethan's position as Archduke. Ethan then started laughing at them. Baron Lamenton asked him what was so funny. Ethan replied that they were saying such shameless things so well that they ought to be embarrassed. He then asked if it was a trade among them. Ethan thrust his great sword into the ground, releasing his mana, and called out Zipron Lamenton. He said that a person like Baron Lamenton had the audacity to guarantee his position and it seemed like the Baron was acting on his own without even knowing that he was just a vassal. Ethan then declared that he was not interested in their disgusting faction fights at all. He proclaimed that everyone who had betrayed their lord, neglected their duty, and any member of the Senate were his enemies. Furthermore, Ethan declared that all of them would receive the judgment of Arden. 
Baron Lamentin was taken aback by Ethan's response and was about to say something when Grandmaster Murren suddenly rushed forward, declaring that there was nothing more to be seen. Ethan blocked Murren's attack and as they fought, Murren revealed the secret of how Ethan had captured Cargas. He mentioned that Ethan had bribed Menharton to betray Helmut. Murren was certain that Ethan was not there with the same plan. He mentioned that after Ethan had woken up from his coma, he still thought that the Duke family laws would work on everyone. Baron Lamentin thought that Baron Cargas must have been punished for failing to properly manage his own servants due to his age. Baron Lamentin grinned, thinking that he was different since his knight order was very loyal to him and would never break. As Ethan blocked Murren's attack, he thought about how Lawrence had done an excellent job with manipulating the information. Ethan thought that if they could manipulate information to that extent in the territory beside them, then the other places must have been the same. Murren then got behind Ethan, saying that Ethan could afford to relax since he had been playing with him for a bit. Murren felt annoyed knowing that Ethan was laughing. He attacked Ethan and said that he would stop messing around. At Port City, the Grand Duchess, Priest Yen and Paul Ten were in the living drinking tea, while they relaxed. The Grand Duchess said that she was not sure if she could just be drinking tea like that when Ethan could be in danger. Priest Yen laughed and told her not to worry, reminding her that the Archduke had also captured Cargas alone and adding that, although people said Baron Lomonton was stronger, Ethan had probably taken the knights with him this time. The Grand Duchess sighed, saying Ethan wasn't the type of person to rely on his servants. Upon hearing this, Priest Yen thought Ethan might end up fighting all alone. Paul Ten laughed a bit, assuring them that the Archduke probably wouldn't get injured at all. He further added that the Archduke was already not somebody one Baron family could handle, and Paul Ten said he would guarantee that on the honor of a knight, as someone who had sparred against the Archduke. Murren found himself sitting on the ground and his back against the wall, not knowing what had happened. He was sure he had grabbed the Archduke from behind, and he wondered if he had been hit coincidentally by the blade Ethan had swung. Ethan was looking down on Murren, and Baron Lamentin was shocked to see Murren lost. Murren thought it was a disgrace to be humiliated in front of his servants. Baron Lamentin immediately ordered the other knights to help Murren, but Murren yelled telling them to back away and that he was completely fine. Out of anger, he said that he would have to excuse himself in advance, saying that he may end up killing the Archduke for not being able to control his strength. Baron Lamentin laughed awkwardly, saying that it would be a bit troublesome. Murren unleashed his secret technique and rushed forward, attacking Ethan relentlessly. Baron Lamentin thought the fight favored them and said that Murren had got a bit too excited, noting that the garden repair fee would cost a bit. He wondered if he would have to collect more taxes. Murren thought he didn't feel anything and that Ethan had dodged his attacks, wondering where he could be hiding. He then felt an ominous feeling staring from his back and, when he turned around, he was kicked by Ethan. Murren fell to the ground and Ethan stepped on him. Murren was thinking what had just happened, he couldn't move his body and was in awe of Ethan's great strength. Ethan, with a menacing look, raised his great sword and asked Murren what he thought had happened to the ones who had raised their blade at Ethan with murderous intent at Cargas. Murren, with a terrified look, screamed. Baron Lamentin said he heard a lot of sound and, due to the dust that had scattered around, he and the knights beside him couldn't see what was happening. Baron Lamentin asked Murren to answer him, and inquired if he had taken care of the Archduke. Ethan then threw Murren's burned body, saying that he did not think Murren was in a state where he could answer. Baron Lamentin trembled in fear upon seeing the dead body of Murren, claiming that there was no way. He asked the vice commander how this had happened, and told her to hurry up and go do something to stop the Archduke immediately. The vice commander released her mana, telling the other knights not to lose their cool, and Ethan was surrounded by knights when the vice commander commanded them to prepare to attack. She told them to open the combined attack formation which they had perfected with their blood and sweat. Ethan was smiling even though he was surrounded, thinking that their levels were tragic to look at and he wouldn't even need to use solar prominence. At the signal of the vice commander, every knight jumped forward to attack Ethan. He prepared his counterattack and thought that, at the level of the knights, he would have to significantly control his strength. Ethan released a wide-range technique that looked like a tornado made of fire, and the regular knights were defeated in one hit. Ethan thought that there should be no need to punish all of the regular knights, as none of them had attacked him with murderous intent. The only one who had attacked him with murderous intent was the vice commander. Ethan approached them, the vice commander was on guard but Ethan walked past her and headed straight to Baron Lamentin, saying that, 
on top of collecting excessive taxes, the sin of pointing a blade at him who came to ask about it would not be taken lightly. Therefore, according to the Duke family's law, from that moment onwards, all of Baron Lamenton's titles and wealth would be confiscated. The Baron trembled in fear when he heard what Ethan had said. The Baron called out to his soldiers, asking them why they were not attacking and ordering them to attack Ethan. Baron Lamenton declared that he was their master and not the Arden. The soldiers dropped their weapons, saying that they could not follow that order and they would never raise a blade towards the hero of salvation, the Arden family. The soldiers further added that everything they ate and wore had been unfairly collected from the taxes of their families. Baron Lamenton thought that Ethan was talking nonsense to him, but it turns out that everything Ethan had set up until then had been for those soldiers to hear. He concluded that Ethan was a scary one. Baron Lamenton wondered why he did not know a single thing about Ethan. The authority of the Duke family, force and power, as well as his speech and handling skills to control a mass. Ethan told Lomonton that it was the end for him, then attacked Baron Lomonton, who fell unconscious. He told the soldiers to listen up, thanking them for putting their swords down for him and his family. He said that, before he had come there, he had visited many towns and promised to end the Baron's tyranny. Therefore, from that moment onwards, he, Ethan Arden, would confiscate all of the Baron's authority. Ethan declared that the Baron's land was now the Duke family's territory and proclaimed the land to be liberated. After Ethan's speech, the soldiers knelt and said that they would follow Ethan's orders. The next day, Ethan returned to Port City, having obtained the second eight ring. He asked Lawrence if the Baron had given up information easily, to which Lawrence replied yes, telling him that, with the seal of his majesty the king and the precedent of helmet, it wasn't hard. Lawrence added that Baron Lomonton had asked for mercy in exchange for answering all the questions. Ethan said that he would show him mercy based on how Lomonton responded to the book. Lawrence was curious what book Ethan was talking about. Ethan said that he had discovered it in Lomonton's office, it was called the Book of the Dragon Race. Ethan ordered Lawrence to interrogate the Baron again, thinking that Lomonton must know how he had gotten a hold of the book. The Book of the Dragon Race praises the Dragon Lord, the Merciful Lord gives power to its worshippers. Memorize the nine passages to no end, then, one will receive the protection of the Dragon Lord. Just as he thought, it was a skill book for a mana breathing technique. He remembered the Dark Mage he had met at the mine, the contents of the book had lower quality than his skills, but they were definitely the same type of breathing technique. However, that method had too many side effects. Mixing the wyvern breathing technique to gather mana in the heart instead of mana holes, one could probably climb to around 4 stars quickly, but the price of that would soon cause one's heart to rupture and kill them. Lawrence then came in, and Ethan asked him if he had obtained anything. Lawrence replied that he had gotten information not just from the Baron, but from the people as well. Lawrence said that it seemed to be connected to the religious order that Ethan had mentioned last time. He further added that it appeared they were winning people over by using the book as bait, and those crazy for power would definitely fall for it without knowing the side effects. Assuming they had no disgust for the wyvern race. Ethan asked Lawrence what the common people thought about the wyverns, and if it was easy to win people over with only bait like that. Lawrence replied that the damage of war had a much bigger impact on the commoners, even with a non-aggression pact, so it was normal for the wyvern race to be targets of disgust. So when the book was first found, a lot of appeals were brought up by the residents, asking to subjugate the cult. But the nobles ignored those appeals, and instead, reporters often went missing. That's why, with the implicit permission of the nobles, the residents seemed to be quiet regarding that topic, too. Ethan thought that fear and interest would be tangled up with each other. Looking at the case of Helmet, it would mean that Zipron probably hadn't moved alone either. Lawrence said that when he had tortured Lomonton, he had actually seemed hostile to them, and Lomonton had mentioned the name, Naraxis. Lawrence noticed Ethan's reaction and thought that he knew something about them. Ethan didn't tell Lawrence the truth, pretending that he didn't know. Shapeshifter. The brave general of deception, Naraxis. Even if they're wyverns, they don't all have the same types of power. Those bastards made humans suffer with six types of unique powers. And among them, the type called shapeshifters could, of course, turn into humans, but they could also turn into plants and animals to camouflage their appearance. Ethan thought that they were a huge pain in the ass. High-level shapeshifters couldn't be detected unless one was at least a seven-star knight. Even Ethan, to take down their leader, Naraxis, had to play hide-and-seek for an entire year. Now, after the non-aggression pact, 
It was a situation where he didn't know how many of them had hidden in the dukedom or if they had happened to transform into high-ranking nobles. Ethan thought that it might be a more dangerous situation than his past life. He called Lawrence and said that it seemed to be a more urgent issue than he thought. The book hadn't spread on its own and that there had to be more bastards circulating it, so he would have to personally look into the distribution network. At nighttime, Ethan went outside to check the building where the Book of the Dragon Race was said to be the place of distribution. Ethan knocked on the door, but the shopkeeper said they were closed and to come back next time. He knocked again, but when the shopkeeper didn't open the door, Ethan destroyed it, saying that they were now open. The shopkeeper didn't recognize Ethan. Ethan opened the door of the secret room, witnessing four people doing some kind of transaction. The man holding the book asked Ethan who he was and said that all the sales were finished. Ethan entered the room and said that the bastards who had forgotten the past and were selling the power of dragon heads in a servile manner. And the fools who were buying it, thinking it was good. One of the people asked Ethan what he was talking about, informing him that he had just bothered them during an important moment. The three guys threatened him that they would kill him, and they had surrounded him. Ethan told them to move because he had no business with them. One man was so full of himself that he rushed forward to attack Ethan. Ethan, with an angry face, punched the man and threatened them, saying that he wouldn't say it twice. The three guys ran off after hearing it. Ethan approached the man who was selling the book, and the man asked Ethan who he was and why he was interfering with someone else's business. The man threatened Ethan, saying that if he didn't leave immediately, he would call the police. He asked Ethan if he was aware that what he was doing was a clear crime. Ethan grinned and said that the man was funny to be talking so shamelessly, then pointed his blade at him and said that the sin of selling books that praised the wyverns on the land of the Arden family was a rightful grounds for execution. The man trembled in fear when he realized that the man in front of him was Ethan. Ethan told him that if he wanted to live, he should talk. Ethan then asked the man where the books were being made. The man was on his knees as he told Ethan that all he had done was sell the books the order provided him with and he said that he really didn't know anything other than that. Ethan said that there were probably a lot of other organizations that distributed the books and he asked the man if he had heard of any other organizations. The man said that the order was pretty thorough with that kind of stuff, so he wasn't sure if it was accurate information, but he had heard there was one in Viscount de Kun's land. Ethan immediately set out to Viscount de Kun's land, thinking that it was definitely right next to Baron Karga's land. Ethan noticed a cave and thought that it could be the place the seller was talking about. He entered the cave and noticed that there were neither the common magic alarm circles nor security guards at all. Ethan concluded that this meant they had done their activities for a significant amount of time in a very safe place. He thought that it was getting ridiculous. After walking for a while, he encountered two people talking about something. Ethan told them to shut up, saying that it was so disgusting that he couldn't listen to it anymore. The two got agitated and asked Ethan who he was. Ethan said that he didn't think people who were going to die soon needed to know that. Ethan couldn't believe that those kinds of words had come out of another human's mouth. He asked them if they had an ounce of guilt. The gray-haired man said that there were no visitors planned on the schedule, while the man with the violet hair thought that Ethan was a mercenary who had probably gotten leaked info from somewhere and had come. One of them said that he was bored, so they thought that it was good. The man released his dark mana and said that Ethan looked like a knight, adding that he was just hastening his death for not knowing his place. Ethan was mad when he saw the man's mixed breathing technique and asked them if they had already forgotten about the Wyverian War. Ethan said that, on top of learning the skills of the wyvern race that had killed countless humans, to exploit and kill innocent people with those skills again he wonders if they really human. Ethan leapt forward to attack the man, who thought that Ethan was fast but concluded that Ethan's attacks were dull. He thought that it should be more than enough, but Ethan slashed him and the man could do nothing. The remaining enemy made a surprise attack, but Ethan dodged it easily. Ethan counterattacked and grabbed the man's neck, so enraged that he couldn't describe the feeling in words. Ethan resented the fact that his father and his family had risked their lives to fight for the lives of bastards and declared that they would have to pay the price of betraying their own kind and touching his people properly. Every single one of them. Ethan had breached the second zone of the cave and was outnumbered. They threatened that they would shoot Ethan if he made a single move. The high priest warned Ethan that if he did not want to die painfully, he should answer all of his questions obediently and he would show him mercy. Ethan asked if he was the high priest in charge of supplying the wyvern books. The high priest asked Ethan if he had come there knowing that it was their territory, to which Ethan became infuriated, 
saying that the people who worshipped the wyverns had no right to say such a thing in Arden's land. He declared that he would destroy them up until the very last man, the high priest ordered his men to fire, telling them to leave him alive so they could find out who he was. Multiple arrows came straight at him, but Ethan rushed forward unfazed. Ethan activated the solar prominence and unleashed a skill called Mana Shrapnel. The high priest noticed the fire mana embedded in Ethan's sword and concluded that he was not just any knight. The high priest thought that, if he was using fire mana, then he was probably the Archduke Arden. He further added that, if it was the Arden family who still held strong hatred for wyverns, then it all made sense. The high priest wondered where the information about them had leaked from and thought that it was a great opportunity, as Ethan had not been long awoken. He thought that, if he could defeat the Archduke, who would become an obstacle to them in the future, he may get rewarded and receive high-ranking wyvern books. The high priest, with a grin on his face, thought about how much more power he would be able to grasp. He released a fire whip made of dark mana and used it to attack Ethan, but Ethan dodged it with ease. Ethan thought that, if the high priest could use magic with such a short incantation, could he use magic in wyvern's tongue too? Wyvern's tongue magic. The magic of the wyverns, who are also known as worshippers of language, are unique. Their most special feature is that they can perform magic without any incantations. What makes that possible is a second mana hole they have planted in their heads, language circulation. Ethan continued to dodge the high priest's attack, thinking that, if the high priest had the language circulation of the language worshippers, it meant he didn't just have a relation to Naraxis, the shapeshifter of the Naraxis order, but also the other wyverns too. Ethan ended up being cornered and the high priest realized this, ordering his men to attack him. Ethan thought that, unlike last time with that dark magician, this guy was quite strong and he had to take care of him in one fell swoop. The high priest said that he would not let Ethan do his combination attack and used fire shackles to restrict Ethan's movements. He thought he had caught Ethan, telling him not to move or else he would have his limbs cut off. He yelled that it was over. Ethan called the high priest a fool and then broke free from the fire shackles. The high priest was surprised to see Ethan break free so easily, to which Ethan replied that it wasn't a good match, as the Arden family were masters of fire mana. He further added that fire from people like the high priest would not be enough to stand against him. The high priest, feeling insulted by Ethan's arrogance, thought he knew it wouldn't be easy, but he hadn't expected it to be like that. The high priest was preparing for his next incantation when he warned Ethan to throw away any hopes that he would die peacefully, as he was about to show him hell. Ethan was alerted to the high priest's overflowing mana, thinking that the high priest's power was intense and that if he let him gather his strength, Ethan could be in trouble. Three people rushed at him to prevent Ethan from interfering with the high priest, but Ethan blocked the three of them. Ethan had been distracted earlier, so he hadn't realized that there were still a lot of soldiers remaining. The high priest, having gained a tremendous amount of mana, dared Ethan to try blocking his attack. Ethan thought he was too late and didn't want to use his powerful skill if possible, but his situation was dire and he had no choice but to use it. Ethan opened the second circulation and unleashed a new power never seen before. The high priest couldn't believe what he saw, wondering how Ethan could perform such magic with pure power. The cave shook because of Ethan's new skill, and his enemies were burnt to crisp. Ethan said that he had something to ask of the high priest who had barely survived. Ethan asked the high priest if he knew about the mage organization within the order, but the high priest only laughed and coughed in response. The high priest thought that Ethan was truly an Arden for showing such calmness. Ethan demanded an answer, as he had no intention of engaging in small talk with the high priest. The defeated priest then revealed that there was indeed such an organization, but that Ethan would never be able to learn about it. Just like the mage he had fought at the mine, the defeated priest had planned to use the blood magic to detonate himself together with Ethan. However, Ethan had prevented this by using his own mana to extract the blood magic and destroy it. The defeated priest was still smiling, even after what Ethan had done. The priest said that Ethan would not be able to hear the answer to his question from anyone in the organization, as they had all made a promise to the great spiritual leader. A huge amount of dark mana was coming out of the defeated priest as he used a taboo spell that incinerates a person when a particular piece of information is thought of. It was a very high level spell, too high for him to release with his current abilities. The great spiritual leader that the priest had mentioned was certainly a high level mage, and Ethan thought that he would need to look more into that person. At the same time, at Count Fern's mansion, 
The Count was celebrating due to Count Lugan having been made an absolute fool of. Count Ferns praised Hans for doing a very good job. Hans replied, saying that the Count's praise was too much. The Count thanked Hans for the information he had provided, as they were able to prevent Lugan from sending reinforcements. He added that Count Lugan would find that out for himself tomorrow. Hans told Count Ferns that it was an honor to be able to assist him. Hans wondered how Count Ferns could be so wrong about things and be completely toyed with. He made Lawrence's schemes look like a magician's. He told Hans that he had done a great job, so he'd better give him a title fitting of that. Thus, he appointed Hans as the chief of intelligence. Hans was shocked at what he heard and told Count Ferns that it was too much of a responsibility for him, but Count Ferns insisted and said that what Hans had accomplished was deserving of it. He added that he would appoint a knight under Hans, and asked Hans to look into what the Archduke was aiming for once again. Hans accepted the offer, saying that he would do his best. Count Ferns was laughing, thinking that Count Lugan now wouldn't have a choice but to fight the Archduke and, if they kept pushing as planned, all his allies would come to him. Count Ferns was looking forward to seeing what Count Lugan had to say at the next Senate meeting. At port, in Ethan's mansion, Ethan returned and was asked by Lawrence if his business had gone well. Ethan replied and said that there had been some small but definite results. He then asked Lawrence if he had found any information about the Naraxis order. Lawrence replied that he had found out a bit of official information regarding the Naraxis order, namely that it was based in the Genin Empire and was active as an official organization. Ethan was shocked to hear it and asked Lawrence if he was certain about the information. Lawrence replied that yes, he had a report that had been released officially. Lawrence also found out about the situation abroad through the report. Ethan wondered what was going on, thinking that Jenin was a country that had been attacked by the Wyverns. He pondered why, aside from accepting the peace treaty, they had even accepted the Naraxis order as an official organization. Ethan was angered, suspecting that the Wyverians' influence extended past the Duke's jurisdiction and reached even the entire continent. He ordered Lawrence to call Priestian immediately, as he knew more about it than they did. Priestian stated that with the Holy Church in Genin Empire at its center, the Naraxis Order is currently holding a footing in the central regions of all of the kingdoms of the continent besides the Hydran Empire. The head of the order is known as the Holy Spiritual Leader, and each region is led by a great spiritual leader. Ethan said that, if what Priestian said was true, then the Naraxis Order held one of the strongest positions in the Western continent and in the Hydran Empire too. He added that, although it may not show itself on the surface, the order must have branches there too, and this was confirmed by the great priest that he had defeated. Ethan decided to add one more goal to their objectives, along with their family's recovery, they would also seek out the wyvern cult that was spreading like cancer throughout their kingdom. Priest Yen said that it was a relief, and that it was thanks to the king blocking them that there wouldn't be many members of the order in the Hydran Empire. Ethan couldn't believe that the useless king would do that, but Priest Yen said that it must be difficult to believe, but it was a fact. He added that it was thanks to His Majesty's aggressive policies against the Order that Hydern was the only place where there was no branch of the Order. Ethan found it unexpected that the King was blocking the entrance of the Wyvern worshippers so well. He had thought that the King was just a useless fool who always took his family's side and was scared of the Seven Kingdoms, when in reality, the King was implementing a policy to protect the citizens. Ethan was wondering if, in the case of the Arden family, it was just because it couldn't be helped due to the circumstances. He ordered Priest Yen to give him reports on the king's policies from now on, as there might just be something that could be of use to them. Priest Yen replied that he understood. Ethan handed over the insignia to Priest Yen and told him to look for any information related to it, suggesting that it seemed related to the mage organization or Naraxis order. He also ordered Lawrence to send a letter to Poplins as soon as the day broke. Lawrence said that if what Ethan meant was the blacksmith, and asked him if he needed weapons or equipment urgently. Ethan replied, saying it was more important than that. He said that it was just a conjecture, but he thought the order wasn't just composed of humans, it may also have something to do with dwarves. Popolins read the letter that Ethan sent and was shocked to see the contents of it. One of the dwarf blacksmiths asked him what was wrong, to which Popolins replied that he would leave the smithy in Muster's hand because he needed to go see the Archduke. The dwarf blacksmith wondered what was going on and Poplin said that they might have a chance to get revenge sooner than expected. At Count Fern's mansion, the 33rd Senate meeting was being held virtually. The first topic of discussion was the issue of the Archduke occupying Count Lomonton's territory. Count Ferns wanted to criticize the leader of the faction, Lugan, 
for learning about the incident one whole day late. Count Fern stated that the useless leader was the reason the Archduke saw them as weak and attacked them. Count Ferns then asked Count Lugan if he would just watch idly until all his subordinates died. Count Lugan was so enraged that he thought Ethan had a grudge against Chimon Ferns because he had attacked Cargas. He wondered if Ethan was just starting by attacking the closest and easiest targets. Count Lugan was doubtful that he was the only one who had learned about the situation late and was certain that someone was helping Chimon Ferns. He wondered if Ferns and Ethan had become allies. He responded to Count Ferns and said that he would send a warning, stating that, as long as the vassal contract existed, they couldn't just attack the Archduke at will, but that they could use their vassal power to stop Ethan's attacks and send out a warning. Count Lugan said he would even inform the king and have him arbitrate the current situation. Count Ferns grinned, thinking that Count Lugan was a fool, and thought that he still didn't understand the current situation. Count Ferns had a devious look, thinking he would not stop just because of an angry Archduke, and added that leaving the two of them to fight between themselves didn't sound like a bad idea. He would wait for the opportunity to strike them all down with his elite knights. In the afternoon, Hans came to Count Ferns's office and asked the Count if the meeting had gone well, to which the Count replied in the affirmative. The Count said that he had shoved Count Lugan into quite a predicament and now all they had to do was wait for the Archduke to attack the Eaton territory, as it would be the perfect scenario. Count Ferns then asked Hans if he had figured out what the Archduke's next objective was. Hans replied that he had not yet, but according to his investigations, the Archduke was attacking his indirect family on the pretext of their high tax rates. So, in order to prevent drawing the Archduke's attention, Hans suggested lowering the taxes. The atmosphere suddenly changed and the Count, with a serious tone, said that Hans was speaking out of his place. Hans felt that something had changed. Count Ferns, with a menacing look, reminded Hans that his duty was to spy on the Archduke, not suggest paying attention to how the Archduke felt. Hans bowed out of fear, saying he had misspoken. The Count told Hans not to forget his place and warned him that, if he didn't do a good enough job, something would happen to him. He ordered Hans to leave if he understood what the Count was saying, and Hans immediately left. Count Ferns was thinking that nothing was easy and Lugan would also have figured out that he was getting help from someone. He thought that the best way to take care of the Archduke and Lugan at the same time was by inviting the third prince to the house. A few days later, at the Lomonton Castle practice field, Lawrence handed Ethan a letter containing a warning from Count Lugan. After reading the letter, Ethan said that their harassment tactics had been successful and both factions thought he would attack the south side. Lawrence said that, in that case, Count Ferns's faction would march forward. Ethan said that Count Lugan was using the king as a shield, and suggested that they make use of the king as well. Lawrence agreed that it was not a bad idea. Ethan then asked if Lawrence had finished investigating the new wyvern books written by Deacon that they had heard about, to which Lawrence replied in the affirmative, saying he had found all the routes of circulation. Ethan said this was good, adding that they would use the king's policies as their reason for punishing the senate, where the wyvern worshippers were residing. He then asked about Hans, to which Lawrence replied that, as expected, Hans had suggested lowering the taxes to Count Ferns but had been ignored. Ethan said that they knew what his pretext was for punishing the Senate, but they still wouldn't change their ways. Suddenly, an intruder appeared, accusing Ethan of stealing what was his. The intruder attacked Ethan, but he managed to block the blow. He used his fire mana that spread widely. Lawrence was wondering how the intruder had managed to get in, as there were three sentries guarding the place. The intruder was standing there comfortably, commenting that Ethan's fire mana was quite hot. Lawrence was in awe upon seeing the intruder brush off the Archduke's attack like it was nothing. Ethan asked who the intruder was, to which the intruder replied that Ethan's way of asking questions was very arrogant for a thief. Ethan pointed his greatsword at the intruder and said that it was a rude thing to say for someone who was trespassing in his castle. The intruder called Ethan a thief and said that Ethan should not be calling him rude, then used some kind of magic spell. Ethan was surprised to see what the intruder did, as a vial with potion in it had come out of his hand. The intruder asked Ethan if he was still going to make excuses after seeing the potion. Ethan thought that it was the special potion that Jerome had told him about. Ethan was thinking that the special potion, Resin of Vitality, Lightning Stone, and Rapid Mana Charger, were the four objects that had enabled humans to fight against the wyverns until the end of the war. The man who had created the recipe for these potions was the creation sorcerer Ilya Peacecraft. 
The intruder broke the vial and said that the recipe for the potion was the result of five years of research and she had not gone outside for ten years, yet Ethan had been able to create it without a single mistake, down to the last gram. The intruder asked Ethan how he had stolen her recipe and said that, if Ethan was honest, she would just discipline him. Ethan wondered why the creation sorcerer had suddenly appeared, glancing at Lawrence and thinking that, like in Lawrence's case, history could have changed again. Ethan thought that he needed to further look into it, so he said that it was a ridiculous slander and told the intruder that, if he was going to insult them, they should at least show their true form. The intruder was surprised to hear it from Ethan, he told the intruder not to underestimate the Ardens, saying he could see through the intruder's pathetic tricks in a single look. The intruder was surrounded by bright lights coming from the magic circle under her, acknowledging that Ethan was not just any ordinary person. The intruder said that it had been a long time since she had shown her true form. Ethan and Lawrence were in awe while looking at the real appearance of the intruder, with Lawrence asking Ethan if it was the true form of the intruder. Ethan replied, saying it seemed like it. The intruder called Ethan a child and said it should be considered an honor to see her true form. She told Ethan that it would be best for him to answer her questions because she would not hold back any longer. Ethan smiled, thinking that it really did seem like Ilya. Furthermore, he was seeing her true form, which he had not seen in his past life. He thought to himself that a recluse sorcerer who would usually never show her true form was in front of him. So he had to take the opportunity. The intruder was angry that Ethan was stalling, about to say something when Ethan listed a potion that let one use the abilities of a monster temporarily, a changing stone that granted magical abilities, a lightweight bead that lowered the user's weight, an invisibility cloak that even hid noise, a crystal ball that could show places miles and miles away, a water bottle that filled itself. The intruder told Ethan to stop, wondering how he had managed to steal her research. She thought to herself that they were all things that she was researching, even things that she was currently brainstorming. She asked Ethan how he knew those things, to which Ethan replied that it was nothing much. Saying that it was the vision of the Arden family, he further added that there were more things than this, but he could not say the specifics to an outsider. The intruder was losing her patience, saying that it did not make sense. She further added that it was ridiculous to suggest that the vision was not of a sorcerer or an alchemist, but of a swordsman. Ethan told her that she did not need to believe it, to which the intruder was annoyed. Instead of punishing her for breaking into Ethan's castle and calling him a thief, he was answering her honestly. Suddenly, a few knights came to check what was happening and wondered if there was an intruder. Ethan told her that she should be thankful to him, asking the intruder if he needed to worry whether she believed him or not. The intruder could not say anything at this point, thinking that Ethan was a bastard and what he was saying was probably a lie. He told her to leave if she had heard Ethan's answer. Ethan admitted that he was the one who had messed up the practice field, so he wouldn't make the intruder pay for it. When Ethan was about to leave, the intruder released a tremendous amount of yellow-colored mana, which Ethan felt. The intruder was so angry that he called Ethan a stupid child and threatened him that it wouldn't end with just being disciplined. Lawrence and the regular knights were having a hard time withstanding the pressure. Ethan felt the pressure and thought that the skill the intruder had used was, coverage region, a skill someone who had mastered their control of magic could use to completely change the characteristics of the surrounding area. It was known as a caster's coverage region, Ethan was angry that he had forgotten about it. He thought that, in his past life, Ilya had been an 8th rank sorcerer and was coming out stronger than expected. He had thought that Ethan couldn't move as he wished. But Ethan decided to go all out and unleashed his skill, causing his mana to overflow and destroy the coverage region of the intruder. She was shocked to see what Ethan had done and jumped forward to attack the intruder. She was alerted, thinking that Ethan was fast, and the intruder cast a defensive spell. However, Ethan's firepower was much stronger and she thought the barrier could break any moment. She used another magic spell to amplify her shield. The intruder attacked Ethan using her multiple shields, pushing him back. Ethan thought that he had taken significant damage and that his power was not enough. He had a second thought about using an unfinished skill, but his situation was not in his favor so he didn't have much of a choice but to use it. A bright red light was emanating from Ethan's chest, causing his mana to be amplified. The intruder noticed it and thought that there was no way. Ethan unleashed a skill called Solar Prominence and a lance-like form of flame was created, which he used to attack the intruder causing the intruder's defensive barrier to break apart. Menharton and the other knights were careful not to be blown away by the explosion. Ethan called her a doppelganger while pointing his greatsword at her, 
threatening her not to move or else he would have to slice her. The intruder was in awe, wondering how it had happened. She thought that Ethan must have used a wyvern breathing technique and wondered if Ethan had joined forces with the wyverns. However, she thought to herself that, even if Ethan had stolen the wyvern's breathing techniques, there was no way an Arden would work with the wyverns. The intruder, with an annoyed look, asked Ethan how he knew she was a doppelganger. Ethan was thinking that the intruder no longer had any thoughts of fighting. He explained to her that, just because they were a family of swordsmen, they did not only have sword techniques among their secret techniques, they also had a full range of potion recipes and other techniques useful for combat. He further added that a method to discover the intruder's identity was also one of their secret techniques. He told her to stop running around and damaging his property, in the hopes that it would solve all their misunderstandings. Even after Ethan's explanation, the intruder remained suspicious. Lawrence asked Ethan how they should deal with the intruder's crime of attacking the Archduke, to which Ethan replied that they had simply had a misunderstanding, so he told him to let it go. Ethan was about to leave when he felt a pain in his chest. He thought that it could have been dangerous for him to use the mixed breathing pattern with the wyvern's breathing. He thought that, if it weren't for that technique, he wouldn't have stood a chance against the intruder fortunately, it seemed like he was able to complete it without any side effects. Suddenly, the intruder yelled, wait. She offered to assist Ethan, as she knew he was currently in a family war. She hadn't even finished her words when Ethan immediately declined her offer, saying he didn't need her. The girl was surprised by what Ethan had just said. Ethan said that he already had enough strength to defeat his relatives. The girl was still trying to convince Ethan, citing her status as an 8th rank sorcerer and mentioning that Ethan was only a 4 star knight. Ethan, with a confident look, replied to her saying he had just beaten her a minute ago. She still hadn't given up, claiming that she could make Ethan many things besides those secret techniques and items he had just mentioned. The girl grinned, thinking that Ethan could not help but consider it, as there was no inventor better than her in the world. She would pretend to help Ethan and then find out all of the Arden family's secret techniques. Ethan replied and said that that sounded good, informing her that if she really wanted to, they would have to test whether her abilities could be of use to him. He then ordered Lawrence to prepare a room, to which Lawrence agreed. Ethan and Ilya both thought that things were going as planned. Lawrence escorted the intruder, Ilya, to the room Ethan had instructed him to prepare. Ilya commented that it was not to her taste, but it seemed like she would be able to make use of the room. Lawrence was about to say something when Ilya opened a subspace pouch and dozens of vials containing different types of potions were revealed. Lawrence thought to himself that the Archduke had taken care of her easily, so he had forgotten that she was truly a grand sorcerer. Ilya finished her preparations, saying that the room had become decent enough for her to use. While Lawrence was in awe, thinking where all of those things had come from, Ilya stated that Lawrence knew a lot about the Archduke. She told him that she had something to ask him about the Archduke. Lawrence replied, saying that he had not been serving the Archduke for very long. He suggested that if she wanted to know more about the Archduke, then she should meet the Archduchess. Ilya asked Lawrence if what he was referring to was Ethan's older sister, to which Lawrence replied that was correct. Ilya was excited to meet the Grand Duchess, wondering if she should transform into an old woman again. Ilya then told Lawrence to lead her to the Archduchess, but Lawrence stopped her, saying that he had heard that doppelgangers could transform into multiple bodies, he asked Ilya if she usually went around with the body of an old woman, to which Ilya replied that was right. She further added that it was necessary so that people paid her the respect she deserved, despite being of mixed blood. Lawrence told her that they were currently in a family war and, in order to trick the enemies, they were hiding information about them. Lawrence suggested she stay in her current young appearance, as it would not cause any suspicion. Ilya agreed that this was true, and asked Lawrence if it was the same reason that he dressed up as a man. Lawrence replied that it was. Lawrence was wondering how Ilya knew about it. Ilya told Lawrence to lead her to where the Archduchess was and decided to use her younger appearance when meeting the Archduchess. The Grand Duchess warmly greeted Ilya and expressed her fondness for her, saying that she was so young yet had come there on vacation. She then decided that she would take good care of Ilya. Lawrence said that, in that case, the Grand Duchess should take care of their guest. Ilya was so angered by Lawrence's trickery that she called him a bastard and vowed to seek revenge. At the guest room Ethan and Popolance were about to discuss the letter Ethan had sent before. Ethan remarked that Popolance had arrived quicker than expected. Popolance replied that the Archduke had called him, so it was natural that he shouldn't be late. 
Furthermore, after seeing the pattern, Poplins was unable to remain still. He asked Ethan if he could show it to him now, to which Ethan replied that there were some blood stains in it and handed Poplins the weapon, inquiring if he be able to identify it. Poplins examined the weapon intently, noticing a sigil engraved in it, he proclaimed that it was the same pattern as in the other place and, now that Poplins had seen it in person, he was certain that the equipment was made by the royal blacksmith, Williams. Poplins can't believe Williams would join arms with the wyvern saying that it's a serious betrayal, even among the dwarves. He told Ethan that the wyvern war was also lethal to the dwarves. Without a systematic organization, they lived in groups of small villages and were easy targets for wyverns. As the invasion began, the small villages were unable to resist and the dwarves began to fall helplessly. In the end many dwarves died and a lot of villages were destroyed. Poplins pondered that if it weren't for the Ardens All or Nothing squad and the King Muragni, they wouldn't stand a chance. Before Poplins could finish his words, Ethan was surprised to learn that the king was a dwarf called Muragni. Poplins inquired what was wrong. Ethan responded that it was surprising that the dwarves had formed a country, but it was even more surprising to know that the king was Muradni. Currently, Ethan and Poplins find themselves in the guest room. Poplins takes the opportunity to recount past events to Ethan, describing how the elven village had been ravaged and destroyed as a result of the war against the dragons, causing numerous lives to be tragically lost. Muradini, a dwarf, gathered the remaining dwarves and addressed them, urging them to lend their ears. He emphasized that their survival in the face of war was only made possible by the assistance of the Arden family. However, Muradini warned them that there was no guarantee that such peril wouldn't arise again. Therefore, he urged them to confront future challenges collectively, emphasizing the importance of unity and solidarity among them. And thus, it happened that the dwarves forged a kingdom united under a single banner, mirroring the human's accomplishment. Muradini, for his pivotal role in uniting the twelve influential tribes, emerged as the inaugural king of the newfound realm. Ethan couldn't help but wear a smile as he pondered the unexpected ascent of Muradini to the throne. Yet he found solace in knowing that Muradini was flourishing. In conversation with Poplins, it was revealed that the dwarves conducting business in the human world were allocating a portion of their profits towards the construction efforts in the dwarf kingdom. Poplins went on to express that even if others viewed them as diminished craftsmen turned mere merchants or hoarders, they were willing to endure such perceptions if it meant aiding their people. In response, Ethan informed Poplins that the Arden family had also received assistance from Muradini in the past, leading him to declare their commitment to contribute to the reconstruction of the Dwarven Kingdom, although Ethan acknowledged his uncertainty about the extent of their helpfulness. Ethan extended his offer to Poplins, assuring him that if there was ever anything he could do to assist, he should not hesitate to ask. As Poplins wiped away his tears, he expressed deep gratitude to Ethan, acknowledging the immense debt owed to the Arden family. Curious about Ethan's plans regarding Williams, Poplins inquired about how he intended to handle the situation. Ethan responded, stating that Williams was currently involved in criminal activities that posed a threat to both the Dwarf Kingdom and the Hydran Empire. Recognizing that the actions attributed to Williams were beyond the capabilities of a single dwarf, Poplins suspected the presence of a hidden orchestrator behind the scenes. He questioned Ethan, seeking confirmation for his suspicions, and Ethan confirmed that his intuition was correct. Ethan further explained that the task ahead would not be easy, as the orchestrator would need to possess a significant amount of power, even surpassing the influence of the king himself. Ethan cautioned that accusing Williams without a solid plan would only land them in trouble. Poplins, filled with anger, struggled to comprehend how one of their own, Williams, could be working for the enemy while their brethren toiled for the prosperity of the kingdom. Ethan urged Poplins to listen attentively, asking for his thoughts on taking a chance at reaching greater heights, specifically referring to shooting his shot in the big leagues. Confused, Poplins sought clarification, uncertain about what Ethan meant. Ethan then elaborated, explaining that by putting Poplins forward as the royal blacksmith, he could achieve his revenge, regain his lost glory, and demonstrate his unwavering dedication to his kin. The revelation left Poplins in a state of shock, prompting him to question the feasibility of such a plan. Ethan assured him that it was indeed possible and expressed his intention to make it happen, as long as Poplins was willing to embark on that path. Grateful for Ethan's offer, Poplins couldn't comprehend why Ethan had such unwavering faith in him. 
In response, Ethan emphasized that believing in a fellow countryman who shared the same enemy was not an unusual or strange notion, highlighting their common purpose and struggle. Ethan reaffirmed his belief in populace, stating that he considered him one of his own men, and therefore, there was no need for a specific reason to have faith in them. This declaration resonated deeply with populace, rekindling a sense of trust he had long forgotten. Overwhelmed by the surge of emotions, Poplins abruptly rose to his feet, realizing the foolishness of his earlier question. He then humbly knelt before Ethan, pledging his unwavering loyalty and allegiance to Archduke Ethan with the most solemn and revered oath among dwarves, the Pledge of the Hammer. He vowed to dedicate his hammer and his unwavering loyalty to Ethan's cause. Touched by Poplins' pledge, Ethan stood up in response and accepted it with gratitude. With his conversation with Poplins concluded, Ethan swiftly returned to his office. There, he initiated a communication using a crystal ball to speak with Marquis Bloden, while the Marquis's butler patiently waited. Ethan greeted Marquis Bloden formally, and the Marquis reciprocated the greeting, remarking that it was their first time conversing directly in this manner. He invited Ethan to speak with ease and familiarity, encouraging him to refer to him as Marquis Bloden. Ethan understood the request and assured the Marquis that he would address him as such. Ethan expressed his gratitude to Marquis Bloden, acknowledging that he had not properly thanked him for the elixir received previously. He conveyed his sincere appreciation for the additional gift he had received. Marquis Bloden responded with a warm smile, assuring Ethan that there was no need for gratitude. He emphasized that if the gift proved useful to Ethan, then it was a worthwhile gesture on his part. Marquis Bloten encouraged Ethan not to feel burdened by his kindness and wholeheartedly accepted. Observing that Ethan had reached out to him directly, Marquis Bloten deduced that there must be a serious matter to discuss. He inquired if there was an important topic that Ethan wished to address, recognizing that their communication went beyond the exchange of gifts. Ethan affirmed Marquis Bloten's observation, stating that there was indeed a serious matter at hand. He revealed that the royal blacksmith of the Hydran Empire had been discovered to have connections with the Wyverns, indicating a potential allegiance to their cause. Moreover, it was suspected that the blacksmith had a powerful supporter within the royal household, adding to the gravity of the situation. Jaren and Marquis Bloden were taken aback by this revelation, acknowledging the unexpected and significant problem that lay before them. Marquis Bloden inquired about Ethan's plan to address the situation. Ethan proposed a solution, suggesting that they appoint the dwarf he knew as the new royal blacksmith, as this dwarf possessed greater skill than the current one. Ilya and Poplins were summoned by Ethan. Ilya felt a sense of relief and excitement, as her abilities were now being recognized and she saw an opportunity to escape the clutches of the Archduchess. In the past week, Ilya had been harassed by the Archduchess instead of uncovering the Archduke's secret, so the chance to showcase her true worth was something she eagerly anticipated. Once Ilya and Poplins were present, Ethan opened the box and revealed the gift he had received from Marquis Bloden. He explained his desire to transform the three pieces of gear into artifacts, seeking confirmation from Ilya and Poplins if they were capable of accomplishing such a task. Artifact Alchemy, it is such a high-level skill that after carving magic currents into the gear, even a regular knight could perform magic through the magic currents if the user puts mana into them. Poplins carefully examined the gear and recognized that it was made of exceptional quality mithril, indicating the difficulty of working with such precious material. He acknowledged that he could carve the intricate designs into the gear, but he emphasized the need for a skilled sorcerer to assist him in the process. However, upon hearing Poplins' comment, Ilya became infuriated. She confronted him, angrily referring to him as a fat bastard and questioning the impertinent glare he directed at her. Ilya passionately declared herself as the greatest creation sorcerer in the entire land, asserting her superior abilities in the field. Ilya's anger escalated further as she expressed her displeasure at being referred to as an assistant by Poplins. She firmly asserted that it would be him who must follow her orders precisely. Poplins let out a sigh and dismissed Ilya's behavior, labeling her as childish. He then questioned Ethan if it was truly necessary to work with her. This only served to exacerbate Ilya's fury. Ethan stepped in, assuring Poplins that Ilya possessed remarkable skills. He emphasized that despite her outward appearance, she was, in fact, an eighth-rank grand sorcerer. Ethan encouraged Ilya, reminding her that this was her opportunity to demonstrate the talent she had promised him. Ethan stressed the importance of collaboration and emphasized that in order to achieve successful results, 
Poplins and Ilya needed to work together. He expressed his anticipation for the outcome of the gear they would create. Poplins comprehended Ethan's directive and respectfully bowed his head, acknowledging that as his lord's command, he would diligently apply himself to produce the greatest artifact, even if the sorcerer involved was perceived as lacking. Ilya's anger intensified as she pointed her finger at Poplins, vehemently urging Ethan not to listen to anything he was saying. She confidently assured Ethan that she would engrave astonishing and powerful magic onto the gear for him. Ilya's grin widened as she plotted in her mind, eagerly anticipating the moment when Ethan would be captivated by her remarkable skills, envisioning it as the opportune moment to steal all of the Arden family's secrets. At the workshop of Poplins, Poplins is engrossed in carving inscriptions on Ethan's blade, while Ilya patiently waits in the background. Suddenly, Ethan enters and inquires about the progress from Ilya. She invites him in, and Ethan asks her if it's acceptable for her not to personally inspect the work. Ilya reassured Ethan that it's perfectly fine, as Poplins possesses more skill than he appears to have. She elaborated that Poplins carves the most efficient strokes without any superfluous movements, highlighting his remarkable focus. As Poplins completed the inscriptions, he called out to Ilya, informing her that it was now her turn since the wording was finished. Confidently, Ilya told Ethan to prepare himself, as together with Poplins they would create something even more remarkable than he had envisioned. After a few minutes, Ilya completed the process of imbuing mana spells onto the great sword. As Ethan swung the sword, he immediately noticed its lightness. While acknowledging that the sword was already relatively light to begin with, this one felt as light as a feather. Curious, Ilya asked Ethan for his impression. She suggested that he must have sensed the difference as soon as the mana was infused, noting that there were not just one or two inscribed spells. Ilya went on to explain that in addition to the lightweight enchantment, they had also incorporated a sharpness enchantment. Moreover, they included a magical repair function that could restore the sword to its original pristine state. Ethan stared at the gauntlet he had put on, contemplating Ilya's explanation. She mentioned that they had incorporated magic to enhance mana affinity into both the greaves and gauntlets, just like they did for Aphelion. Ethan marveled inwardly, realizing that the additions Ilya mentioned surpassed his expectations. Each individual enhancement she described would already elevate the equipment to the realm of luxury items. He couldn't help but acknowledge that engraving such advanced magic into a single piece of equipment required a high level of magical understanding. However, a thought crossed Ethan's mind. He wondered if allowing Ilya to become too confident in her abilities might make her more challenging to handle. Deciding to feign some disappointment, Ethan questioned if that was all there was, causing Ilya to be taken aback. Sweat trickled down Ilya's forehead as she assured Ethan that the real magic was about to begin. She urged him to channel his mana into all the weapons simultaneously, and Ethan complied. Ilya warned him that utilizing his fire mana ability would exert significant strain on the weapons. She added that it was crucial to test whether the gauntlets and the weapon could handle such power. Ethan, determined to put the weapons to the test, began channeling his fire mana into the various items he possessed. Poplins, observing the scene, was filled with awe, recognizing the incredible progress Ethan had made. He marveled at the fact that it hadn't been long since he crafted the Aphelian sword for Ethan, yet he had already achieved another remarkable level of growth. Despite initially feeling that nothing was happening, Ethan was reminded by Ilya to recall what he had done during their previous battles. She reassured him not to worry about the weapons and to give it his all. Now understanding what he needed to do, Ethan employed the dragon's breath technique, unleashing a powerful surge of force. As Ethan stood still, holding his great sword, he became enveloped in fire mana. The intensity of the power released caused Poplins to shield his eyes from the blinding brightness. Amidst the spectacle, Ethan couldn't help but wonder about the nature of this newfound power. Sensing his curiosity, Ilya explained that it was the thermoregulation spell she had developed. This spell allowed for the even distribution of heat throughout the equipment or its concentration in specific areas. With this enhancement, the equipment could effortlessly handle double the amount of heat without adverse effects. Curious to hear Ethan's thoughts on experiencing her abilities firsthand, Ilya asked him to share his impressions. Meanwhile, Poplins and Ilya engaged in a discussion, their voices overlapping in argument. Amidst their conversation, Ethan silently contemplated the impressive nature of Ilya's work. He hadn't expected her to possess such exceptional skill in engraving magic of this caliber. However, unwilling to relinquish control too easily, 
Ethan chose not to lavish Ilya with excessive praise. Instead, he simply remarked that it was acceptable to some extent, leaving Ilya surprised by his response. Ethan extended his appreciation to Popolance, praising him for his fine craftsmanship. Popolance expressed gratitude in response, thanking Ethan. However, Ilya's dissatisfaction grew as she couldn't believe that Ethan's response was merely okay. She attributed the perceived lack of excellence to Popolance's reckless engraving of the inscriptions. This led to further argument between Popolance and Ilya. To intervene and defuse the tension, Ethan urged them to cease their bickering. Turning to Ilya, he assured her that she had passed the test and that he would now share the secret techniques of the Arden with her. Ethan inquired if she would continue to lend him her strength going forward. Ilya, overjoyed by the proposition, expressed her delight and emphasized the importance of Ethan keeping his promise. The following day, Lawrence informed Ethan that Popolance had departed for the capital, carrying the letter. Lawrence also revealed that their plan was to arrive within three days and meet with Marquis Bloden. Ethan inquired about the progress on the king's side, and Lawrence informed him that the preliminary work had already been completed anonymously. He assured Ethan that they would confirm the details before the next meeting. Satisfied with Lawrence's report, Ethan commended him for his efforts. With everything appearing to be in order, Ethan ventured outside to gather his knights. Menharton, paying his respects, informed Ethan that all forty knights under the Arden's command had finished their preparations for deployment. Determined, Ethan and his army set forth, marching towards Baron Lokan. In the Arden's territory, a tumultuous scene unfolded at Baron Lokan's castle as an approaching army caught their attention. Amidst the chaos, the grey-haired chief knight pondered about the identity and purpose of the unexpected army. Curiosity driving him, the chief knight approached his fellow knight with orange hair and inquired if he could discern their origins. The orange-haired knight diligently observed the banners adorning the approaching troops and caught sight of Ethan, mounted on a horse, leading them. Based on these observations, the orange-haired knight concluded that the army hailed from Arden's domain. At the castle gate, the horse came to a halt, and a man named Menharton raised his voice. Directing his words towards the Lokan guards, he proclaimed that Archduke Arden himself had arrived, Menharton accused Baron Lokan of imposing exorbitant taxes and distributing forbidden wyvern tribe literature within Arden's territory. He declared that Baron Lokan would face consequences for these actions. As the guards prepared to open the gate, the chief knight intervened, instructing them to hold on and adhere to the proper protocols for gate opening. Observing the approaching army, the chief knight estimated a count of over thirty knights at first glance. Seeking information, he turned to the orange-haired knight and inquired if he had already made contact with the baron. However, the orange-haired knight informed him that he had not done so yet. Faced with the urgency of the situation, the chief knight urged his companion to expedite the communication, emphasizing the limited time available. Suddenly, Ethan leaped high into the air, landing atop the outer walls, triggering an explosion in the process. After being knocked down by the explosion, the chief knight struggled to catch his breath, coughing in the aftermath. Meanwhile, the orange-haired knight lay on the ground, determined to relay the urgent message to Baron Lokan. Informing the Baron of the situation, the knight conveyed that Archduke Arden had indeed arrived. Atop the outer walls, Ethan maintained his position while his army patiently waited outside the castle gate. The Lokan guards, gradually recovering, endeavored to rise from the ground. Seizing control of the situation, the chief knight commanded the guards to hasten their movements and launch an attack against Ethan. Responding swiftly, the guards picked themselves up, unsheathed their swords, and spread out, assuming a formation ready for combat. With determination, the chief knight rallied his men, asserting that by attacking together, they could overcome and subdue Ethan. Ethan, observing the lackluster morale of the Lokan guards, speculated whether their drawing of swords was merely a result of following orders. Amused by the notion, Ethan smiled, contemplating that undermining their will to fight would be the most efficient way to handle the Lokan guards. Utilizing his technique known as the Eight Ring Adaptation, Ethan activated his coverage region skill, causing a remarkable surge of pressure to emanate from him. The Chief Knight and the Lokan guards stood in awe, witnessing the overwhelming display of power radiating from Ethan. Although uncertain of the exact nature of Ethan's abilities, the Chief Knight conjectured that Ethan was employing a coverage region skill. With an air of nonchalance, Ethan advanced towards the Chief Knight, steadily releasing an immense pressure that resulted in the gradual downfall of the Lokan guards, 
one by one. Inside the castle, the remaining Loken guards grew increasingly curious and concerned about the unfolding events at the watchtower. Meanwhile, the chief knight, overwhelmed by the situation, unleashed his own aura, trembling in disbelief. He struggled to comprehend how Ethan possessed a coverage region skill of such strength that it could exert pressure even on season 5 star knights like himself. The chief knight, acting impulsively, made the ill-advised decision to charge at Ethan. However, Ethan effortlessly intercepted the chief knight's attack, using his hand to block the strike. Wearing a smirk on his face, Ethan proceeded to shatter the chief knight's sword, leaving the knight in a state of disbelief. Seizing control of the situation, Ethan firmly grasped the chief knight's face and forced him down onto the ground. In a commanding tone, Ethan conveyed his intentions, expressing that he had no desire to engage in combat with those who posed no threat. He clarified that his purpose was to administer punishment to Baron Lokan and not to harm the innocent people. Emphasizing his authority as a true ruler of the land, Ethan issued a direct command to the Lokan guards, instructing them to open the castle gates. In Count Ferns's mansion, Baron Lokan rushed to report the alarming news to Count Ferns that Ethan was currently marching towards them. Count Ferns, taken aback by the revelation, struggled to comprehend the situation, asking Baron Lokan to repeat what he had just said. Baron Lokan confirmed once again that the Archduke was indeed approaching their location. Overwhelmed with panic, Baron Lokan recalled Count Fern's earlier assertion that the Archduke possessed the strength of only a two or three star knight. However, Baron Lokan revealed that their patrol captain, a skilled five star knight, had already been defeated. Urged by Count Ferns to provide a detailed explanation, Baron Lokan proceeded to recount the events. He described witnessing the Archduke descending from the sky behind the patrol's crystal ball, causing a momentary disruption in communication with the outer castle. Perplexed by Baron Lokan's statement about a two-star knight capable of aerial leaps, Count Ferns expressed disbelief. However, he quickly urged Baron Lokan to calm down. Count Ferns sought to find some reassurance in the situation and remarked that at least it was clear that the Archduke had low mana. Turning his attention to the reason behind the Archduke's invasion, Count Ferns inquired if Baron Lokan had confirmed the pretext. Baron Lokan confirmed that the motives were related to the tax issue and the distribution of Wyvern tribe books. Count Ferns then advised Baron Lokan to hold out within the inner castle for as long as possible, assuring him that he would promptly dispatch additional knights to provide immediate support. Baron Lokan urgently implored Count Ferns to hasten their actions, expressing uncertainty about how long they could hold out against the impending threat. Meanwhile, Count Ferns, contemplating the situation, realized that the Archduke's true power exceeded their prior knowledge. Perplexed and sensing that something unusual was unfolding, he questioned whether there might be unfathomable factors at play. Nevertheless, Count Ferns recognized the immediate need for time, considering Baron Lokan's mention of the Wyvern tribe's books and taxes. To buy themselves some breathing room, he concluded that the first step was to divert the Archduke's attention towards Lugan, even if it meant sacrificing a piece in this complex game of chess. Count Ferns summoned the knight commander, Sir Lowenson, into the room. With a sense of urgency, Count Ferns briefed Lowenson on the Archduke's attack on Baron Lokan's territory. He instructed Lowenson to select a small group of men and dispatch them as reinforcements. Lowenson acknowledged his orders, assuring Count Ferns that he understood the task at hand. Count Ferns emphasized the need for caution, urging Lowenson to proceed slowly to avoid any direct confrontation with the Archduke. Grinning in response, Lowenson affirmed his understanding of the instructions. Currently, the Lokan guards find themselves bound together, being escorted towards the prison, when a sudden arrival disrupts the scene. Lawrence appears and commends Ethan for his exceptional performance, expressing astonishment at how swiftly Ethan resolved the situation. In response, Ethan humbly brushes it off, stating that it was no big deal and simply mentions that he merely opened the outer gates. Ethan remarked that the more formidable forces were likely situated within the castle alongside the Baron. Curious about the status of the plan, Ethan inquired of Lawrence whether things were proceeding smoothly. Lawrence responded affirmatively, mentioning that progress was being made, and suggested that Ethan could begin his departure. Subsequently, Ethan summoned Manhattan and instructed him to leave a small contingent of knights behind for surveillance and to regroup the remaining forces. Furthermore, Ethan directed Manhattan to accompany him and the rest of the group, to which Manhattan readily agreed, responding with a simple, very well. 
Once all preparations were in place, Ethan mounted his horse and confidently declared that they were ready to proceed. Meanwhile, amidst the bustling streets of Demorian, a middle-aged man raised his voice, announcing with fervor that the esteemed Archduke Arden had at last arrived to bring an end to Baron Locan's oppressive rule. With passionate conviction, the man continued his proclamation, emphasizing that the valiant hero had drawn his sword to safeguard the people. Adding to the fervor, one of Lawrence's trusted individuals, who had been strategically placed, chimed in, affirming the sentiments expressed by the middle-aged man. The man went on to express his own frustration with the prevailing hunger, striking a chord with the crowd. Another one of Lawrence's accomplices, also positioned within the gathering, joined the rally, declaring their own inability to endure the situation any further. With an invitation resonating through the air, they encouraged everyone present to unite and converge towards the Archduke. The unity displayed by the genuine citizens of Demorian resonated powerfully, their collective cries ringing louder than any other sound. Ethan observed the sight before him, witnessing how the people of Demorian swiftly united as a cohesive force. He remarked on the significant number of individuals who had gathered in such a short span of time. Lawrence, in response, acknowledged that their actions had merely sparked the existing discontent within the citizens. He elaborated, explaining that news of Ethan's presence and reputation had already spread widely even before their efforts had begun. The observant man quickly spotted Ethan lingering at the back and wasted no time in informing everyone of his arrival. As Ethan made his way towards the stage, the citizens of Demorian turned their attention towards him, their gazes filled with incredulity at the sight of such a young man assuming the role of Archduke. With confidence, Ethan ascended the stage, capturing the attention of the gathered citizens. He began by reminding them of a time when Demorian was akin to a paradise. However, in the aftermath of the war, the vassals had neglected their duties, leading to immense suffering for the people. Ethan solemnly declared that this was precisely why he intended to hold Baron Locan accountable and assume the mantle of ruling over the city of Demorian himself. Upon Ethan's command, his knights unsheathed their swords, promptly complying with their leader's orders. The citizens of Demorian erupted in cheers, calling out Ethan's name in praise. Meanwhile, in the afternoon of the same day, within Locan's castle, two guard knights engaged in a conversation, exchanging rumors. One guard knight mentioned a rumor circulating about Archduke Arden seizing control of the outer castle. The brown-haired guard knight expressed surprise, questioning if that was the reason for their heightened state of alertness. The other guard shared what he had heard, revealing that Ethan had already conquered two territories. This revelation left the brown-haired guard knight perplexed, contemplating how Ethan managed to achieve such feats considering he had recently awakened from a coma. Suddenly, the other guard knight noticed a significant development, prompting both guards to focus their attention and examine the situation more closely. Their scrutiny revealed the approaching figure of the Archduke alongside the citizens, heading in their direction. The chief knight, distinguished by his yellow hair, maintained a composed demeanor, instructing his men to remain calm and hold their positions. As the citizens gathered outside the inner gate, the chief knight summoned a messenger, urging them to swiftly relay the unfolding situation to the baron. Meanwhile, the baron engaged in a conversation with an individual visible through a crystal ball, only to be shocked upon learning that the archduke, accompanied by the citizens, was launching an assault against them. Perplexed by the sudden uprising of the previously docile citizens, the baron hurriedly made his way to the balcony to gain a better understanding of the situation. Aware that the gathering outside consisted of rebel forces, the chief knight emphasized to his men not to succumb to panic or create unnecessary commotion. However, when the chief knight ordered his men to unleash a volley of arrows, the guard knights hesitated, displaying reluctance to follow the command. The chief knight's frustration reached its boiling point when he witnessed his men's hesitance to obey his orders. In a fit of rage, he resorted to violent measures, choking one of the guard knights and demanding to know if he was disobeying his commands. Gasping for breath, the guard knight managed to respond, explaining that he couldn't follow the order because his family was among the citizens outside. Taking advantage of the chaotic situation, the chief knight further threatened the guard knight, promising to kill him if he refused to comply. However, Ethan, witnessing the chief knight's tyrannical actions, was consumed by anger. Utilizing his skill called thunderous sound, Ethan unleashed a powerful wave of sound, commanding them to halt instantly. The effect was overwhelming, causing the chief knight and the other knights to cover their ears in distress. 
Baron Lokan was taken aback by Ethan's display of the skill thunderous sound. Ethan, seizing the moment, directly addressed Lokan, urging him to cease the torture of innocent citizens and accept responsibility for his transgressions by opening the gates. Lokan dismissed Ethan's demands, deeming them nonsensical. He held firm in his belief that Ethan lacked the authority to intervene in this manner. In response, Lokan called upon the knight captain, instructing him to execute all those who dared to defy his orders. Upon receiving Lokan's command, the guard captain, in turn, directed the chief knight to slay anyone who refused to comply. As the chief knight brandished his sword, preparing to strike down the guard knight who refused to attack his own family, an unknown force intervened. The chief knight was suddenly struck by a powerful impact, causing him to collapse to the ground. Perplexed by the sudden turn of events, the two guard knights were unaware of what had just occurred. However, the captain, positioned at the watchtower, witnessed Ethan's actions and was filled with awe. He couldn't believe that Ethan possessed the ability to employ the skill, Mana Fire Finger. The captain marveled at the incredible speed displayed by the Mana Fire Finger skill, noting how the guards remained unaware of what had transpired. Simultaneously, the guard captain pondered how Ethan managed to aim so accurately from such a considerable distance. Utilizing his aerial leap skill, Ethan effortlessly leaped over the inner walls, leaving Lokan astounded by the familiarity of the technique used. Lokan recognized the skill as the same one Ethan employed to scale the outer castle walls. With a controlled landing atop the inner walls, Ethan pointed his greatsword directly at Lokan, serving as a chilling reminder that the Baron's refusal to surrender would have dire consequences. Ethan sternly advised Lokan not to harbor any illusions about his fate, emphasizing that it would be far from pleasant. The weight of Ethan's words hung in the air, signaling that Lokan's time of reckoning had arrived. Ethan raised his great sword, causing a fiery red mana to emanate from it. The captain experienced a sense of relief upon seeing the red flames, realizing that if they had been black instead, everyone present would have perished upon witnessing them. Preparing his stance, the captain contemplated that he could potentially overpower Ethan as long as the flames remained not black. He reasoned that Ethan's status as the successor of Arden's flame was not guaranteed, so there was no need to worry. The captain channeled his mana and summoned his three companions, instructing them to attack from all sides and overwhelm Ethan. Obediently, the companions executed the captain's orders. Ethan found himself encircled by his adversaries. But he skillfully employed the coverage region technique to deflect their attacks. His counterattack shattered their formation, leaving the captain intrigued and questioning whether Ethan had indeed utilized the coverage region to ward off his subordinates' assaults. Ethan remained composed, standing steadfastly amidst the enemy, when a sudden realization dawned upon him, something seemed peculiar about the postures of the Lokan knights. As Ethan scrutinized the enemy's postures, he discerned a striking resemblance to those of the Wyvern tribe, fueling his anger. He confronted the captain, inquiring whether the knights had acquired the techniques of the Wyvern tribe. The captain visibly flinched at Ethan's question. Attempting to conceal any knowledge by pretending ignorance and dismissing it as nonsense. Undeterred, Ethan asserted that the captain and the other Lokan knights had blended the Wyvern tribe's techniques with a human sword style. He asserted that while the captain might have deceived others, an Arden would never be fooled. With conviction, Ethan identified the postures as belonging to the Wyvern tribe's formidable stance, known as the Dragon of Destruction. Ethan directed his question at Lokan inquiring whether he had indeed instructed the knights in the ways of the wyvern tribe, fully aware of the potential adverse effects associated with their breathing and sword techniques. The revelation struck Lokan and the knights with shock and disbelief. One of the guards, taken aback by Ethan's statement, sought confirmation, asking if it was true that Lokan had taught them the wyvern tribe's sword technique. Enraged, Lokan erupted, dismissing the guards' words as nonsensical and accusing Ethan of attempting to deceive him. He ordered his guard knight to disregard Ethan's claims, labeling them as falsehoods. Ethan expresses his anger, claiming that they are wicked. He reaches the conclusion that only the four knights and Baron Lokan possess the knowledge. The captain emits a blue mana and shouts, ordering Ethan to be quiet. The captain then motivates the guard knights, urging them not to heed Ethan's words. Upon activating his skill called Solar Prominence, Ethan's mana surged, empowering him. He voiced his belief that they were even more sinister than he had initially perceived, as they coerced others into learning a technique with detrimental side effects solely for their own gain. 
With his newfound power, Ethan launched an assault on one of the knights, utilizing the Solar Prominence Detonator Sword. Despite the knight's attempt to block Ethan's ferocious attack, Ethan effortlessly overwhelmed him, sending the knight flying through the air. Witnessing this astonishing feat, the remaining three knights were filled with disbelief, unable to comprehend the true nature of the clash between Ethan and the knight, which resulted in a sudden explosion. Taking note of their behavior, Ethan asserted that he could deduce the involvement of the four knights and Lokan in a conspiracy with the Wyvern tribe. The captain pondered silently about the challenge he faced in combating such a formidable sword technique. Soon after, he commanded his men to maintain their position around Ethan, rationalizing that he was just an individual. However, Ethan swiftly recognized this strategy and promptly leaped down. The captain, lagging behind in comprehending Ethan's intentions, swiftly caught on and urgently instructed his men to prevent Ethan from lowering the pulley. The three knights pursued Ethan, unaware that his actions were intentionally orchestrated. Ethan wore a sly grin, confident that he had successfully deceived them. Suddenly, he swiftly struck the three knights, resulting in a violent explosion. The captain was astounded, realizing that they had fallen into a carefully laid trap. Ethan, addressing the captain, remarked that they had much to learn as knights if they recklessly pursued an opponent who had already revealed their vulnerable position. Afterward, Ethan shattered the chain, causing the gate to swing open. Observing the gate's movement, Menharton swiftly commanded his soldiers to advance, recognizing that the Archduke had indeed initiated the gate's opening. Both the Arden Knights and the citizens hurriedly rushed toward the gate, eager to enter. Meanwhile, Lokan perspired profusely, overcome with fear and muttering incredulous oaths. The captain issued orders for the remaining knights to halt the advance of the Arden Knights, while the guards were instructed to confront the rebellious civilians. Determined, the captain urged his men to stand their ground, emphasizing the importance of holding firm. Just as the captain was about to announce his intention to confront the Archduke, Ethan launched a sudden attack, forcing the captain to defend himself and retreat even farther. During a fierce encounter with Ethan, the captain trembled and was overwhelmed by a sense of inferiority. Inwardly, he acknowledged that Ethan had effortlessly defeated multiple highly skilled five-star knights simultaneously, realizing that even as a six-star knight himself, he stood no chance against Ethan's prowess. Meanwhile, on the balcony, Lokan quivered with fear as he observed Ethan systematically dismantling his knights. Lokan contemplated the reasons why both Kargas and Lomonton had succumbed to Ethan's might, realizing that Ethan had concealed his true power until now. Menharton rallied the Arden's knights, urging them to press forward as their adversaries showed signs of weakening. Meanwhile, Ethan remained locked in combat with the captain, while the citizens poured into the castle grounds. The battle persisted from noon until twilight, with no signs of abating. At Marquis Bloten's mansion, Popolins arrived and extended greetings, introducing himself to Marquis Bloten. Jaron informed his father that Popolins was the individual recommended by the Archduke. Marquis Bloten greeted Popolins warmly, wearing a genuine smile, and expressed his delight in meeting the esteemed blacksmith. Marquis Bloten, sensing the urgency, urged them to proceed quickly as there were numerous preparations to be made before the council convened in the royal presence. Popolins and Marquis Bloten, with Jaren accompanying them, stood at the threshold of the portal that would transport them to the capital of the Hydran Empire. Before entering, Marquis Bloten cautioned Popolins about the potential dizziness he might experience upon arrival. As they stepped through the portal, Popolins and Marquis Bloten found themselves in the grand capital of the Hydran Empire, beholding the majestic sight of the kingdom. Marquis Bloten extended a warm welcome to Popolins, introducing him to Parantium, the capital city. He then expressed his intention to appoint Popolins as the blacksmith for the royal family, recognizing his exceptional skills and craftsmanship. At the Baron Lokan's mansion, the battle rages on until twilight, with the flag of Lokan reduced to ruins and the three five-star knights lying defeated. Lokan finds himself on his knees, concealed on the balcony, helplessly observing the demise of his army. The captain directed a forceful assault towards Ethan, unleashing his formidable tenth form technique. However, to his surprise, Ethan effortlessly parried the attack. Displaying exceptional skill, Ethan imbued his great sword with his mana, triggering a powerful explosion that forcefully propelled the captain backward. Although the blast sent him flying, the resilient six-star knight captain managed to maintain his footing and remain standing. Recognizing the six-star knight captain's reliance on swift lunges, Ethan remarked that he would demonstrate Arden's lunge to him. Determined, 
Ethan tapped into the potent abilities of the eight ring skill, unleashing a surge of power within himself. With an overwhelming force, he launched a ferocious assault towards the six star knight captain. The six star knight captain let out a horrified scream as he witnessed Ethan's formidable firepower hurtling directly towards him. In a thunderous display, a massive explosion erupted, its impact reverberating throughout the entirety of the mansion. The knights and guards on both sides momentarily halted their actions, momentarily stunned by the sheer magnitude of the blast. As the dust settled, the outcome of the battle became evident. The six-star knight lay defeated, while Ethan remained unscathed, standing firm amidst the aftermath. In a resounding voice, Ethan exclaimed, questioning Lokan's reliance on his subordinates to fight his battles. He challenged Lokan, urging him to personally bring an end to the conflict if he truly embodied the qualities of a true knight. Trembling and faltering in his speech, Lokan implored Ethan to silence, asserting his innocence and denying any wrongdoing. Ethan fixed Lokan with a menacing glare, branding him a coward and expressing his belief that Lokan was unworthy of his aristocratic status, deserving only shame. Fueled by anger, Ethan activated his aerial leap skill, propelling himself into the air, and delivered a powerful kick to Lokan's stomach. The force of the impact sent Lokan flying backward, rendering him unconscious. From the balcony, Ethan bellowed, commanding everyone to lay down their weapons, for Lokan had been defeated. Menharton raised his sword high, declaring the battle's end and issuing orders for the Lokan guards and knights to surrender. With authority, Menharton clarified that any resistance would be met with force, making it clear that those who refused to disarm would face immediate attack. Reluctantly, the Lokan guards and knights obeyed the command, laying down their weapons in submission. Meanwhile, Ethan remained positioned on the balcony, his voice resonating with determination as he proclaimed the forthcoming dominion of Arden over the Demorian city. The citizens, elated by Ethan's words, erupted in joy and celebration, embracing the promise of a new era under Arden's control. The following day, in a camp situated near the outskirts of the Demorian city, a group claiming to be Lokan's reinforcements had established their presence. Within the camp, a man named Greg, serving as the vice-captain of Count Fern's army, brought forth an urgent report to Count Ferns. Curious about the unexpected news, Count Ferns inquired further, acknowledging Greg's presence and questioning the reason for his interruption, considering he should be in the midst of a mission. Greg proceeded to deliver the significant update that Lokan had been defeated. Count Ferns expressed his astonishment, remarking on the swiftness of the castle's capture, noting that only two days had passed. Intrigued, Count Ferns asked whether Lokan had surrendered. In response, Greg clarified that Lokan had not surrendered, adding a layer of intrigue to the situation. Greg proceeded to provide additional details, stating that they had interrogated the retreating soldiers and discovered that the Archduke's forces had successfully breached the inner castle gates, ultimately emerging victorious in the battle. Their triumph was reportedly aided by the support and involvement of the citizens. Count Ferns acknowledged the information, expressing his intention to receive a comprehensive report at a later time. Greg replied with a simple, very well, acknowledging the Count's instruction. Count Ferns, attempting to make sense of the situation, voiced his observation that Lokan had formidable defenders, including a six-star knight captain and four five-star knights. Considering this, he pondered how the Archduke's forces managed to successfully breach the inner castle gates in spite of such powerful opposition. In response, the captain standing beside him completed Count Fern's train of thought, suggesting that the Archduke must possess formidable skills and abilities, potentially approaching the level of a six-star knight. Count Ferns expressed his disbelief, remarking that it was nearly unfathomable considering it had been less than six months since Ethan awakened from his coma. Pondering the situation further, he turned his attention to the captain beside him and posed a question, asking for the captain's opinion on whether the first division would be capable of defeating the Archduke. The first division referred to the ten most elite knights under Count Ferns's command. They were considered the Count's secret weapon, possessing exceptional skill and prowess. Their training included mastering the techniques of the Wyvern tribe, without making any alterations or modifications. Due to the unique nature of their training and abilities, the First Division operated covertly, serving as a clandestine group within Count Ferns's forces. The captain responded with arrogance, asserting that Ethan, at most, could only be considered a low-level six-star rank. 
He emphasized the distinction between someone who had recently attained the rank of six star and seasoned veterans who possessed extensive experience. The captain went on to boast that the first division consisted of proficient six star knights who were on the verge of reaching the seven star level. He proudly mentioned that there were 12 members in total, including himself and the vice captain, confidently stating that they should have no difficulties dealing with the situation at hand. The captain expressed his belief that a mere two members from the first division would be sufficient to eliminate the Archduke. Count Ferns, convinced by the captain's confidence, acknowledged the statement and announced his decision to continue utilizing Ethan's abilities. He instructed the knight captain to relay orders to the butler, demanding a reduction in taxes and a halt to the distribution of the Wyvern tribe's newly published book. The captain acknowledged Count Fern's instructions and added that he would ensure the information reaches the families within their faction. Count Ferns emphasized the need for secrecy, stressing the importance of Lugan, presumably a key figure or rival, not discovering their plans. The captain's response carried a hint of sinister intent as he affirmed his understanding of the directive, assuring Count Ferns with a wicked look and a crisp, yes, sir. In the midst of the rebuilding efforts within Demorian City, Manhattan took charge, overseeing the soldiers and coordinating their activities. Meanwhile, in Ethan's office, he concluded reviewing the paperwork and set it aside, expressing satisfaction with Lawrence's increased precision in handling such matters, he turned to Lawrence, his associate, and inquired if there were any further needs or tasks to address. Lawrence reassured Ethan, stating that there were no problems to report. He mentioned that with the expansion of Ethan's territory, more people were involved in the work, and the availability of additional supplies contributed to the smooth progress of their endeavors. Lawrence provided additional information, stating that Ethan had successfully gained control over a significant portion of the southern region of the dukedom. He highlighted that if Ethan could secure just one more fief under his authority, they would be able to execute their plan of dividing the dukedom into three sections, strategically setting the stage for a war of influence. This plan would further consolidate Ethan's power and potentially reshape the political landscape of the region. Lawrence informed Ethan that Count Ferns would be reaching out to him in the near future. He suggested that Ethan could leverage Count Ferns as a shield, using their perceived alliance to launch an offensive against the Viscount of Lugan's faction. Lawrence speculated that Count Lugan likely believed in some sort of agreement between Ethan and Count Ferns, which would make him hesitant to act recklessly against them. This strategic maneuver would allow Ethan to exploit the situation to his advantage while countering any potential opposition from Count Lugan's faction. Ethan, expressing his frustration, referred to both Count Ferns and Count Lugan as foolish. He remarked that they likely perceived his actions as mere displays of anger and failed to comprehend the bigger picture due to their preoccupation with the ongoing factional conflict. Recognizing the opportunity, Ethan made the decision to entrust Lawrence with the task of manipulating both counts, making them believe that his intentions would only be revealed during the Enlightenment ceremony. Lawrence acknowledged the responsibility and agreed to carry out the plan as instructed. At present, at the jail where Lokan was being held captive, Ethan visited Lokan to extract some information from him. Lokan recounted to Ethan what had happened a few months ago. Lokan said it had occurred in the middle of the night when they were planning for tax collection. The Dark Mage had suddenly appeared during that time, and Lokan's five-star knight captain had been unable to sense the mage's arrival. The five-star knight captain confronted the dark mage, despite Lokan's plea to stop. The knight captain, confident in his abilities, ignored Lokan's warning and believed he could capture the mage. However, the dark mage unleashed a sinister purple energy, immobilizing both Lokan and the knight captain. Lokan speculated whether it was a skill that created a coverage region, rendering them powerless. After exerting pressure on them, the Dark Mage suddenly ceased his assault and urged them to remain calm. He revealed that he had come to negotiate, seeking to obtain the Duke's secret translation. Lokan inquired whether the Dark Mage was the assassin from Lugan's faction, seeking confirmation. However, the Dark Mage chose not to respond to the question directly. Instead, he posed a sinister query to Lokan, asking if he desired power. Lokan proceeded to elaborate, stating that the Dark Mage's power surpassed even Ethan's formidable, coverage region. He revealed that if they hadn't accepted the Dark Mage's offer, it seemed highly likely that the Mage would have killed them right then and there. Faced with this dire situation, they had accepted the Wyvern tribe's text, resulting in their knights gaining tremendous power. 
Ethan expressed his concern to Lokan, mentioning the potential side effects associated with the Wyvern tribe's techniques. He questioned Lokan about any feelings of guilt regarding deceiving his subordinates. Lokan let out a sigh and responded to Ethan's inquiry. He revealed that even in the dukedom, where the Wyvern tribe was despised the most, numerous individuals had already begun adopting the Wyvern tribe's techniques. Lokan then asked Ethan for his perspective on how the situation might unfold in other regions, as he felt he was simply following the prevailing trend. Ethan's frustration grew evident as he clenched his fist, acknowledging that he understood Lokan's perspective. Sensing Lokan's unease, Ethan decided to shift the focus of the conversation, directing his inquiries towards the dark mage who had confronted him a month earlier. He asked Lokan about the organization with which the mage was affiliated. Lokan visibly flinched, displaying hesitation in his response. Observing Lokan's sudden change in behavior, Ethan swiftly reacted by grabbing him and forcefully pressing him against the wall. Ethan maintained a menacing gaze as he addressed Lokan, accusing him of cowardice for altering his attitude only when his own safety was at risk. Ethan warned Lokan not to underestimate him and not to test his patience. In response, Lokan revealed that if he were to disclose the information, it would not only put him in danger but also his family. Dismissing Lokan's concerns, Ethan labeled him a foolish bastard. He explained to Lokan that his inquiry about the organization was intended to gain crucial knowledge. By obtaining that information, Ethan asserted that he could more effectively eliminate the organization, ensuring the safety of Lokan's family as well. Upon hearing Lokan's hesitant agreement, Ethan released his grip, causing Lokan to fall onto the ground. Lokan instinctively reached for his neck, nursing the discomfort caused by the forceful encounter. While regaining his composure, Lokan proceeded to explain to Ethan that there was a middleman involved. Lokan revealed that the mage who had appeared on that fateful night had instructed him to go to Mount Delgorn in the Viscounty. There, Lokan was to seek out a specific member, identified by a distinctive badge. At the Hyden Empire capital, confusion spread among the attendees of the royal conference as they questioned the presence of a dwarf seated at the same table as them. The atmosphere buzzed with curiosity and whispers about the unusual addition to the gathering. As the king arrived and took his seat, he surveyed the room and inquired if everyone was present. However, before commencing the royal conference, the king acknowledged the presence of an unfamiliar face and requested the individual to introduce themselves. Popolin stood up, showing his respect to the king, and introduced himself as the acting archduke in place of Ethan Arden. He explained that he had brought a letter from Ethan to the king. As the attendees heard the name Arden, murmurs began to ripple through the room. The king's butler leaned in and whispered something to the king, prompting his attention. The king proceeded to read the letter, his expression reflecting intrigue and amusement as he absorbed its contents. With a smile, the king found the letter to be quite interesting. In a surprising move, the king decided to share the letter's contents with the attendees, revealing that it mentioned the collaboration between the royal blacksmith and the wyvern tribe. This revelation caused a collective wave of surprise among the attendees. The king's sudden flinch and his subsequent crumpling of the letter did not go unnoticed by Marquis Bloaton. The Marquis couldn't help but speculate about the reasons behind the king's discomfort. He wondered whether it was due to the revelation that one of his subordinates was collaborating with the Wyvern tribe or if it hinted at a deeper connection, suggesting the king himself might be involved with the Wyvern tribe. The thought lingered in Marquis Bloaton's mind, raising questions about the true nature of the king's reaction. Meanwhile, in his office, Ethan contemplated Poplin's presence in the palace, assuming that he had likely reached there by now. As he reviewed the meticulous preparations concerning the Ethan Viscounty, Ethan expressed satisfaction, deeming the preparations to be flawless. Recognizing the urgency of the situation regarding the Wyvern tribe, Ethan resolved to initiate actions related to that matter without delay. Suddenly, Ilya burst into Ethan's office, urgently calling out his name. She excitedly informed him that she had successfully developed the item he had requested. Ilya proudly presented the item, known as the well-rounded whetstone, explaining its unique functionality. According to her explanation, this special whetstone would allow Ethan to sharpen his blade conveniently and efficiently anywhere and at any time. Ethan's annoyance with Ilya's sudden intrusion was evident as he silently observed her without acknowledging her presence. Unfazed by Ethan's indifference, Ilya's frustration grew, and she raised her voice, demanding his attention. She yelled at Ethan, 
questioning whether he was even listening to her. In the midst of their exchange, Ilya's gaze fell upon a familiar name, Molasis, mentioned in the document Ethan was reading. Ethan inquired if Ilya was familiar with Molasis, to which she responded confidently, stating that she knew numerous mages, including Molasis. Ilya then playfully teased Ethan, mentioning her busy schedule but suggesting that she could assist him if he begged for her help. However, instead of begging, Ethan simply instructed her to pack her belongings, declaring that they would be leaving immediately. Ilya's face lit up with joy at the prospect of joining him on the journey. Ethan and Ilya are riding a carriage and heading to where Molasis is currently located. Ilya is looking out the window of the carriage and Ethan asks her what Molasis is like. Ilya tells Ethan that Molasis specializes in reinforcing the ingredients of things, a kind of alchemy. Anything he touches, even an ordinary piece of metal, can be used as a material for making a renowned sword. In comparison, his actual magic skills aren't that impressive. Ilya tells Ethan that she thinks Molasis could be a fourth rank at best. Curious, she asks Ethan why he asked about Molasis. She adds that it doesn't seem like they're going for a tea party, especially since Ethan packed his swords. Ethan told Ilya that he had a few things to check and ask. And whether those swords would come in handy or not depended on Molasis's answer. After a few hours of traveling, the carriage halted, and Ethan and Ilya stepped outside, staring at the forest near the mountain. Ilya said that she thought the place was correct because she could feel Molasis's mana. She mentioned that there were security magic circles and traps set up everywhere, making it quite annoying to simply enter. Ethan asked Ilya if there was a better method, to which Ilya laughed and proceeded ahead. With confidence, she told Ethan to trust her because she was an 8th rank mage. Ilya mentioned that she could eliminate those poorly made magic circles without leaving a trace. Doing so quietly enough that Molasis wouldn't even be aware of what was happening. After a while of destroying magic circles and traps, Ilya grew increasingly frustrated at the seemingly endless number of traps she had been dismantling. She cursed at Molasis, calling him a paranoid old geezer, and wondered just how many traps he had created. Ilya found herself becoming more and more infuriated, her magic power surging within her at the mere thought of Molasis daring to challenge her. She declared that she would annihilate everything in her path. With a wicked laugh, she obliterated yet another nearby trap. Observing her actions, Ethan watched Ilya with a smile on his face. He silently speculated that since Ilya had chosen not to disguise herself as an old lady, she must be quite close to Molasis. Ethan and Ilya arrived at the entrance, only to find it blocked by a powerful magic barrier. Ilya unleashed her magic spell upon it, shattering the barrier and allowing the door to open. Fuming with anger, Ilya exclaimed how dare Molasis make her do all this work. Ilya's voice echoed as she yelled, summoning Molasis to appear before her. Molasis did appear, but he wore an annoyed expression. Frustrated at Ilya's consistent destruction of the magic circles he had painstakingly set up each time she visited, as if she were a member of some unruly gang. Molasis reminded Ilya of their previous conversations, emphasizing that he had always told her that if she simply informed him of her arrival, he would provide her with a safe path that bypassed all the traps, he asked if Ilya had forgotten about it. Ilya snorted dismissively, questioning why she should need permission from someone like Molasis to access the area. She argued that he should have been aware of her arrival and preemptively removed the magic circles. Ethan observed Ilya's reaction with a sense of disappointment, realizing that she had indeed forgotten about Molasis' previous instructions. Molasis patted his head and sighed. He told Ilya not to be stubborn, undoing and redoing all those magic circles took up so much time, Molasis had given up knowing Ilya would not listen. He said that it would be faster to talk to the Archduke beside Ilya. Ethan was glad that Molasis know him, and Molasis responded, saying that his place might be in the middle of nowhere, but he still heard news. Molasis realized who Ethan was when the first magic circle was destroyed, and he thought he knew why Ethan was there, Molasis then invited the two of them to come in. Inside Molasis's hideout, Ethan and Ilya were having a cup of tea. Ilya was surprised to learn that Molasis had made a deal with the Wyvern tribe. She stood up and raised her voice, saying that Molasis had gone too far and had finally lost his shit. Molasis said that the times had changed, and as a mage, he should be open to new things. Molasis realized that Ethan was not there solely to get rid of him. Ethan replied, saying that he was not just a killer who indiscriminately took lives, 
but that he wanted to listen to Molasses and hear him out. Molasses nodded and said, all right. He explained to Ethan that he might not have heard about it because Ethan had only recently woken up from his coma, but in the last 10 years, outside of the dukedom, the Wyvern tribe's technology had quickly become prevalent in foreign nations and territories. Ethan contemplated the information and said that from what he have seen, when a human without a dragon heart imitates the breathing technique of the Wyvern tribe, it shortens their lifespan. He then asked Molasses if people were still learning it despite being aware of this consequence. Molasses chuckled lightly and replied that mages may appear to be driven by an insatiable thirst for knowledge. But they are not foolish. They have meticulously taken apart the techniques of the Wyvern tribe and thoroughly researched them. Many individuals have managed to harness only the advantages of their techniques while successfully avoiding any negative repercussions, himself included. Ethan nodded in agreement, silently acknowledging that he was pursuing a similar approach. Molasses sighed with relief, grateful that Ethan shared the same perspective. He explained that thanks to the Wyvern tribe's techniques, a new standard for measuring magical proficiency had emerged, representing new levels of power and mastery. Ethan's curiosity peaked, and he asked Molasses to elaborate on the new levels. Molasses explained that previously, the limit for knights was 10 star, and for mages, it was the 10th rank. However, that limit had been surpassed, and now there were individuals who had reached the 11 star and even 12 star ranks. Ilya was taken aback by the revelation of the existence of an 11 star rank, while Ethan couldn't help but smile upon learning that there were ranks higher than the 10 star threshold. Ethan speculated, saying that it must mean those individuals' mana reserves had surpassed the transcendent level by utilizing the Wyvern tribe's breathing technique, and they might have neglected other areas of magical learning in the process. In a serious and stern tone, Ethan demanded an honest answer from Molasses, emphasizing the importance of his question. Ethan revealed that he had been pursuing the Naraxis Brotherhood, a group that worships the Wyvern tribe, which made Molasses visibly flinch. With a cold stare, Ethan confronted Molasses, asking for a compelling reason to spare his life. Molasses's face showed visible signs of sweat, fully aware that his answer could determine his fate. He cautiously responded to Ethan, explaining that there wasn't much to offer in terms of a reason to spare his life. Mages, he said, constantly yearned for greater knowledge and higher levels of power. The texts of the Wyvern tribe, provided by the Naraxis Brotherhood, offered a potential link to achieving those goals, hence the deal that had been struck. Molasses continued to explain that he had no personal interest in the Naraxis Brotherhood or their beliefs. He clarified that he had not joined their order. As Ethan heard the word order and showed Molasses the emblem he possessed, Ethan asked if the order Molasses referred to was possibly connected to it. Molasses confirmed that the emblem Ethan showed him indeed belonged to the Arcana Magic Association. Ilya, intrigued by this unfamiliar group, she expressed her lack of knowledge about them. Molasses proceeded to enlighten her, explaining that the Arcana Magic Association is a secret organization composed of highly skilled mages chosen by the Hydran Empire. They act as representatives for mages and hold a significant role within the magical community. Molasses is about to explain the offer he had received but was interrupted by Ilya's burst of laughter. She found his words amusing and deemed it the funniest joke he had ever made. This response triggered Molasses, causing him to lose his temper. He referred to Ilya as a rude little brat and expressed his frustration, stating that she consistently underestimated him whenever she had the opportunity. Molasses told Ilya that he is much better than a doppelganger of a monster who lives in a cave. Upon hearing this, Ilya was pissed. Ilya and Molasses continued arguing while Ethan was thinking to himself that mages have gotten better because of the Wyvern tribe's techniques and a secret order made up of the elites. With all the information he had gathered, Ethan came up with an idea. Ethan stopped them and called Molasses. Asking about the mages in high positions in the palace. However, before Ethan could finish his words, Molasses quickly responded with a yes, as if he already knew what Ethan was going to ask. Molasses proceeded to explain that those mages were either essential members of the Brotherhood or connected to them, much like he himself was. Upon hearing Molasses' response, Ethan's thoughts raced, realizing that the mages were already compromised. He considered the possibility that even the palace blacksmith might have a connection to the Seventh Kingdom, which was associated with the Wyvern tribe. Drawing his conclusions, Ethan grew increasingly concerned, speculating that at the current pace, 
the entire royal palace would either be sold out to the Wyvern tribe's faction or might have already fallen under their control. In a separate room in Malasis's hideout, Ilya stated that one of the magic circles she had broken on the way to Malasis's hideout was beyond Malasis's capacity, indicating that someone else knew they were there. Ilya mentioned that Malasis's fate was either to be killed by Ethan or to meet his demise at the hands of the Great Order members. Ilya then convinced Ethan to consider taking Malasis in as an assistant, emphasizing the potential usefulness of having Malasis on their side. Ethan displayed signs of contentment as he expressed that there was no reason to reject the idea. Furthermore, he remarked that Malasis wasn't affiliated with the Great Order or he worship of the Wyvern tribe. Hearing this, Ilya chuckled and remarked that it was a fantastic plan. She mentioned that she would leash Malasis like a dog and use him until he dies. Ethan extended an offer to Malasis, inviting him to join their group as one of his associates. Malasis accepted, acknowledging that he didn't have much of a choice in the matter, he mentioned that being Ethan's subordinate would provide him with protection and that the nature of his work wouldn't significantly differ from what he had been doing. Suddenly, Ilya's attention was drawn to a beeping sound emanating from her backpack. She quickly retrieved a communication crystal and handed it over to Ethan. Ethan inquired if Ilya had brought it. To which she confirmed and mentioned that Lawrence had specifically instructed her to contact Ethan using the crystal. Ethan then asked Lawrence what it was using the crystal ball. Lawrence replied, saying that Count Ferns had sent Ethan an urgent message. Ethan said all right and ordered Lawrence to take Manhattan and the Knights and charge into Ethan Viscounty. Ethan stood up and said that he would get going from there right away, to which Lawrence said, very well. Ethan was about to leave the room, he told Ilya and Malasis that they would go together, as it was time to move. At Pleston District in Ethan Viscounty, a couple of explosions occurred in different locations. The citizens of Pleston District had started to fight for their freedom against the tyranny of Viscount Ethan, while the Ethan guards were blocking their way. Menharton and the Arden Knights were having a hard time dealing with the Viscount's knight captain, Neri and Portugal. Menharton instructed everyone to focus and maintain their positions. He reminded them that although the enemy was strong, they couldn't let their guard down just because the enemy was alone. Menharton couldn't believe that they would be stopped by just one person. As Neri and Portugal rushed towards them, the Arden Knights panicked upon seeing his advance and immediately launched a counterattack against him. Despite Menharton's efforts to stop the Arden Knights and instruct them to hold their positions, they did not listen and continued their aggressive approach. Neri and Portugal effortlessly defeated the Arden Knights, leaving Menharton with no choice but to engage in combat. Menharton launched an attack against Nerian but Nerian easily evaded it. Mockingly, Nerian commented that the Duke's knight order was a mess. As Nerian raised his sword, preparing to deliver a decisive blow to Menharton, an unexpected twist occurred. A surge of red-colored energy emerged from behind Nerian. Sensing the danger, Nerian swiftly dodged the attack, narrowly avoiding the strike. Ethan appeared on the scene. Wearing a smile on his face, and expressed his surprise at encountering such a formidable knight within the Viscounty. Ethan openly admired Nerian's quick reaction to his attack, impressed by his skill. Noticing that his knights were still alive, Ethan asked Nerian if he deliberately spared his enemies due to his confidence in his own abilities. Nerian replied, stating that he was not that arrogant, but rather believed he could overpower them without killing. Ethan apologized to Menharton for being late and assured him that he would take care of Nerian. Ethan also mentioned that he would leave the Viscount to Menharton, to which Menharton understood. Nerian released a tremendous amount of mana, declaring himself as the Viscounty Knight Captain, Nerian Portugal. He then asked Ethan to forgive him for aiming his blade at the Arden's Archduke. Nerian leaped forward, attempting to attack Ethan, but Ethan managed to block the assault. Pushed back by the force of the attack, Ethan contemplated to himself that Nerian seemed faster than when he fought Menharton leading him to wonder if Nerian had been concealing his true skills. Ethan remarked that Nerian's abilities were on par with Paul Ten, a six-star knight, but he deduced that Nerian was actually closer to a seven-star level. Ethan gritted his teeth, determined to hold his ground against Nerian. He pondered to himself that the weight of Nerian's sword felt distinct from those who had doubled their mana. Nerian unleashed another powerful attack on Ethan, who managed to block it, causing the ground to crumble under the impact. As Ethan successfully defended against Nerian's assault, he came to the realization that Nerian possessed a solid understanding of the fundamental principles of swordsmanship.
However, Ethan noticed that Nerian's blade carried a sense of hesitation and worry. As their clash continued, Nerian's expression grew increasingly worried. He sensed something peculiar about Ethan, realizing that despite his mana amount being at most that of a four-star knight, he couldn't find an opening to exploit. Creating some distance between them, Ethan intended to ask Nerian something, prompting Nerian to ask what is it. Ethan proceeded to inform Nerian that all the knights from indirect bloodlines had employed similar techniques to those of the Wyvern tribe and the Arden secret technique. Ethan then questioned why, as a knight captain, Nerian hadn't utilized those techniques. Nerian responded with valor, asserting that the true essence of a knight lies in having the right mindset and a proper body. He declared that he had not descended to the point of sacrificing his body for the sake of power. Upon hearing Nerian's answer, Ethan smiled in approval. He commended Nerian, stating that it was a commendable response. Then, Ethan tapped into the power of the Eight Ring, causing a crimson blaze of mana to envelop him. Nerian's attention was immediately captured as he witnessed the surging power emanating from Ethan. With a mix of curiosity and concern, he observed as Ethan initiated his secret technique known as Solar Prominence. In the midst of unleashing the technique, Ethan declared his intention to confront Nerian with his true power, emphasizing his commitment to fight like a genuine knight. Ethan attacked Nerian with his secret technique, unleashing its full force. Nerian held his blade tightly, preparing himself to defend against the impending assault. The attack from Ethan caused a massive explosion that reverberated throughout the Pleston district, its shockwaves felt far and wide. As the dust settled, Nerian found himself on his knees, the aftermath of the powerful attack taking its toll on him. Ethan approached Nerian, reminding him that he should already know what it meant for Ethan and his knights to charge into battle alongside the civilians. Ethan told Nerian that he still had time to correct his deeds, urging him to reconsider his actions. Ethan emphasized that if Nerian considered himself a proper knight, he needed to remember what they fought for. Upon hearing Ethan's words, Nerian came to a realization, the weight of his actions settling upon him. Nerian then put down his weapon, hesitantly asking Ethan if there would still be a chance for someone like him, who had denied the truth. Ethan turned around and told him that it depended on how Nerian would do from now on. Nerian remained on his knees as Ethan walked away, stating that he would cut the chains that imprisoned Nerian himself and that he would be waiting. The battle is over and Ethan emerged as victorious, the indirect families that had fallen until now were Kargas, Dikun, Lomonton, and Ethan. There were a total of four territories and 120 nights. It had been 136 days since Ethan had awoken from his coma. Ethan had amassed a force that would stand up to the indirect families, and the news of the proclamation of an edict that everyone in the dukedom must live by had spread throughout the Hydern Empire. At the Hydern Royal Castle, a man in black walks in the hallway, making his way toward the king's office. He knocks on the door, and the king grants him entry. Within the office, the man is known as Count Wellington Falski, the director of the Hydern King's Affiliate Information Bureau. He informs the king that he has the progress report. The king is seated on his chair, addressing Count Wellington Falski about the completion of his investigation on Archduke Ethan. Count Wellington Falski confirms that he has indeed finished the investigation. The king appears uneasy and expresses how his predicament has worsened due to Ethan publicly revealing the identity of the royal blacksmith. The king becomes aware of Duke Ration's affiliation with the Wyvern tribes and inquires about the progress of the investigation into Duke Rakian and the relationship between the blacksmith. Williams. Count Wellington Falski responds, stating that they have obtained evidence indicating that Williams is secretly supplying weapons. However, due to heightened security measures, they have been unable to gather further information beyond that. The king thought to himself, recognizing that Duke Gerard Rakian consistently opposes the anti-Wyvern tribe policies whenever the opportunity arises, acting as the representative of one of the Seven Kingdoms. The king acknowledges the influential position Duke Rakian holds as the head of the aristocrats. Understanding that dealing with him will not be an easy task, even as the king himself. Count Wellington Falski lowers his head in a gesture of deference and reveals that they have taken action by demoting Williams. However, he expresses regret that they have been unable to fully remove him from the royal court, causing Count Wellington Falski to feel a sense of shame over the perceived failure. The king consoles Count Wellington Falski, explaining that the situation could not have unfolded differently given the strong opposition of Count Rakian and the aristocrats. 
the king assures Count Wellington Falski that the actions taken thus far are deemed satisfactory, encouraging him to raise his head. The king emphasizes that the slow progress of the investigation is acceptable. He instructs Count Wellington Falski to prioritize the protection of the agents' identities, ensuring that they remain concealed throughout the course of their work. The king's affiliated spy organization, Red Moon, is the last wall they have against the Wyvern tribe. In Arden's mansion, Ethan and Lawrence stroll through the hallway. Lawrence examines the report and expresses his belief that the plan has unfolded smoothly. He shares that Williams, the former blacksmith for the royal court, has been dismissed, while Poplins has been hired, albeit on a one-year contract. Upon discovering that Poplins' position is temporary, Ethan speculates that it will likely become permanent unless unforeseen circumstances arise. He remarks that this suggests the king's sincerity regarding the anti-wyvern tribe policies, as the decision to hire Poplins indicates a genuine commitment to the cause. Ethan inquires about the response to the conflicts within the dukedom, asking Lawrence for his insights. Lawrence responds, noting that the king appears to be adopting a wait-and-see approach at the moment, observing the situation without immediate intervention. Ethan speculates that the king's uncertainty is leading to a gradual evening out of power dynamics within the royal court, as long as the king refrains from direct interference. He anticipates that this situation will eventually present an opportunity for everyone to clarify and solidify their respective positions. Ethan and Lawrence arrive at the training grounds, where Ethan approaches Nerian and inquires about the progress of the training. Upon seeing Ethan, Nerian pays his respects. Ethan thought to himself reflecting on the advantage of having someone of Nerian's caliber, who is on the verge of attaining the prestigious seven-star rank, join the Knight Order. Ethan contemplates that he can entrust the order's structure and discipline to Nerian, as he will be capable of overseeing those aspects effectively. Ethan offers a pat on Nerian's shoulder, commending him for his diligent efforts despite having recently joined. He expresses his trust in Nerian's reliability. While observing the other knights, Ethan contemplates that their skills have undeniably improved with Nerian's presence. However, he envisions an even greater improvement lying ahead. Ethan instructs Nerian to gather all the knights together, leaving Nerian puzzled and questioning the sudden request. In response, Ethan explains that a new knight order requires a fresh and innovative fighting technique. He aims to introduce a new approach to combat that will enhance the knight order's capabilities and make them even stronger. Ethan addresses the lined-up knight order, acknowledging the presence of over a hundred knights hailing from four different families. He acknowledges that their swordsmanship styles and command systems may differ due to their diverse backgrounds. However, he announces that moving forward, they will all be unified under the banner of the Arden Knight Order. Ethan proceeds to demonstrate the new sword technique to the assembled Knight Order. He calls forth the representative knights to take their positions, forming a circle around him. Ethan informs them that they will begin the practice without utilizing mana. In response, the representative knights swiftly launch an attack on Ethan, and he adeptly defends himself, showcasing his proficiency in the new sword technique. As the knight with green hair leaps forward to attack Ethan, Ethan skillfully defends against the assault and spots an opening, causing the green-haired knight to fall and tend to a broken bone. Another knight, relying on brute force, launches an attack against Ethan, believing that overpowering him will lead to victory. However, Ethan easily blocks the attack and, with a swift maneuver, grabs the knight's hand and forces him to the ground, demonstrating his mastery of technique over raw strength. Ethan proceeds to launch a counterattack against the remaining knights, swiftly neutralizing their attempts to resist. When Manhattan attempts to strike Ethan from behind, Ethan effortlessly blocks the attack, leaving Manhattan in awe of Ethan's skill. Manhattan muses to himself, recognizing that Ethan's prowess doesn't stem from the mana of fire, and wonders about the particular style of swordsmanship Ethan employs. Ethan swiftly moves to Manhattan's blind spot and delivers a powerful kick, causing Manhattan to lose balance and leaving an opportunity for Ethan to land a final blow. Nerian, observing the scene, wears a troubled expression as he finds Ethan's actions peculiar. As Nerian attempts to launch a sneak attack on Ethan, he contemplates the possibility that Ethan might teach his family's swordsmanship style as a means to restore the honor of the Ardens. Nerian launches another attack at Ethan, but Ethan expertly blocks it once again. Nerian becomes increasingly intrigued by the unique style of swordsmanship Ethan is employing. However, as Nerian prepares for another assault, 
he is taken aback and shocked to witness Ethan's menacing form reminiscent of the Wyvern tribes. Ethan presses on with his attack, but Nerian skillfully blocks the strikes with his sword. When Ethan attempts to grab Nerian's hand, Nerian manages to slip away, creating some distance between them. Ethan persists in his relentless assault, lowering his stance and swiftly advancing towards Nerian. Nerian finds himself in awe, astonished by the existence of a technique that allows the body to maintain such a low position while moving with such speed and force. As Nerian tries to defend against Ethan's incoming attack, Ethan smirks in response. Their swords clash, but Ethan's strength proves overwhelming, causing Nerian's sword to be destroyed. Ethan then points his sword towards Nerian, who stutters and admits defeat, acknowledging that he has lost the duel. The other knights, who were previously defeated and now witnessing the encounter between Ethan and Nerian, are astounded by the display of Ethan's pure swordsmanship. They marvel at how Ethan managed to overpower six individuals with his skill alone, without relying on any other supernatural abilities. The knights are left in awe and ponder the depth of Ethan's mastery in swordsmanship. Nerian prepares to say something, but Ethan takes the opportunity to address everyone present. He acknowledges that most of them joined the Knight Order out of admiration for the Ardens. However, he highlights the fact that they were forced to swear loyalty to the Senate due to the oppressive rule of the indirect line. Ethan poses a question to the gathered Knights, asking why they came to admire the Ardens in the first place. He suggests that their admiration likely stems from their awareness of the Ardens' exceptional skill and reputation as the most renowned Knights in the Western continent. Contrary to the knight's previous perceptions, Ethan shares a different perspective. He states that the path to the Arden's renowned status was not solely based on their aristocratic position but rather their willingness to embrace diverse influences. Ethan explains that the Arden's, unburdened by the constraints of their aristocratic lineage, ventured beyond traditional boundaries and learned techniques from the barbarians. By combining those techniques with their own innovations, the Ardens were able to reach unparalleled heights of skill and mastery. The revelation about the Ardens' association with the barbarians leaves Ethan's knights shocked. Nerian stutters in disbelief, recalling that the barbarians were the very group that waged a war against the Hydern kingdom a century ago. The knights find themselves grappling with the unexpected connection between the esteemed Ardens and their historical adversaries. Ethan addresses the astonishment of his knights, asserting that there is no inherent good or evil in techniques themselves, it is the intent and actions of the wielder that determine their moral character. He explains that the swordsmanship he has just demonstrated is a fusion of the Duke family's traditional swordsmanship and the techniques borrowed from the Wyvern tribe. Ethan proudly declares this newly created style as the Dragon Slayer sword art, symbolizing its potency and effectiveness. Menharten and Nerian are taken aback upon hearing the name of the new technique. The Dragon Slayer sword art, as they perceive it to be an indication of the Arden's intention to counter the Wyvern tribe. Nerian, with his astute deduction, realizes the underlying reason behind Ethan's edict to accept the Wyvern tribe's techniques. He comprehends that Ethan aims to use this new sword art as a means to confront and overcome the Wyvern tribe, reclaiming the honor of the Ardens in the process. Ethan confirms Nerian's deduction and affirms his plan. He declares that Nerian and the other knights will learn the swordsmanship of this new duke family, incorporating the dragon slayer sword art. Ethan expresses his belief that with their dedication and the mastery of this technique, they will rise to become the greatest knight order on the continent. He instills in them a sense of purpose and the determination to reclaim the honor and legacy of the Ardens. Ethan's impassioned words resonate with his knights, and the atmosphere becomes charged with determination and loyalty. Nerian, deeply moved, immediately kneels down before Ethan, pledging his unwavering loyalty to the Arden Archduke family. Witnessing Nerian's devotion, the other representative knights follow suit, kneeling and swearing their allegiance to the Arden family. This wave of loyalty spreads throughout the entire knight order as each member, one by one, kneels down and solemnly vows their commitment to the Arden legacy. The knight order of Ethan unites under the banner of the Arden family, ready to face the challenges ahead and become an unwavering force in the pursuit of honor and justice. Ethan and Lawrence stand atop the battlement, observing the gathering and growth of their knight order. Lawrence remarks that the army is shaping up to be stronger than they initially expected. Curious, Lawrence asks Ethan if he intends to re-establish the Black Flame Legion. In response, Ethan shakes his head, expressing his reservation. 
He explains that the current Black Flame Legion has undergone significant changes, deviating from its original purpose and values. Therefore, Ethan decides against resurrecting it, recognizing the need for a new direction and a fresh start for their cause. The Black Flame Legion was the official Knight Order of the Arden family. It was the pride of the family, comprised of the finest elites from across the continent. The Legion achieved great feats such as slaying the Wyvern tribe and enabling the formation of the Arden Duordi squad. However, as a result of the management of the indirect bloodline, they have essentially disappeared from existence. Ethan announced that the war against the Wyvern tribe is still ongoing and is about to enter a new phase. According to him, his Knight Order will replace the Black Flame Legion and become the continent's most elite Knight Order, tasked with exterminating the Wyvern tribe. At Count Fern's mansion, Count Ferns chuckled slightly. He remarked that the Ithan Viscounty had also fallen. In his thoughts, he considered himself and the Archduke to be essentially allies. He criticized Lugan, calling him an idiot for not understanding the Archduke's true intentions. Count Ferns wore a wicked smile as he contemplated how the Archduke would likely deal with Lugan. However, his thoughts were abruptly interrupted when his butler entered the room in a hurry. The butler stuttered as he conveyed that there was an urgent matter that required Count Fern's attention. Count Ferns let out a sigh and questioned the butler about the level of urgency that would cause him to disregard proper etiquette. The butler, still catching his breath, revealed that Ethan had expressed his intention to attend the Senate conference. Count Ferns rose from his seat in surprise. He realized that the situation was progressing faster than he had anticipated. He apprehended that the consequences might extend beyond Lugan and start affecting him as well, like a spreading fire. Standing in front of the door, Count Ferns instructed his butler to arrange an emergency Senate conference. He emphasized the importance of relaying the news to the other elders, and the butler acknowledged his orders. Count Ferns glanced out the window at Myers and contemplated that he had no alternative but to accelerate the course of events. At the Arden's territory, Ethan assembled his knights, along with his sister, Paul Ten, Malasis, and Ilya. He raised his voice, declaring that the moment they had been waiting for had arrived. It was time to reclaim the dukedom and restore the honor of the Arden name, casting aside those who had been draining the family's resources like parasites. Ethan lifted his greatsword high and proclaimed that in that very moment, the Dragon Slayer troop would expel the Senate and establish a new dukedom. The knights, filled with fervor, erupted in cheers and expressed their unwavering loyalty to Arden. Ethan's smile widened as he stated that this was just the true beginning of their journey. That's it for today, if you enjoy this manoir recap, please leave a like and share with your friends and family, by the way, while you're waiting for the next season, you can watch some of my recaps by checking the description and comment section, thanks for following Ethan's adventure.